Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Tiger Battalion 507, Eyewitness Accounts from Hitler's Regiment, edited by Helmut Schneider, translated by Geoffrey Brooks, foreword by Robert Forzik, narrated by Chris MacDonnell. Foreword During the course of the Second World War, the German Wehrmacht formed a total of 15 heavy tank battalions, Schwere Panzer Abteilung, equipped with Tiger or King Tiger heavy tanks, 12 for the Heer, Army, and 3 for the Waffen-SS. In the decades since the war, a number of excellent memoirs from former Tiger tank crews have appeared, including Otto Karius's Tigers in the Mud and Richard von Rosen's Panzer Ace. In addition, several unit histories about the various Tiger tank battalions have also been published. Helmut Schneider's Tiger Battalion 507 is a mix of diary entries, veteran accounts and contextual overview, which follows the men of Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507 from the unit's formation in October 1943 to its eventual dissolution in April 1945. Schneider's Tiger Battalion 507 is based on contributions from about a dozen different battalion veterans, mostly compiled in the period 1982-90. to 90. Schneider himself was an Unteroffizier, non-commissioned officer, in the battalion in 1943-4, to 4, serving as a driver, gunner, and briefly as a tank commander. Other veterans who contributed accounts served in a variety of roles, including as tank crewman and in the workshop Werkstatt Company. The initial chapter lays out the organisation of the battalion in great detail, including its support elements. By the time the Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507 began forming, the Third Reich was already hard-pressed on all fronts, and the veterans' accounts note the chaotic pace at which the battalion was formed in Germany and Holland, then shipped forthwith to the Eastern Front in March 1944. The battalion was literally deployed from its rail cars and sent directly into its first battle, the attempted relief of the encircled Tarnopol garrison. The Tarnopol action was fought under extremely adverse conditions, in freezing cold temperatures that made the inside of the tigers feel just like a refrigerator. Nevertheless, the battle managed to spearhead an advance that pushed through Soviet lines and inflicted heavy losses on the enemy. However, the German veterans do not mention that the mission ended in failure. The relief effort never reached Tarnopol and the 4,000-man garrison was annihilated. Indeed, like many German veterans' accounts, the emphasis is placed more on damage inflicted on the enemy rather than the fact that the Wehrmacht was being steadily pushed back towards the Reich. The combat accounts and vignettes presented in Tiger Battalion 507 are first-rate and quite candid. One veteran mentions backing his tank up too fast and accidentally running over some German infantry who did not get out of the way in time. Tank versus tank combat is described in fast-paced terms, with enemy shells whizzing by or slamming into the Tiger's thick armoured hide, while German gunners frantically train their sights on multiple opponents, knocking each out in turn. Although many of the crews were quite young, Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507 had a solid corps of veterans who held the battalion together and took a terrible toll on the enemy. In one three-day period in January 1945, the battalion was credited with knocking out 136 Soviet tanks. It is also interesting to see the personal side of war through the eyes of the men in Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507, who linger thoughtfully on comrades killed in action or other small incidents, including some humorous ones. At one point, Schneider was disturbed that a sweater his mother gave him was torn to ribbons by enemy fire. Elsewhere, German tankers are overjoyed to find bacon hidden by peasants. Such are the simple joys and frustrations of frontline life. One of the more intriguing aspects of Tiger Battalion 507 is the emphasis on the maintenance elements. The book has many photos and accounts of repair work in the field, which is not always present in armour unit histories. 
As a former tanker myself, I can attest that the kind of tank recovery operations in frozen mud and snow that the veterans discuss are unforgettable experiences. Indeed, it is interesting to see from these accounts how frequently the tigers threw track, either because of soft ground or mines, and the difficulty of track repair on the front line. The tiger did not perform particularly well on soft ground due to its excessive weight, but the German Army High Command, OKH, apparently disregarded terrain factors when it sent units like Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507 into marshy areas. Later in February 1945, a similar disregard for the Tiger's limitations on crossing water obstacles led to 22 Tigers being blown up by their crews because no provision had been made to get them across the Vistula River. Another aspect mentioned on several occasions is the lengthy time required to fill the Tiger's 540-litre fuel tank with 20-litre cans. Germany built a very advanced heavy tank but relied on rather primitive means to keep it supplied. By the summer of 1944, Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507 was hard-pressed, as the Wehrmacht reeled backward into Poland as a result of the Soviet Bagaration offensive. Increasingly, the battalion was not employed as a single formation, but rather operated as single companies in support of different infantry units. However, once the Eastern Front stabilised later in 1944, the situation changed and the tank crews became underground dwellers, living in bunkers near their tiger tanks. Indeed, some crews even had time to help with the harvest, and it is clear that the battalion was never short of food or booze. Attached to one infantry unit, the tiger crews informed the local commander that they were supposed to receive a daily ration of schnapps, which they got. Compared to other branches of military service, tankers have a well-deserved reputation for seeking out creature comforts, at which the veterans of Schirer Panzer Abteilung 507 were quite adept. Most accounts about the Tiger tank focus on its magnificent 8.8-centimetre gun, and there is plenty of evidence of its lethality presented in Tiger Battalion 507, Although the German tankers were concerned about the new Soviet JS-2 heavy tank, it appears that in most actions involving these vehicles, the Tigers had a distinct edge. The German veterans ascribed the superiority of the Tigers' gunnery to better training and the fact that the unitary 8.8cm armour-piercing round could be loaded much quicker than the separate loading, projectile and propellant were separate, ammunition used by the JS-2. Listeners should be aware that old soldiers have a tendency to enlarge on their experiences, and some of the veterans of Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507 repeat some rather apocryphal stories, such as a claim that one of their tigers destroyed a T-34 at a range of 8,000 metres. Such a claim was well beyond what tank sites in 1944 could discern. And even with modern technology, the longest tank kill on record is only 4,700 metres, achieved by a British Challenger tank during the 1991 Gulf War. On the other hand, the Tiger was continually bedeviled by enemy mines, and the Soviets, even when on the offensive, learned to plant mines to thwart German armoured counterattacks. In one relief action near Brody, the battalion lost five of six Tigers involved to mine damage. While the Tiger was a capable fighting machine, by 1944 it was increasingly operating on its own, with limited support from infantry, engineers and artillery, which reduced its overall impact on the battlefield. By February 1945, Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507 had very few Tigers left and most of the battalion was sent back to Paderborn to re-equip with the King Tiger tank. However, only one company had received its new King Tigers by the time that U.S. armoured units approached Paderborn in late March 1945. A scratch unit was hastily formed under SS command, and the veterans of Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507 fought their last major action against Task Force Wellborn, 3rd Armoured Division, on the 30th of March. 
The King Tigers inflicted a stinging tactical defeat on the U.S. column, but it was irrelevant since the training station at Paderborn was soon overrun and the battalion itself had essentially ceased to exist by early April 1945. It is noteworthy that the scratch unit formed at Paderborn, lacking maintenance support subunits, could not operate for very long. Many of its King Tigers were lost to minor technical defects. Tiger Battalion 507 provides interesting insights into the daily life of German tank crews in 1944-5. In particular, the small unit camaraderie and skilled leadership really come across as the critical factors which held Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507 together, despite it operating under heavy enemy pressure and a deteriorating wartime situation. Although, as in most German post-war accounts, the authors try to avoid including any political viewpoints, it is clear that these veterans felt a great deal of pride in both their wartime service and their battalion's reputation. Schneider manages to sneak a passing reference to fighting for a supposed good cause into his introduction, but otherwise there is little mention of the regime that Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 507 was fighting to preserve. While post-war accounts, such as Tiger Battalion 507, are important for assembling these first-person records before these veterans passed away, it is also important to remember that much of what is related in the book offers a somewhat sanitized view of events, in order not to disturb modern sensibilities or impugn any members of the battalion. Oddly, there is no real mention of military misconduct or even desertions, although some of that must have been going on in the last few weeks of the war, particularly when it was evident that the war was lost and the unit virtually disintegrated. Truth, as often in historical narrative, can remain an elusive quantity. Robert Forsick Preface this is the story of Heavy Panzer Tiger Battalion 507, a military unit which existed for 500 days until its dissolution just before the Third Reich capitulated. What motivated a number of its former members to club together and commit their experiences to paper after so many years? One of the reasons is that although Panzer Battalion 507 received mention in the third edition of Tiger, Die Geschichte einer legendären Waffe von 1952 bis 1945 by Egon Kleiner and Volkmar Kuhn, pages 294-9, its treatment in comparison with nearly all the other battalions was meagre because the two authors had so little material available. In a letter dated the 4th of February 1974, the first commanding officer of 507, Major Erich Schmidt, deceased 1977, had provided Egon Kleiner with some information about his Tiger Battalion, but this had not been enlarged on by the time the third edition of that book was published. Contacts pursued between the years 1977 and 1982 led to more and more former 507 men coming forward from the anonymity of post-war life. After a number of meetings held primarily by 2nd Panzer Division and Panzer Regiment 4 veterans, the first major reunion of former 507 Panzer men was held at Rohrdorf in Tal where it was decided to set up an editorial team to work at expanding the existing material on Panzer Battalion 507. Leading this team were former Lieutenant Dr. Hans Maul and Captain Reserve Wolf Koltemann, the latter having made great efforts to set up a gathering of former members, especially from his third company. His circulars and lists of names compiled from memory and sent by Kurt Kramer and Heinz Zinka much earlier from Russian captivity led to a growing number of former comrades-in-arms becoming identified and located, and these then swelled attendances at the biannual reunions. Meanwhile, I, Helmut Schneider, had made a point of writing to all known former colleagues for the purpose of keeping us united, and if possible, enlarging our numbers, also to stimulate our powers of recall. 
Thus, in later years, the jigsaw was gradually put together with photographs, diary entries, letters, battlefield attestations, and certificates accompanying the award of badges, medals, and decorations. Zoldberg entries, leave passes, wartime newspaper cuttings, Wehrmacht bulletins, and naturally accounts of personal experiences. Post-war literature was also used to prompt memories. During the nine years which passed since our resolution in 1982 to write the 507 story, very many of our comrades-in-arms have left us forever, amongst them our editor-in-chief Dr. Hans Maul. The fact that all sources of recall had run dry spurred us to proceed on the basis of what we had, and in 1990 the Göttingen editorial team confirmed that decision. What individual authors had contributed in the form of diary extracts, personal experiences and aphorisms had to be assembled chronologically as soon as possible. Because the battalion had never been deployed as a single force, it was clear that reports from frontline companies, staff company platoons, the workshop company, the repair staffs and supply unit would all come from a totally different perspective. Even the five men sitting in the same panzer perceived or were affected by any event differently, and as for being certain of the geographical location, nobody ever kept a large-scale map of the area in which he was spending every day and night for weeks under the most unfavourable conditions. This book sticks to retelling what our blood brotherhood honestly experienced. It is meant to be a record for posterity, but above all a memorial for those comrades-in-arms who, in faithful fulfilment of duty, laid down their lives for a supposed good cause. Since the personal accounts are not confined to describing only what happened on the battlefield, but also other occurrences and impressions, not least the confusion of retreat, panic-stricken flight and captivity, it is also, so to speak, a collection of partial biographies of a generation which sacrificed its best years to the war. May the army of millions of dead of all nations bear witness to humanity, for the hope that future generations may learn to discard war as the best way to resolve their differences. Helmut Schneider Introduction I was born on the 29th of March, 1922, at Hagen, North Rhine-Westphalia, a few miles south of Dortmund. My secondary school was at Reut, one of whose old boys was Joseph Goebbels. At the age of 19, I was granted my Abitur, the school-leaving certificate which qualified the holder for university and also an army officer's career. I volunteered for the Panzer Arm, and was sworn in at Paderborn in May 1941. Four weeks' basic infantry training was followed by my driving instruction on the Panzer I chassis. I qualified for Panzer Driving School by proving I could make a standing jump onto a table top while keeping both legs together. I passed the driving test and was also licensed to drive the ex-check tank Panzer 38T. Operation Barbarossa had begun on the 22nd of June, 1941, and I was one of the first five men, all Panzer-qualified drivers, to be sent to the Eastern Front as part of a battalion being formed at Wuppertal by the Paderborn Panzer Barracks. We five were allocated to 5th Company Panzer Ersatz Abteilung 11 of 1st Company Panzer Regiment 4. The objective was the Caucasus oil fields, by the 11th of October, we had reached Mariupol, on the Sea of Azov. On the 16th of December, 1941, I continued training in the field with 2nd Battalion Panzer Regiment 4. By the 1st of February, 1942, when I was upgraded to Gefreiter, trained private soldier, I had still seen no action. Three months later, on the 7th of May, I was sent on the course for wartime officer candidates held at Grigoyenka. I returned to my unit at Rostov-on-Don in July 1942. On the 9th of August, we entered Mykop in the foothills of the Caucasus. 
Besides driving, I served occasionally as a panzer gunner, mostly on panzer threes, both those with short and long barreled guns. On the 22nd of August, we passed by Mount Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe. Finally, on the 6th of September 1942, I had my first experience of a panzer attack. On the 14th of October 1942, as gunner of tank number 405, I was credited with the destruction of two enemy tanks and one anti tank gun, plus some machine guns and anti tank rifles. Next day, serving with 4th Company, Panzer Regiment 4, 13th Panzer Division, I received the Panzer Assault Badge for 12 attacks. Later that month, we reached Orjana Kidza, the most easterly and southerly point ever reached by the Wehrmacht advance. It was there that, on the 12th of November 1942, the campaign to destroy the Soviet oil fields was abandoned and we turned back. The reason was the disaster at Stalingrad and the possibility that the Russians intended to isolate the entire Caucasus region at Rostov. Thus we gave up the huge area we had conquered. On the 15th of November I commanded a tank for the first time, a Panzer III numbered 431. By the 12th of December there was talk in the unit of a Deutschland Commando a group to be sent on home service, for which sixty men had been selected. I was not amongst them. On the 24th of December I was notified of the award of the Iron Cross Second Class, but that the decoration was being withheld by Lieutenant Gruss for some mysterious reason until the Deutschland Commando had gone. For the remaining men there now began a period of refresher training, prior to the great retreat from the Caucasus beginning on the 1st of January 1943. The Deutschland Kommando had already left for Germany, where they would form the nucleus of Heavy Panzer Battalion 502. On the 3rd of February 1943, we learned that 4th Company Panzer Regiment 4 was to be disbanded, and its 15 crews reformed into an infantry intervention group. It was rumoured that we were to be flown out and given new panzers. This was true, apart from the new panzers. We went to the Crimea aboard HE-111s, towing heavy goated gliders, and were accommodated in a kind of makeshift garrison at Stari Krim. It was a pleasant place, far from the war. After a month's home leave, I was sent on the NCO's course, starting the 21st of June. On the 3rd of July I passed the driving test for heavy lorries. During July 1943 we were moved up to the Kuban bridgehead in the expectation of some action, but all remained quiet and we returned to barracks on the 9th of August. Meanwhile recruits had arrived as reinforcements and I was made their hut senior. This appointment was combined with responsibility for supervising a party of civilians caring for the local cemetery. On the 18th of August, the latrine gossip now hinted at the operational section of the regiment having to leave Stari Krim for Germany. As if in confirmation, on the 9th of September 1943, we were given three weeks special home leave. There had been a heavy air raid on Reut at the end of August, in which my family lost everything, and so I gave my address as that of my grandparents at Bat Ems. Chapter 1 Formation and Induction Heavy Panzer Battalion 507 The period of time covered in this chapter extends from October 1943 to March 1944. As a result of the disaster at Stalingrad and giving up the Caucasus, the German front line, particularly the southern sector, had been greatly shortened. Nevertheless, following the offensive by the Ukrainian fronts in January 1944, it was anything but stable, not least because of the massive thinning out as a consequence of the expected invasion in France. Large areas of Soviet territory conquered by the Wehrmacht in the summer of 1941, shortly after the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, had long since had to be abandoned. The overall situation provided few signs giving rise to optimism. Despite that, we men of the Panzerarm could look forward to the new Panzer of which much had been predicted, 
and for which selected men had been picked out since the beginning of 1943. We had convinced ourselves that, if handled correctly, its armour and firepower would provide a kind of life insurance. The initial mustering of personnel for Heavy Panzer Battalion 507 took place in Vienna. Officers, NCOs and men forming the nucleus came from Panzer Regiment 4, its reserve and training battalion, and from Reserve Battalion 500 at Paderborn, which had meanwhile become the home port of all Tiger battalions. The distribution of the available personnel into companies and specific roles would take place later, once the instruction at Paderborn had begun. When Gefreiter Helmut Schneider returned to Maria Enzersdorf at the end of his bombed-out leave on the 24th of October 1943, the entire battalion had already moved on from Vienna. Reserve and Training Battalion 4 at Moodling, to which Schneider first reported, had no precise knowledge as to the whereabouts of his company and battalion, but spoke vaguely of a deployment to Italy. Sensing that this was a prelude to his being pocketed by the Moodling Battalion, he made his excuses and left for the Front Sammelsteller, Front Assembly Post, from where he was directed to the Front Leitsteller, Front Control Post, in Paris. By this point, Schneider had experience of a chaotic organisation. We take up his diary entries. 25th of October, 1943. I took a train from Vienna to Mulhouse in Alsace. Here I tarried a while before I got the Paris Express at the crack of dawn. The Paris front Leitsteller told me to wait. I did some sightseeing. 28th of October, 1943. Front Leitsteller Paris told me to go by train to Rouen. I arrived there early next morning. Front Leitsteller Rouen, which took some finding, redirected me to Le Mans. 29th of October, 1943. At Le Mans, I was told to go to Angers. The next train was at 2300 hours. I did some sightseeing first, then boarded the through express for Nantes. I had a compartment to myself and fell asleep. I awoke just as we pulled away from Angers. Therefore, I went on to Nantes and spent the remainder of the night in the Wehrmacht Soldiers' Hostel. 30th of October, 1943. My connection back to Angers left at 1100 hours and arrived at 1300 hours. An hour later, I took the local stopping train to Beauget, where the battalion was said to be located, but in fact only the staff company. Since nobody was going to my company today, I went on a drinking bout and slept in the quarters of a boozing companion. 31st of October 1943 a dispatch rider of our company took me to Longay, where the billets were dispersed across the village. I was shown to a gymnasium, home to fifty men. The life there was leisurely, and the duties the best ever. When I reported to the commanding officer, he told me I was scheduled for the Tiger Commander's Course. The word course always gave me a thrill, always something new to learn. It was a great honour for me as a gefreiter, a private soldier, to be selected to command such a valuable fighting machine. 3rd of November, 1943. The selected course participants were driven to Beauget, where a train had been laid on to take us the same day to Paris, and then down the Moselle stretch. On the fourth day, we reached our destination at Paderborn. The town was the mustering garrison for the Tiger Battalions, while Panzer Regiment 11, the training and recruitment battalion, had been relocated to Bielefeld. 7th of November 1943. The course began with separation into three groups, Panzer Commanders, Gunners and Loaders, and Radio Operators. A special training course was planned for drivers, workshop personnel, and repair staffs. The commander's group consisted of officers and sergeants, three corporals, and myself, a private. Initially, this caused me the problem of where to eat. I was not entitled to dine in the officers' or NCO's mess, and lower ranks ate at a different time. Finally, Unteroffizier Ziegler managed to have me included as an honorary NCO in his mess by virtue of my having been his classmate on the NCO's course at Stari Krim. 
Otherwise, the course was very interesting and enjoyable. 15th of November, 1943. My parents came to visit and reserved good rooms in the town for a stay of eight days. My duty hours, consisting of much instruction together with practical training on the panzers, lasted from six in the morning until six at night, with one hour for lunch. I spent the evenings with my parents. 25th of November, 1943. The Tiger course ended. Everybody got leave, but only three days for me because I had to attend the rangefinder course at Weimar. I spent my leave quietly with my family at Reut. 29th of November, 1943. I took the 0800 hours fast train to Weimar and met the other participants at the artillery barracks. They included four Tiger commanders of the 507th, Oberfanrich, Cadet Senior Grade, Dr. Hans Mohl, Oberfeldswebel's Sergeant Majors, Heinrich Dietz and Fritz Breitfeld, and Unterfeldwebel Sergeant Kolber, this last man being previously unknown to me. The majority of those on the course were artillerymen. 30th of November 1943 to the 3rd of January 1944. The rangefinder course consisted of theory and range measuring in the field. Because of frequent fog, the practical side was often suspended, leaving us at liberty to go into town. The only attraction there was the parish fair with merry-go-round. On the bus ride back, the nearest station was Buchenwald. All we knew of it was that the SS had a barracks there. This particular course was the most relaxed one I had been on and had the advantage of ending on the 17th of December. We were given special leave extending into the new year, while those given leave from Paderborn had to report back shortly before Christmas. To my surprise, while at home, my promotion to Unteroffizier, Corporal, came through, and my mother sewed the lace on my shoulder straps as she had done the year before for my brother, recently fallen at the front. Another year of war had ended. The Eastern Front had moved much closer. 4th of January, 1944. After my leave, I had to return to Weimar to collect my stereoscopic rangefinder. It weighed 17 kilograms and was best carried slung across the shoulders. I took the train via Frankfurt and Main to Paris, where the Frontleitsteller informed us that our unit had been transferred to Holland. 5th to the 6th of January, 1944. On the 5th we took the train to Brussels, and on the 6th went from there to Zwolle. The battalion was to be found at the Oldebrauk camp. The barracks at Vejep was like a village settlement with church, town hall, and other official buildings, naturally converted to military purposes. When Schneider arrived at Vejep, sixteen of the battalion's tigers were already present. According to the Bundesarchiv records, the following vehicles had been allocated and delivered to Heavy Panzer Battalion 507. 23rd of December 1943, six tigers, on train number 6295383. 24th of December 1943, three tigers, on train number 6295384. 26th of December 1943, seven tigers, on train number 6295385. 20th of January 1944, three tigers, on train number 6441446. 24th of February 1944, twelve tigers, on train number 1452003-4. 25th of February 1944, 14 Tigers, on train number 1452005-6. With these six trainloads bringing 45 Tigers, the battalion was at its full authorised establishment, and presumably at the same time the issue of half-tracked and wheeled vehicles had also been completed. From memory, the posts were filled as follows. Staff Commanding Officer, Major Erich Schmidt. Adjutant, Oberleutnant Wolf Koltermann. Orderly Officer, 
Lieutenant Dr. Hans Moll. Reconnaissance Platoon, Lieutenant Moser. Commander Staff Company, Oberleutnant Peter Heisch. Commander First Company, Hauptmann Siegfried Holzheit. Commander Second Company, Hauptmann Fritz Schuck. Commander Third Company, Oberleutnant Fritz Neumeyer. Commander Workshop Company, Oberleutnant Engineering Helmut Kusner. Technical Controller, Oberleutnant Engineering Johann Steinborn. Platoon Leaders, First Company, First Platoon, Oberleutnant Rudi Beilfuss. Second Platoon, Leutnant Berthold. Third Platoon, Oberfeldwebel Ratejak. Second Company, First Platoon, Oberleutnant Max Wersching. Second Platoon, Leutnant Lischka. Third Platoon, Feldwebel Rolf Gebhardt. Third Company, First Platoon, Leutnant Bernhard Feufer. Second Platoon, Leutnant Gerd Eichmuller. Third Platoon, Oberfeldwebel Heinrich Dietz. Workshop Company, First Workshop Platoon, Oberwerkmeister Rutowski. Second Workshop Platoon, Werkmeister Gruger. The workshop was made up of armory salvage and security platoons and spare parts stores. Changes to the plan during the war were caused mainly by the transfer of commanding officer Major Erich Schmidt to take command of the Panzer Regiment, Führer Grenadier Brigada, and also the death of Hauptmann Fritz Neumeyer. Occasionally, on account of a shortage of Panzers, not all platoon leader positions were filled. The essential posts were later occupied as follows. Commanding Officer Major Fritz Schuck, Adjutant Oberleutnant Georg Reinhardt, ADC, Leutnant Dieter Jahn, Commander Staff Company Oberleutnant Peter Heisch, Commander First Company Hauptmann Rudi Beilfuss, Commander Second Company Hauptmann Max Wersching, Commander Third Company Hauptmann Wolf Koltemann. Supply Company, Hauptmann Johann Baptist Müller. Workshop, Oberleutnant Engineering, Helmut Kusner. Other officers at the end of the war were Oberleutnant Heinz Jahn, Leutnant Dr. Hans Moll, Leutnant Gustl Stadler, Leutnant Heinrich Dietz and Leutnant Helmut Schneider. Unteroffizier Schneider was detached to the Military Academy in June 1944, Oberfeldwebel Dietz in the late summer. Once commissioned, neither returned to Panzer Battalion 507, and nor did Oberfeldwebel Rolf Gebhardt, holder of the German Cross in Gold and the Knight's Cross, who was sent to the Officer Cadet School at Grosslinica as a Fahnenjunker, Officer Cadet Senior Grade. After the appointments had been made and the vehicles became available, each man had to get to know the vehicle or the equipment which he would now operate. An intensive period of familiarization now began, which for the Tiger crews consisted of applying in practice the theory absorbed from the Tiger manual and gaining the necessary experience. This was very interesting because the Tiger technology was innovative and had many new advantages. What would most Panzer drivers have given for such a steering system as this? The gunners for such a rotating turret or such optics, not to mention the gun. The training of technical personnel and drivers is recalled from their individual perspectives by Richard Durst, Helmut Kusner and Helmut Schneider. Richard Durst we were given leave on arriving in Vienna, and when I reported back I was sent to Kassel, where the Tigers were completed and assembled at the firm of Henschel. I was supposed to attend a course on the structure of the Tiger I, but since all courses were full I was put to work as a turner. The big air raid on Kassel on the 23rd of October 1943 left the town in flames from end to end and I spent several days running rations from the barracks to the clearance squads at the Henschel Works. A Hauptmann Klatt always accompanied me there. Later at Henschel I had to take over the late shift, 
Belgians working in a suburb of Kassel. After that I went on to the Tiger course at Paderborn, and when we received our equipment in the Netherlands I was naturally a member of the repair staff again, attached to 3rd Company Panzer Battalion 507. Helmut Kusner After we finished the administration and mustering of personnel near Angers in December 1943, a number of complete panzer crews were sent to Magdeburg with myself as technical leader. There we had to take charge of the first Tiger tanks from an army supplies office and bring them to the new centre at Jvola. From the technical point of view, I had to practice changing tracks from the wider field tracks to the transport tracks prior to loading aboard rail low loaders using a transportable loading head ramp. The workshop company had an authorised establishment of 240 men, but this was never attained during the formative period. It consisted of two workshop platoons, the armourer's platoon, the radio equipment platoon, the recovery platoon, and a security platoon. The number one workshop platoon, under the technical direction of Oberwerkmeister Rutkowski, carried out major repairs, and therefore operated mainly in the rear areas. Number two workshop platoon, under Werkmeister Gruger, generally worked closer to the front line. His spare parts staff maintained, amongst other things, a store of replacement engines and gearboxes. Thanks to good organisation, this reserve was much greater than our entitlement, so that no Tiger ever needed to leave the battalion on account of engine or transmission damage. Feldwebel Schneider used to wait with some men in a lorry at the army-level spare parts compound in order to buy in spare parts and materials for our battalion in excess of its needs. This ensured that the repair section never had a bottleneck due to shortages. Specialists with the armourers and radio equipment platoons would look over every tiger brought into the workshops. Every workshop platoon had two workshop vehicles, plus two more for materials, two for electro-welding, a portal crane, and a crane on a towing tractor chassis. There was also a workshop marquee in which six Tigers could be repaired simultaneously. The recovery platoon had eight 18-ton tractors, two for each recovery squad, since it required two such tractors to tow a 57-ton Tiger I on extended countershafts on a flat road surface. The workshop platoon also kept sufficient provisions to feed the idle crews of those Tigers under repair. Helmut Schneider In those days we got to know a special unit which operated remote-controlled P4 panzers. For some time it was expected that in every action every Tiger commander would pull the strings of two midget panzers loaded with explosives. The idea was eventually rejected as crazy. The P-4 was fitted with an automatic stop device which activated if the panzer did not receive a signalled instruction within 20 seconds of the preceding one. During a field exercise, the device aboard one P-4 had not been plugged in, and in undulating country, the small, low-profile panzer disappeared from sight to continue beyond signal range. It arrived at a railway line and, followed at a cautious distance by a train, proceeded to the next station, where the engine stalled at the points. In mid-February 1944, I was transferred as an instructor to a Waffen-SS panzer unit located at Kompen on the Zeider See. I was not wanted there, and they sent me on five days' immediate leave. I spent three full days of this leave on trains. Kompen to Zwolle, to Arnhem, to Emmerich, to Oberhausen, to Duisburg, to Cologne, to Regensburg, to Landshut, to Moosburg, and had to change trains eight times. Now I knew how things stood in the spare parts homeland. When I reported back to battalion and my commanding officer heard that I had been sent on leave in this way, he almost fell off his stool. Then he took my Zoldbuch and struck out this leave as not taken. Once all vehicles had arrived, we had exercises en masse. At the beginning of March 1944, we held a major exercise with the Hermann Göring Division, stationed nearby. 
Amongst its prominent guests were Guderian, Inspector of Panzer Troops, Christiansen, Military Plenipotentiary for the Netherlands, Zeisinkwart, Reich Commissioner for the Netherlands, and General Oberst Beck, committed suicide the night of the 20th of July 1944, much praise from amongst all the cigar smoke. Makeup of Panzer Battalion 507 NCO means Unteroffizier, Corporal, and above. Official is a non-Wehrmacht designation. A KFZ is a military staff car. First Battalion Staff, nine officers, four NCOs, and twelve men. Two Staff Company. One First Company Squad, Group Leader, one officer, one NCO, two men. Two Armoured Reconnaissance Platoon, one officer, seven NCOs, thirty-three men. Three Signals Platoon, one officer, twelve NCOs, six men. Three Command Panzers, CO, Adjutant and ADC, and one motorcycle. Four Short Range Reconnaissance Platoon, one officer, four NCOs, twenty-one men platoon squad, three motorcycles, one KFZ-1, three squads with one motorcycle and two KFZ-1s each. Five, Pioneer Platoon. Four NCOs, 21 men. One motorcycle, one amphibious VW, two lorries, two armoured vehicles. Six, Flak Platoon. Three motorcycles, one KFZ-15, three motorised quadruple flak, three ammunition trailers. 7. KFZ Repair Staff 2 KFZ-1 1 KFZ-240 welding gear 1 3-ton lorry 2 lifting cranes 3 and 6 tons 2 4.5-ton lorries with machinery 1 1-ton tractor 8. Recovery Group 1 KFZ-15 2 35-ton tractors three 4.5-ton lorries for ammunition, etc. 9. Truss 1 Rearward Support Staff 2 KFZ-1, two 4.5-ton tankers, two 4.5-ton lorries for ammunition, etc. 10. Medical Team 1 Motorcycle, two KFZ-31 ambulances, one Medical Officer's Panzer. Strength 9 and 10 combined, Seven NCOs, twenty-one men. Eleven, Tross two, one three-ton lorry. Twelve, admin and supply staff. Two officials, ten NCOs, seventy-three men, one motorcycle, three KFZ-1, one three-ton field kitchen, ten four-point-five-ton tankers, twenty MLKW lorries. Thirteen, Provisions Unit Two 4.5-ton lorries, one KFZ-1 14. Baggage Train One 3-ton lorry 3. Three heavy Panzer companies, each with Group Leader, two Panzer 6 Tiger 1 One KFZ-1 Three motorcycles, one motorcycle and sidecar, one bicycle First Platoon 4 Panzer 6 Tiger 1, 1 Officer, 7 NCOs, 12 men. 2nd Platoon, 4 Panzer 6 Tiger 1, 1 Officer, 5 NCOs, 14 men. 3rd Platoon, 4 Panzer 6 Tiger 1, 6 NCOs, 14 men. Repair Troop, 4 KFZ-1, 2 lorries, 3.5 ton and 4.5 ton, 2 1 ton tractors. Gefechtstross 1, Close Support Staff 1 Bicycle, 1 Motorcycle and Sidecar 2 KFZ-1, 6 3-ton lorries Gefechtstross 2, 1 Bicycle, 1 3-ton lorry Baggage Train, 1 3-ton lorry 4. Workshop Company Group Leader, 3 KFZ-1 Two officers, one official, one NCO, nine men. One and two groups, three 4.5-ton lorries, eight 4.5-ton lorries for spare parts, 
two 4.5-tonne lorries workshop equipment, two 4.5-tonne lorries machinery, one 3-tonne swing crane, one 10-tonne swing crane, one official, nine NCOs, 47 men. Recovery platoon, three KFZ-1, two swing cranes, 3-tonne and 10-tonne, two towing vehicles with low loader, one officer, 15 NCOs, 25 men. Armoury. Two KFZ-1, two 4.5-tonne lorries for equipment, two officials, two NCOs, 12 men. Workshop for signals equipment. One 4.5-tonne lorry for signals equipment, one 3-tonne lorry for radio equipment, one 4.5-tonne lorry for battery chargers, two NCOs, five men. Thrust Workshop Company. Two KFZ-1, two field kitchens, one air raid protection VW amphibious vehicle, one 4.5-ton lorry for men and equipment, two 4.5-ton lorries for fuel. Chapter 2. First Operations. Tarnopol, Brody, Kovel. In July 1943, at the time when the Army High Command was already planning the formation of Panzer Battalion 507, the last great German offensive in the east was raging north and south of Kursk. After the Army and Luftwaffe had been re-equipped with all available means, it was hoped to halt the endless round of defensive fighting and retreats and turn the tide in the east in Germany's favour. Ultimately, it did no more than fatally weaken the fighting strength of the Wehrmacht. No sooner had Model's Ninth Army and Hote's Fourth Army finally broken through the deeply echeloned Russian positions to a point where success seemed at least possible, the Russians appeared on the attack unexpectedly elsewhere. On the 12th of July 1943, the Red Army broke through the German front north of Orel, and three days later also east of Orel, thus sealing the fate of the German attack north of the Kursk salient. This situation was repeated south of the salient on the 17th of July, when the Russians broke through at Bovenkov on the central Donitz and crossed the Meuse River. The very heavy losses suffered by the Wehrmacht during the Battle of Kursk had absorbed all the reserves and created the major problem of how the ominous gaps in the front were to be plugged. Once the smoke had cleared, it was obvious that the shrinking German divisions were having to face many more Russian divisions, with enormously increased firepower. Looking at the artillery and panzers, the German staffs now calculated that the ratio of forces favoured the Russians by six to one. The entire Eastern Front, extending from Leningrad to Taganrog, was held by units which had been thinned out to a dangerous level and were too weak almost everywhere to resist the enemy's massive pressure and also had no reserves. On the 9th of September 1943, after Modal's 9th Army had yielded Oral, the Red Army advanced at Bielgorod, south of Kursk, with a huge force of five armies and tore open the front over a distance of 45 kilometres. Their next objective was clear, the Dnieper and Kiev. The river south of Kiev is over two kilometres wide, up to 12 metres deep, and has a steep slope on its western banks. The two most senior German commanders, Manstein, Army Group South, and Kluger, Army Group Center, had recognized much earlier that here was the ideal interception point to tackle an enemy coming from the east. Führer HQ, FHQ, rejected the idea, and for a long period, Hitler had forbidden the building of a Dnieper position, reportedly basing his objection on the premise that all a developed fortified line will do is create the idea in the minds of my generals and troops that it is somewhere safe they can fall back to. Finally, in mid-August 1943, permission was given for an east wall on the Dnieper. No workforce was made available to build it, and so no progress was made. On the 14th of September, in a signal to FHQ, Manstein stated that it was possibly the intention of the Soviets to embark on a breakthrough to Kiev and Kremenchug, and in order to prevent 4th Panzer Army being broken up into numerous small pockets and slaughtered, he had ordered it to pull back on the 15th of September to the Dnieper. 
He also wanted to have 8th Army and 1st Panzer Army brought back soon. FHQ replied, You may not give that order. The Führer expects you tomorrow for a conference. This fourth discussion between Hitler and Manstein within a month was brief and heated, but Manstein got his way and received permission to pull the front back behind the Dnieper. To what extent that might be physically possible was another matter. Five bridges and the dam at Zaporizhia, all potential bottlenecks, were the only possible routes Manstein had at his disposal to bring a million men and their equipment across the river and spread them out along 700 kilometers of the Dnieper's western banks to form the new front. The danger inherent in this retreat was demonstrated by the bitterly fought Race to the Dnieper, during which the Red Army seized the opportunity to thrust itself into the inevitable gaps which appeared as the German units struggled to the six crossing points. One might even speak of the miracle of the Dnieper when one reflects that the Russians failed to capture even one of the crossing points before Manstein got his army group across the river, for the most part safe and sound. However, the possibility of holding this strategic and economically important front in the long term was not guaranteed, because the east wall on the Dnieper, with its fortifications on the west bank, had not been built. In the last week of September, the Red Army succeeded in crossing a 700-kilometre stretch of the Dnieper at 23 places, establishing a small bridgehead at each. At one position, a hundred kilometers north of Kiev, where the Pripyat flows into the Dnieper, a whole army got across. This had not been allowed for by the German generals because the delta was amongst impassable swamp. What was not known was that partisans had been working for months putting down secret log roads. It required a great effort to deny the Russians any further encroachment. For a short while it even seemed that their advance to the Dnieper had been stopped, but the lull did not last long. They stepped up their pressure on the Wotan line, the defensive position between Zaporizhia and Melitopol. On the 15th of October 1943, Zaporizhia fell. Until then it had been held by 40 Panzer Corps, maintaining a major bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Dnieper as flank protection for 6th Army fighting to the south. The loss caused the collapse of the northern corner post of the Wotan line and deprived 6th Army of its cover on the flank. The loss of Melitopol to a numerically greatly superior force followed on the 23rd of October. This tore open the German front along a stretch of 45 kilometers, allowing the enemy to head for the Dnieper Delta with a powerful spearhead and cut 6th Army to pieces. Mixed groups fought back to behind the lower course of the Dnieper, a route over 200 kilometers long from Melitopol to Kherson. The evacuation of the Crimea, where the intact 17th Army was almost cut off and condemned to operational inactivity, would still have been possible at this time, but Hitler refused to release it for political reasons. In the spring of 1944, all but a hundred men of this army were lost as the result of Hitler's illusion that a large bridgehead could be held southeast of Nikopol on the far side of the Dnieper as the base for a later attack towards the Crimea. The catastrophic year of 1943 was not over yet, however, for in the course of September and October, the Russians succeeded in so greatly expanding one of their 23 small Dnieper bridgeheads just north of Kiev, near the village of Lutesh, that they formed three armies and one armoured corps, with more than 2,500 guns and rocket launchers to strike at the granary of the Ukraine. On the 3rd of November, after a powerful artillery barrage had softened up the three German divisions opposite, the Russians broke through stiffening resistance to a depth of 7 to 10 kilometers. It remains a mystery why this deadly threat to Kiev was not foreseen, or if it had been, why suitable countermeasures were not in place, unless it was simply the case that the shirt was too short. On the 6th of November 1943, the Soviets recaptured Kiev. But far worse for the Germans happened the next day, when Third Guards Tank Army, under General Rybalko, 
took the gigantic marshalling yards at Fastov, 50 kilometers southwest of Kiev, in a surprise attack and seized masses of rolling stock, including 45 locomotives. This was a logistical catastrophe for Army Group South, and Rabalko was now a major problem to the rear of Army Group von Manstein. Thus another supporting column of the Dnieper position had been pulled down. In the offensive on the 4th of November, Rabalko had used an especially interesting tactic for the first time against the German Panzermen, which Erich Winhold described as follows. The battlefield was lit up. Our ears rang with the crazy shrieking. Rabalko had swarms of T-34s rolled towards us with blinding searchlights and howling sirens, and as they approached the German lines, the T-34s kept firing. Crouching low on the tank hulls, not visible because of the searchlights, were their infantry. It was a hellish spectacle, with a psychological effect, and it worked, psychologically and otherwise, for the firepower of those T-34s was enormous, and the thin German lines crumbled. By January 1944, Army Group South still held two small sections of the Dnieper Bank, at Nikopol and Karnev, with its unique two-tier road railway bridge, but neither mud nor frost had lessened the pressure of the Russian attack. There ensued a series of encircling actions in which the Russian attempts alternated with German breakouts and counterattacks, both sides claiming success from time to time. In mid-January, the Russians began a major encirclement offensive aimed at surrounding 8th Army. When the neck of the bag was closed at Svenigorodka at the end of the month, it trapped half of 8th Army within it. Relieving attacks were unsuccessful. Over the next 14 days, the pocket, originally of 2,000 square kilometers, was compressed to 10 square kilometers and was finally liquidated by the Russians on the 17th of February. Only half those in the encirclement managed to escape to the west, leaving weapons and equipment behind. The loss of six and a half divisions was an enormous disaster for Army Group South and prepared the way for a final catastrophe in the southern sector of the Eastern Front, for scarcely had a weak but cohesive front been set up running from the delta of the Dnieper to the Pripyat marshes than the Russian armies renewed their offensive at the beginning of March 1944. One attack spearhead ran from the Uman area to the southwest led by Marshal Konyev, the other, from rovno Shepetovka, heading south, was commanded by Marshal Zukov. Farther south, the armies of Marshal Malinovsky proceeded unopposed to the southern Buk. A consequence of this major Soviet offensive was that in the northern sector of Army Group South, contact between 1st Panzer Army and 4th Panzer Army was lost, and the right wing of the latter was forced westwards, while strong enemy forces now wheeled south. Uman fell, and on the 6th of March, when the enemy offensive against Army Group A, Feldmarschall von Kleist, began, the entire southeastern front was set in motion over a width of 1,100 kilometers. From the 23rd of March, therefore just three weeks later, the onset of the catastrophic development became clear. In the far south, the German 6th and 8th armies were practically destroyed, or at least routed. In the northern section, 4th Panzer Army's front was ruptured and forced well back to the west. 1st Panzer Army now sat in a gigantic pocket between the southern Buk and Dniester. If this force of 22 divisions, among them the best Panzer divisions with around 200,000 men, were to be lost, little would stand in Stalin's way in his advance to the west. General Huber, the one-armed commanding general of 1st Panzer Army, naturally recognized the danger and wanted to break out of the trap as soon as possible by heading south and crossing the Dniester. Here a gap had been identified with little Russian protection. Feldmarschall von Manstein, chief of the army group, refused his permission for fear that a breakout in that direction would only result in a fresh encirclement enabling the Russians to drive 1st Panzer Army against the Carpathian Mountains. 
Manstein's concept was to have Huber break out to the west, even though this meant his having to cross two rivers and go through two Russian armies. As he assessed the situation, only by reuniting 1st Panzer Army and 4th Panzer Army was there a prospect of stabilizing the southern front while holding the line of the Carpathians. As he conceded, this would require a couple of fresh divisions for 4th Panzer Army so that Huber would have a goal to work towards. On the 23rd of March, Manstein asked Hitler for these new divisions. Meanwhile, Dubno and Vinitza had both been lost, and Hitler also forbade any breakout of 1st Panzer Army to the south. Chapter 3 Arrival on the Eastern Front Wolf Koltemann Panzer Battalion 507 had been loaded on nine railway trains. To where? Some thought initially to Italy, then there was talk of Hungary, where it was important to bring a fickle ally to heel by means of Operation Margareta. When we finally detrained at Krasna, east of Lemberg, on the 21st of March 1944, we saw that the Eastern Front had us once more in its clutches. The situation in this sector was as follows. A gap forty kilometres wide lay between Tarnopol and Brody. Tarnopol was surrounded, Brody under heavy enemy pressure. Panzer Battalion 507 was now subordinated to Panzer Fierband Frieber for use as a fire brigade. We had at our side 9th SS Panzer Division, Hohenstaufen. At this time we were not aware that the situation was grave, indeed fairly hopeless. Our communications consisted of the intercom and FU-5, the range of which was less than the visible horizon, and also restricted to events close at hand, carefully choosing one's words so as not to provide the enemy with information and propaganda. Therefore we give contemporary notes free reign here. First come the diary entries of Anton Siegfried and Siegfried Obermeier, both of the reconnaissance platoon, and Helmut Schneider, third company. These are followed in chronological order by the battle reports of Nietzsche and Helmut Gutmann, second company, and Lieutenant Gert Eichmuller and Franz Rab, third company, as verified from Zoldbuch entries signed by company commanders Fritz Schuck, second company, and Fritz Neumeyer, third company. 21st of March, 1944. Schneider. The beginning of spring. For me, my third in Russia. Our transporter train, which left Zvola on the 16th of March, reached Krasna today, a small town on the lemberg tarnopol railway line, where we were unloaded smartly. As we heard later, the leading Tigers headed for their first attack straight from the ramp. Siegfried. We arrived at Krasna, where unloading began at 1700 hours. Then we drove down the Rollbahn to Dubza where the reconnaissance platoon spent its first night in enemy country. It snowed. 22nd of March, 1944. Siegfried. We were awoken at 0400 hours. It was fairly cold as we set out for Zlochov and Zaborov for Yezhena. We got there at 1700 hours and secured on the edge of town. The weather does not like us. An icy storm blew across the plain all night. Obermeyer. Moved up towards Brody and Alesko during the night. Horrible sight. Everything on fire. 23rd of March, 1944. Operational orders. Third Company advanced to Sabrov and Kirovsa. Siegfried. At 0400 the battalion headed towards the enemy for the first time. The objective was to clear enemy forces from the railway line to Tarnopol and the village of Yezhena. At the beginning of the attack there was some resistance, which we crushed at once. As soon as they spotted us, the Russians fled from the railway line towards a hill where most fell under our fire. Then we bombarded the village, which began to burn brightly. We had achieved our objective and returned to Yezhena, where we resumed security duty. Obermeyer. First attack on two villages near Yezhena. Battalion Commander Major Schmidt accompanied us in our Schutzenpanzerwagen, SPW armoured personnel carrier. 
24th of March 1944. Operational Orders. Second Company proceed ahead of main battle line east of Osterjovster and attack height 386. Siegfried. At 0415 hours, alarm. The enemy had broken through the southern security and attempted to enter our village. We broke camp and next moment headed for them. The Tigers opened fire to immediate effect. The Russians fled into open country to be mown down by our machine guns, MGs. A number of them got to houses along the Rollbahn, but this only served them as a refuge until our quadruple flak arrived. Then we gave pursuit. After they allowed our Tigers to pass by unmolested, there now occurred fierce close combat clashes with the Russians in the area of our platoon. We dismounted from our SPWs and engaged the enemy with hand grenades and pistols. The Russians defended grimly. One of their hand grenades was lobbed into the SPW of our platoon commander, Lieutenant Moser. After the deafening explosion, we heard the cries of the wounded. When the rear door opened, three men came out seriously wounded, including Lieutenant Moser. The others, Unteroffizier Kupel and the radio operator Lang, were dead. We brought the wounded to the main dressing station by the shortest route and then resumed our security position. We learned that Eigner had also been killed by a bullet to the head. Obermeyer. Attack reconnaissance together with 3rd Company at 1700 hours. 25th of March 1944. Operational orders. Second Company attack on Harbutsov and Trestyokits. Third Company attack on Lopasani and Trostyanyec. Obermeyer. Attack with Third Company. Went in the afternoon with Major and Oberstleutnant. Came under heavy mortar fire. Siegfried. Our SPW had engine trouble. We went to the repair yard at Zborov, arriving 0900 hours. It was very cold. Schneider. The East has us again. We already have two days of operations behind us. In the first, I destroyed two enemy tanks. As to the general situation, the weather is vile with snow flurries, mud, etc., but that doesn't worry us. The worst is that we never get five minutes for a breather during the day. We leave in the early hours, and it is already night when we arrive at some place or other to refuel, load ammunition, clean weapons, check over the vehicle. That usually keeps us busy until midnight. Sentries are then posted. Everybody has to do it, outside or on the turret. If you get three hours sleep, you're lucky. 26th of March, 1944 Obermeyer. Radio post with 3rd Company at Oleov. Siegfried. We left the repair yard and rejoined our platoon towards midday. At 1400 hours, during a bitingly cold snowstorm, we were ordered to dig in on the hill in front of the railway station so as to observe the enemy's every move 200 metres away. An enemy scouting party, which appeared suddenly, was driven off with MGs. When dusk fell, we had expended so much ammunition firing at the station that we needed to bring up a fresh supply. I stood up and a round whistled past my ear. After a second near miss, I realised that a sniper had me in his sights. There was nothing for it but to crawl thirty metres to the MG. From there we fired back in the direction of the railway station whenever we detected movement. When relieved at twenty hundred hours, we were frozen stiff and could hardly walk. Back in the village, the Russian artillery bombarded us. All hell was let loose. I lay near the SPW, gritting my teeth. The shells were falling very close. It lasted about half an hour. Then we returned to our quarters, turned in, and slept. 27th of March, 1944 Operational Orders Second Company, attack and occupy Shanelovsa. Third Company, from Oleov, advance to Lopasani and Hukotovsa. Obermeyer. Took a rest. Siegfried. We stood security until evening. The weather has improved. 28th of March, 1944. Siegfried. 
At 0800 hours, two Tigers and three SPWs, including our vehicle, left on an operation. We had to proceed to the next village, pick up our grenadiers, and transport them to a position two kilometers farther on. We found them waiting and ready for the attack. We drove on, the grenadiers following in line behind us. When the first Tiger reached the high ground, it came under heavy artillery fire. Four grenadiers were hit by the first burst of shelling. Then others fell. We jumped out and brought the seriously wounded into our SPW, a total of six men. This brought the attack to a standstill. We returned to our starting point. The other vehicles also brought in wounded men. Towards 1600 hours, Stukas came over and bombed the railway station. The earth trembled. Nothing there was left alive. 29th of March, 1944. Operational Orders. Third Company. Advance to Trostyanyech and Harbutsov. Zifrit. The front has grown a little quieter. Our Stukas returned at ten hundred hours and bombed Ivan's positions. The weather was glorious, bringing a thaw. We slaughtered a pig and had a feast. At fifteen hundred hours, Bauer received a serious head wound from a single round of mortar fire and collapsed in the dining room. Luckily, the medical officer arrived quickly and saved his life. At twenty-two hundred hours, we left Yezhena for Brody. 30th of March, 1944. Operational Orders. Second and Third Companies attacked northeastwards of Dubza and near Ponika. Zifrit. At 0600 hours, we drove through Zlochov and towards 0930 hours headed for Brody. We saw the crew abandoning a burning tiger. Three JU-88s began a dive. The third machine was hit by anti-aircraft fire and crashed. Ivan was offering stiff resistance. In the evening, we found a place to bed down in Dubza. Bobby and I stayed in the quarters while the others stood sentry. I was trying to warm the room when the stove blew up, covering me in ashes. Bobby dragged me away from the wreckage. The incident set light to the whole room, and so we grabbed the most essential things and rushed outside. I had a minor head injury, but nothing else. Schneider The sixth day of the attack. We stood guard for a bit, and I used the time to write a few lines home. Yesterday was my birthday. It did not go off quite as one would have wished. Another day of attacks for all of us. We drove into a hole in the snow, and it took a lot of laborious effort while under mortar fire to get us free. In the evening, after returning to base, refueling and re-ammunitioning, the order came to go again. We drove all night until early morning. After a stop to clear the vehicle for action, we kept on going. We have occasional sunshine, but the weather still leaves a lot to be desired. Now and again we have snow flurries, but sooner or later spring must come, even here. 31st of March, 1944. Operational Orders. Second Company. Advance to Hluzhin and clear the roll barn of enemy from there to Dubza. Third Company. Advance via Hluzhin to Kashmiri. Obermeyer. We went to first workshop platoon with engine trouble. 1st of April, 1944. Operational Orders. Second Company advanced to Luzhin. Third Company advanced to Kashmiri. Zifrit. Towards 0900 hours, we reached Sukadola and stayed there until 1300 hours. We were taking our vehicle into the workshop with damage to the gears. On the way, we got bogged down in swampy country. A tiger with damage to tracks and suspension also got stuck 50 meters from us. We radioed the recovery platoon. They couldn't tow us out until morning. At that, we occupied a house on the roll barn to spend the night, slaughtered a ram and ate it. 2nd of April, 1944. Operational Orders. 3rd Company, Advanced to Hluzhin. Schneider. After the repair staff mended a damaged track, we of Tiger 331 are taking the day off and will probably go forward tomorrow. The Russians are very dogged about getting through to Romania, but have suffered very heavy losses. 
The weather here still has nothing spring-like about it, always these snow flurries and snowstorms against which little progress can be made. My health is first class. Many people have not adjusted well to the change of climate, but it does not affect me. Yesterday five of us prepared three hens, first boiled and then roasted. Quite excellent. Siegfried. Towards 0900 hours, two recovery platoon tractors arrived and towed us out. After that we headed for Krasna, but drove into a ditch at 1700 hours and stuck fast. In attempting to get free, we threw both tracks, and in the icy cold, it took us some time before we got them fitted again and found quarters in a house. 3rd of April 1944 Operational Orders Second Company advanced to Lugin. Siegfried. At 0800 hours, the SS Panzer Division Hohenstaufen was unloaded at Krasna, and one of their Panzer Fours pulled us out. Next, we went to the staff at Zlochov, and from there to Laki, where we occupied quarters around 1700 hours. 4th of April 1944. Schneider. Our Tiger is operational again. The seventh day of attacks is behind us, and I destroyed two more tanks and another two anti-tank guns. It all counts. It is already evening, and we are spending the night out here in the field. The wagon is just like a refrigerator. The weather has improved, and yesterday and today we had beaming sunshine. It gives us new hope, even if the season of mud has arrived. When we leave the wagon, we are up to our ankles in it. 5th of April, 1944. Siegfried. In the afternoon, Bobby has to go forward. I am taking over as radio operator. 6th of April, 1944. Siegfried. We have a rest day. 7th of April, 1944. Siegfried. At 0800 hours, I am going to the staff at Zlochov. When I get back to Lackey from there, we have to take the wagon to the repair yard. The journey goes through Ochidov to Shvadov. 8th of April 1944. Siegfried. Over the next four days, we will be working on our SPW. The snow has almost melted away. Spring is coming. 13th of April 1944. Siegfried. We drove to Zaborov and from there to Setsova, where we spent the night. 14th of April, 1944. Siegfried. At 0700 hours, we went with the Tiger to our readiness area beyond Taurov. The Russian Air Force is very active. Obermeyer. At 1800 hours, we went to readiness position forward of a large swamp. Much flak pyrotechnics there. 15th of April, 1944. Orders. Second and third companies. Attack on Chedanskov Vielki. Schneider. During this attack we ran over a mine and had to return to the repair yard with track damage. On the way we came across two hens, on which we later dined. Siegfried. At 0900 hours a major offensive began with the aim of relieving our troops in the Tarnopol encirclement. Enemy aircraft approached repeatedly, but always bore away when our flak fired at them. At 1800 hours we came to a village in flames. After passing through a veritable curtain of fire laid by the Russian artillery, we took the village after a bitter struggle. In the night we kept watch over a tiger stuck in a swamp. Obermeyer Afternoon, advancing towards Tarnopol went with Waffen-SS Division Hohenstaufen to Katevska Vieksa. Heavy artillery fire. 16th of April, 1944. Obermeyer. Made further progress towards Tarnopol in company with a Panther Battalion. During the fighting, blowout repaired with help of Russian prisoners. War correspondent Zugriegel sat beside me taking photos. We removed the radio equipment from a wrecked T-34. Siegfried. At 0700 hours, special rations. And at 0900, we continued the advance to Tarnopol. Towards 1400 hours, we came under attack from enemy fighter bombers firing from all barrels. Our fighters shot down two of them. 
The advance came to a temporary halt when some panzers drove over mines. On this operation, we alone took fifty prisoners who had to be winkled out of their holes first. 17th of April 1944. Operational orders. Second Company, advance north of Seredinki. Siegfried. In the readiness position during the afternoon, we received concentrated Russian artillery fire. Then three T 34s suddenly came over the rise, about 400 meters away. I reported this to our commanding officer. When I glanced through the hatch, my blood ran cold. The 7.62 centimeter gun of one of the T 34s was almost lined up on us, but our CO was faster, and his round tore off the turret of the T 34. Immediately afterwards, he pounded the other two tanks with his 88 and wiped them out. We cheered like kids. That had been a close shave. Obermeyer. We made a reconnaissance run to check if the ground will bear the weight of a tiger. Our counter shaft broke at a standstill in the village. 18th of April 1944. Obermeyer. Heavy fire on our village from Russian artillery guns and Stalin organs, Katyusha rocket launchers. Schneider. We began the attack to relieve Tarnopol. On the way, we ran over another mine. The tiger didn't even shudder. But as we were seated at open hatches around the crew compartment, the enormous explosion set our ears ringing. We repaired the track and after a short while rejoined the pack. z i e f r i t The heights this side of Tarnopol cannot be taken. At twelve thirty hours, we came under deafening and blinding artillery and Stalin organ fire. Sepp and Walter were wounded. We pulled out in the dark. I lost radio contact and had to fire up white flares to get it restored. Some of the tigers bogged down but could be towed out. 19th of April 1944. Obermeyer. By chance, Oberleutnant Steinbern's workshop company tiger came by and towed us free. On the journey through the encirclement, the towing hawser broke. z i e f r i t We shifted our position but came under heavy artillery fire towards 1700 hours. At 1900 hours, the operation to relieve Tarnopol continued over height 386 near Torov. Here we saw evidence of the bitter fighting, dead of both sides, Russians and men of SS Panzer Division Hohenstaufen. In Torov, I was given a job directing traffic. 20th of April 1944. z i e f r i t We went to the repair yard at Zaborov, and then in the evening to the rest area at m e t e n i o f where we would stay until the 30th of April. On the 22nd of April, I received the Panzer Assault Badge. Obermeyer. Our SPW is with the repair staff. 23rd of April 1944. Obermeyer. We drove to the rest area at m e t e n i o f near Zaborov. Schneider. There is a kind of lull before the storm. We will probably be sent to another hot spot. Our tiger has already travelled a thousand kilometres, a remarkable achievement for such a heavy wagon. 24th of April 1944. Schneider. We are still at the workshop, but I will personally not be there long because I am taking command of my own tiger. Previously, I was gunner in 331. Equal to Commander's Panzer, 3rd Platoon, 3rd Company. Our commander was Oberfeldwebel Heinrich Dietz, driver Gefreiter Kurt Lehmann, radio operator Gefreiter Kurt Kramer, and loader Hans Seidel. On the 20th of April, Lehmann was promoted to Unteroffizier, Corporal, while the radio operator and loader were both awarded the Panzer Assault Badge in silver. That was a pleasant surprise, and we took photos straight away. The same evening, I was summoned to rearward services to stand by as commander for special purposes. I was just making myself comfortable when told to get ready to lead an anti partisan group next morning. That was then cancelled because I had to take over a wagon in the workshop. This will be the original wagon of the company commander, 301, which has just been fitted with a new engine. 
My own crew has been assigned. Driver is Panzer Oberschutzer Walther from Upper Silesia. Radio operator Gefreiter Fritschertz from Austria. Rumors suggesting we were going to another sector have been discarded. We are lurking in wait for the enemy tanks which the Russians have got ready in huge numbers between Tarnopol and Brody. The weather is glorious. The terrain is baked dry and dust lies on the roll barn. Russia is truly a land of contrasts. Either you bog down in the mud or the dust suffocates you. The fighting here has now become fairly violent. The German public is probably well informed by press and radio about the fighting for Tarnopol and Brody. Many of our fathers fought and bled in this region. 29th of April 1944. Schneider. The company commander, Oberleutnant Neumeyer, handed us the Eastern Front Medal awarded in the summer of 1942. Only the ribbon is to be worn. 1st of May 1944. Siegfried, we changed location to Porhorza, where the battalion will be resting for the whole month. We put up our tents as temporary quarters near the castle. The activity has all quietened down. For the moment, we are the assault reserve. In the castle, they have arranged a variety show. The weather is still very unstable, hot by day, very cold by night. In the tent we have a decent amount of straw, which makes it tolerable. Obermeyer, resting at Podhorza. 3rd of May, 1944. Siegfried, I have to attend a radio course until the 5th of May. 4th of May, 1944. Obermeyer, reconnaissance patrol to Huta Penyaka. 8th of May, 1944. Obermeyer, Reconnaissance patrol to Zlochov, Zaborov, and Yezhena. 9th of May, 1944. Schneider. Each crew is being allocated quarters. I am with my own crew. In the afternoon we had vehicle inspection. Whoever has served with a motorized unit knows what that means. Every screw must be clean. Engine and crew compartment shining like the day they came from the manufacturer not to mention weapons, ammunition, and equipment. Being so close to the front, however, it is not chalked up against you for concentrating only on those items which one knows from experience are important for survival. Entertainment has also been laid on. I saw the films Wildvogel, Wild Bird, and Gefährliche Frühling, Dangerous Spring, both nice, enjoyable presentations, and also... Feuerzangenbola, Burnt Punch, with Heinz Ruhmann, which I had read years before in the book by Spörl. Naturally, in such a rest area, there are exercises and weapons inspections, but I don't have to suffer those any more. 10th of May, 1944. Obermeyer. Leutnant Moser played Schubert, Bach and Bruchner on the Potorza church organ. Then, by agreement, ten minutes of Peter Kreuder in return for us working the bellows. 11th of May, 1944. Schneider. I have been sent on the course for reserve officer applicants. From third company, besides myself, are one sergeant, a lance corporal, and four privates. When we reported to the commanding officer to sign off, he told us veterans that our next course would be in Germany, but the four privates had first to prove their worth at the front. Will I finally get closer to achieving my ambition on this course? We were taken by lorry to the village of Bor, a few kilometres south of Podhorza. I was given quarters in a humble cottage. 13th of May, 1944. Obermeyer. Reconnaissance patrol with officers near Brody. 14th of May, 1944. Obermeyer. Today a promenade concert. 15th of May 1944. Schneider. After three days on the course, I had to report back to company. An alarm. This was cancelled and the course continued. Spring has come. The trees are in leaf and the cherry trees in blossom. May beetles drone at dusk and the nights are wonderfully mild. Siegfried. 
We had to parade in the castle park at Potorza at seventeen hundred hours. The sun was setting blood red when Felt Marshal Model awarded Major Eric Schmidt the Knight's Cross. Nothing more to report for my part until the first of June. Sixteenth of May, nineteen forty four. Schneider. I returned to Bor without having attended the Knight's Cross parade the previous day. Eighteenth of May, nineteen forty four. Schneider, the course was suspended for a second time for another alarm, and again we were soon back at Bor. I think I'm doing well on the course. I hope there are no more interruptions in its last four days. Apart from the loss of time, driving back and forth along dusty roads is no fun. Twenty-first of May, nineteen forty-four, Obermeyer, divisional festivities at the Podhorza Castle. Twenty-second of May, nineteen forty-four, Obermeyer, we celebrated Lieutenant Moses' birthday. Twenty-fifth of May, nineteen forty-four, Schneider, the course is finished, and I believe that everything has gone well for me. The commandant had criticisms to make about many men, none from five o seven, and in conclusion said, "Those whose readiness to be an officer I have adjudged on the basis of course results." Will be going to the training school very soon. Twenty sixth of May, nineteen forty four, Schneider. Upon my return to the company, I met Heinz Zinker back from a long spell in the military hospital at Paderborn. Unter Officier Karl Kirstein has meanwhile been given command of a Tiger. Twenty eighth of May, nineteen forty four, Schneider. It is Whitson, and the finest weather one could hope for. I sunbathed all day and have a good tan. On the second holiday day, we had normal duties. This morning, we were filmed for the cinema newsreels by propaganda company correspondents. I was playing scats while others chased off the swarms of mayflies. This is the honest impression which the homeland is given of a soldier's life on the Eastern Front. Thirty-first of May, nineteen forty-four, Obermeyer, variety evening with fourteen pretty girls. First of June, nineteen forty-four, Ziefried, I have been promoted to Oberschütze. Schneider, having been confirmed as a reserve officer applicant, I am now entitled to wear silver bars on my shoulder straps. Fourth of June, nineteen forty-four, Schneider, Sunday. How many have I spent in this enemy land? Sunday is now indistinguishable from any other day. We reserve officer applicants from Third Company were given the honourable task of building a sandbox in our free time. It's a nice way to keep one busy, but makes a lot of work. In a lawn of the local castle park, we dug a hole four meters by six meters and filled it with yellow sand. Then we had to cut out houses and panzers to put on it, and much else. Once it was completed, we had Sunday afternoon free. I would like to have sunbathed, but the weather turned unfavourable. Sixth of June, nineteen forty-four, Obermeyer. We fired live rounds on an exercise. Seventh of June, nineteen forty-four, Ziefried. At fifteen hundred hours, we were relieved by the bridge watch from Plenisko. It is starting up again. Our task: help support the front line northwest of Tarnopol. We set off at nineteen hundred hours and occupied a readiness position just behind the main front line. Obermeyer. In the afternoon, we attacked with the Tigers. Eighth of June, nineteen forty-four. Siegfried. The attack began at o three hundred hours. The air was filled with rumbling and rolling thunder. Our artillery batteries fired non-stop. Then our tigers roared forward. Pioneers seated on the hulls. Ten hundred hours. Halder and Ruhl, both staff reconnaissance company, came back wounded. We captured a Studebaker truck and a nine point two centimeter anti-tank gun. Leek's wagon, staff reconnaissance company, received a direct hit. Huss was killed; the others seriously wounded. Towards nineteen hundred hours, we withdrew, having carried out our mission. 
9th of June, 1944. Schneider. For three days we have been in action in a peculiar way. It started as an exercise, and then something serious developed out of it, though nothing major. Yesterday I was VB, Advanced Observer, in the main battle line. I saw some enemy tanks which ran for it as soon as I opened fire on them. The same day we received a hit in the stowage box. Amongst other things, the wonderful wind cheater which my mother had sewn for me from captured Russian tent material was reduced to ribbons. Obermeyer. We joined Third Company as radio relay post. 10th of June, 1944. Obermeyer. In the evening we returned with Third Company. Along the woodside we received heavy fire from anti-tank guns and rifles, but suffered no casualties. Rested in Podhorza. Schneider. In the afternoon our company commander, Fritz Neumeyer, received the German cross in gold. The war is over, and we are back in our old lodgings. Yesterday they held an NCO's evening, starting at 2100 hours and lasting until 7 next morning. The venue was a spooky vault fitted with pitfalls and trip wires. 16th of June, 1944. Schneider. After being given the rank of Fahnenjunker Unteroffizier, Officer Cadet Senior Grade, I was dispatched to Paderborn with Erebert von Wienskowski. The pay sergeant, Sepp Meyer, let us have a good supply of smokers' requisites for the journey, while our company commander gave us a pair of shoulder straps each from his collection as a parting gift. The shoulder straps remained in Schneider's possession as souvenirs. His service with Panzer Battalion 507 now ended. Upon his arrival at Paderborn as a reserve officer applicant, he was transferred to the Panzer Grenadiers as a junior lieutenant, and despite all his efforts never returned to the Panzers. Erebert von Wienskowski, in the same group as Schneider at Grossleinecke, was not commissioned and after the course ended, returned to Third Company. Nothing is known of his further service or whereabouts. Schneider spent the last months of the war on a wanderer bicycle. Armed with a Panzerfaust and assault rifle at Oppenheim on the Rhine, he faced the advance of the U.S. Army. 19th of June, 1944. Obermeyer. Drove to Sukadola with officers. Inspected remote-controlled Panzer. 21st of June, 1944. Obermeyer. Leutnant Moser is being transferred out. Siegfried. I have been transferred to HQ for a week with the watch commando, having a good time. 29th of June, 1944. Siegfried. I am back with the battalion. At 13.30 hours, we were put on notice to leave for Zlotchov where we loaded on rail transports from 1545 hours. It is said that we are going to the central sector of the Eastern Front. When the train passed through Lemberg, many of the men were already drunk. Obermeyer, pulling out of Pothorza. In the afternoon, we were loaded at Zlotchov. In the evening, the train set off in the direction of Lemberg. Helmut Schneider my experience between Tarnopol and Brody. I wrote the following report on the 20th of September, 1944, at the Senior Cadet School, Grosdleinecke, Berlin. I beg the reader's indulgence for the rather bombastic style of writing which was expected on the course. 21st of March, 1944. The onset of spring. Our tigers were unloaded between Lemberg and Tarnopol. We were full of expectation and hopes regarding the prospects with our fabulous new panzer. The Russians we knew. In the first year of the Russian campaign we had resisted them victoriously in our light panzers. We set off without delay, heading for the enemy, directly from the unloading ramp, so to speak. In the spring of 1944, the situation on this sector of the front was very serious. Our task was to close down a gap in the front 40 kilometres wide. Its ends were Tarnopol and Brody. 
For fourteen days we went from one battle to the next. The struggle against a numerically far superior enemy was not easy, and what made it especially difficult was the thaw which softened the terrain everywhere. Many of our panzers suffered mechanical damage, especially to gears and engines. Thus, on Good Friday, the 7th of April, only two Tigers of 3rd Company were operational, strung out as part of a long line cooperating with others of 2nd Company to cover an attack by two Panther battalions. I was gunner in the Tiger of the Company Commander, Oberleutnant Fritz Neumeyer. Our companion 3rd Company Tiger was a 100 metres to our right, its commander being platoon leader Oberfeldwebel Heinz Dietz. At midday we had just finished off some mixed conserves and were feeling satisfied and relaxed. In the crew compartment of the Panzer it was icy cold. I had removed my boots and hung them over the cannon, wrapping my feet in blankets. The commander was reading a newspaper. The driver was on watch. Radio operator and loader were asleep, understandable after such tension. Suddenly we heard engine noises. Our own panzers were only to our right, in a depression. Therefore, this must be Ivan. I had just snatched my boots from the gun when the commander shouted, "'Enemy tanks half right!' The engine started and the turret began to swivel simultaneously. Almost at once I had an enemy tank in the optic, a T-34, moving fast towards our second company neighbours. Sights, one thousand metres. Hold steady. Fire. Too short. What happened next transpired over a period of six minutes. My second round, with sights set for one thousand two hundred metres, bagged him. A stab of flame showed us that he was done for. Next I saw muzzle flashes to the left. It could not be made out clearly, except that the tigers of our neighbouring company seemed intent on attacking. Our two third company tigers moved up, and we soon spotted the enemy, five tanks carefully camouflaged in gardens. Because they were all concentrating on the second company panzers, the Soviets offered us their side profile as a target. The second company tigers scored some hits, but a number of shells bounced off the Russian armour, and so we knew these were heavy tanks we were facing. Soon I could recognise them, heavy, self-propelled assault guns. If they manoeuvred to turn those 12.2 centimetre guns to bear on us, we were in trouble. Our commander steered us farther left to make our shooting position more favourable, and then we fired round after round. Every round hit. One blast of flame after another showed the effectiveness of our 88. When a couple of Russians attempted to abandon their tank, we fired between them with our MG. It went off better than an exercise with weeks of planning. Three assault guns brewed up, and our companion Tiger claimed three T-34s destroyed. Then we came under anti-tank gunfire. Our turret swiveled left. HE rounds, sights 2,200 metres, fire, and an anti-tank gun was no more. The same fate swiftly overwhelmed an anti-aircraft gun in the ground-fire roll. When we took stock, our proud achievement was three heavy assault guns, four T-34s, one anti-tank and one anti-aircraft gun. That had been some six minutes. In the afternoon, when discussing the action with the second company crews, we found that they had received hits but suffered no casualties. But how would it have been if we had not given them such good protection on the flank? Weeks later, I saw the photos which radio operator Kurt Kramer had taken secretly from his viewing slit. They created for me an indelible memory of this panzer action in which we two crews of Third Company had emerged victorious against nine dangerous opponents. Richard Durst, Repair Staff, Third Company on a Sweden drink at Podhorza Castle. When we were finally unloaded at Krasna after five days on the train transporter, this did not mean that we had firm ground beneath our feet at last. The ground was unsuitable for the wide and heavy field tracks of the Tigers, not to mention the minefields laid almost everywhere with such cunning. Any modern referee would have declared the pitch unplayable. 
Podhotsa was the first resting place after the initial weeks of operations of Panzer Battalion 507 in the Tarnopol Brody area. There followed many fastidious vehicle and weapons inspections, hours set aside for cleaning and repairs, instruction and training, exercising and singing, and naturally doing sentry duty. But we also had off-duty interests, cinema, front welfare, sport and bodily hygiene. Once we even had some propaganda company people come to film us as we were hunting down May beetles. 1944 being a major year of infestation, apparently, but once the preferred filming nearer the front became more difficult, they quickly withdrew. Decorations were awarded and promotions handed down. In this connection, I mention a company evening which took place in the cellars of Potorza Castle. The cellar was fitted out with pitfalls, tripwire, and every possible kind of stuffed animal discovered in the castle. Since promotions had to be celebrated with alcohol, some of the older veterans revived the peacetime customs. Stabsfeldfabel Bruno Betka was probably the initiator of the Sweden drink, which the promoted youngsters were forced to drink, and he emphasized that in former times the drinking vessel had been a sabre scabbard. I had just received my promotion to Unteroffizier, and with two others, a sergeant and an officer cadet, was forced to partake. The Sweden drink consisted of high percentage alcohol enriched with all kinds of tasty additives, such as pepper, salt and mustard, castor oil and shoe polish. Amazingly, the commanding officer of the remote-controlled panzer unit was addicted to it and even took some away with him for later. This company celebration had other consequences which were hard to cover up. Unteroffizier Schwab had a special ration of mustard poured over his black uniform at the field kitchen, and Dr. Hans Maul probably knew more than he admitted about people shooting out lamps in our quarters with service pistols. Hubert Hagenberger Memories of My First Operations with Tiger 324 It was the 24th of March, 1944. The first night which we spent at Oliov, 26 kilometres east of Zlochov, lay behind us. We had parked our Tiger 324 near a house and on firm ground, so that in the prevailing temperatures of minus 30 degrees, the tracks would not freeze to the soil. Inexperienced and only on operations for a few days, we kept strictly to the instructions laid down by Unteroffizier Anton Henrich, commander of our Tiger particularly myself as driver. We had noticed a distinct change in him since leaving Weserp in Holland, whereas before this powerful, broad-shouldered man with bushy eyebrows had often been very nervous and prone to fits of temper, now after the first few days on operations he was calmer and even taciturn. Perhaps it had to do with our gunner, Obergefreiter Anton Schunort, advising him a week earlier that he should keep offering me, the driver, advice on how to drive. Whatever the cause, since then there had been a certain tension in the air. The crew had been thrown together in Holland. The small Schmerling, always with a smile on his lips, was Loder. Franz Leyenbauer, who came from my region, was radio operator. We interacted quite well. Everybody knew his job, but, despite that, the shortcomings resulting from too short a period of training began to manifest themselves in the first days of operations. We were heading towards the enemy. After a heavy snowstorm cleared, we suddenly had before us some Russian tanks, which we engaged immediately. The last of them fell victim to a barrage of fire under the leadership of the company commander. After that it all fell quiet on the enemy side, just two heaps of mangled steel. When we were pushing forward across the plain next day, Ivan raked us with artillery fire which began to come even closer. I was not aware that we were carrying infantry on the hull, because Henrik failed to inform me when we made a short stop in the village. Our attack petered out. I put the engine into neutral, selected the fourth reverse gear, and awaited the order to reverse. 
Meanwhile, Ivan's guns had got our range, and his shells were falling all around us. I heard the expected order in my earphones, and my pressure on the starter button wiped out two German soldiers. The panzer bobbed slightly and then burrowed back into the snow. I saw before us our tracks in the snow, then a pair of boots and a kind of small suitcase. Drive a halt! I heard the order ring in my ears, and then there was a deathly silence. France, I asked the radio operator, what is that case ahead? He fired a brief burst with his MG, and the suitcase blew up. It probably contained hand grenades. Now I heard in the earphones, Man, those poor boys, we've run over two of them. I couldn't fully grasp what had happened. The horror of it choked me. The attack continued. Later we established the tragic details. The infantry with us had taken cover from the artillery fire behind the panzer and failed to react quickly enough when I reversed. As we proceeded, the snow began to obscure my viewing slit, and I cleared it away with my boots. We entered a village whose cottages were taken under fire from three sides. The effect was enormous. Russian troops poured out from every door and window and took to their heels eastwards up a hill. The brown-clad figures were easy to pick out against the snow. Under RMG fire, only few had a chance to escape alive. Finally, all movement in the snow stopped. The attack was called off, and we rolled back to Oleov. I parked the tiger and bedded it on straw in front of our quarters. I could see strips of flesh in the tracks, a ghastly sight. We asked some of the infantrymen about the unfortunate victims. They were a nineteen-year-old and a family man from the Zudetenland. We went into our lodgings depressed and sad. The owners of the cottage stared at us anxiously. These poor people, once subjects of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, now faced an uncertain future. Many of the older folks spoke German, and one of them had once been in the Austrian army in quarters at Aferding near Linz. We had no time to reflect on all this. Those not given sentry duty sank exhausted into the straw, to arise next morning ready to face the awful present. At sunrise I climbed over the iced-up tracks into the panzer, dropped into the driver's seat and let the engine warm up. Then I rolled the machine back and forward a little to check the suspension. Oil pressure was good, everything in order, and next I checked the track bolts. The morning was icy cold. The cottages of a layoff, simple structures of wood and clay under a roof of straw, trembled as four tigers roared in from the east, one after the other, one of them with a Russian anti-tank gun in tow. Lieutenant Bernie Feufer, whom I knew from Cherkasy, climbed out happily and described his assault on an enemy anti-tank gun position. Everyone admired his bravado, particularly since he had brought along the gun to prove it. So this was one of the things which made life so difficult for us. Little did we know that in the afternoon a pack, Panzerabwehr Kanona, anti-tank gun like that would bring us death and destruction. Panzer Marsch ordered Unteroffizier Anton Henrich, and our 324 pulled out as the second and not fourth panzer of 2nd Platoon, 3rd Company, following platoon commander Lieutenant Eichmuller. The other two panzers were non-operational, one being in the workshop, and the engine of the other had overheated as soon as it started up. Its driver, Kugler, was fiddling about under the engine cover, embraced by fumes and smoke. This meant that only two Tigers were heading to Biaglovi on a difficult mission. The journey took us uphill, past a church with a large onion dome, then into open country, where we soon came to the main battle line, hardly recognisable as such. There lay our infantry in hollows in the ground, trembling with cold, bedded on straw, but without shelter or cover. Some of these warriors had been brought into our village in the early hours, boys with frozen feet. An infantry colonel climbed into Eichmuller's panzer while we received a junior lieutenant. The officers were curious to witness a panzer attack at first hand. 
Ahead of us lay rolling hills, still deeply covered in snow. The two tigers pushed forward slowly, first through bushy terrain, three to four to the left, climbing a low hill. Eichmüller with driver Josef Platchek descending slightly into a valley. It was quiet. No Russian could be seen. About a thousand meters ahead of us was a ridge with a copse of pine trees. From there, Henrik suddenly saw the muzzle flash of a pack. Advance to the next hill, he ordered. Three to four roared through the deep snow, engine howling. When we reached the crest, and Henrik ordered halt. The tiger seesawed. We had been served up as if on a plate in full view of the enemy. Russian infantry were nearby. We had scarcely fired our first round than the Russian pack fired its second round and hit our tracks right side. Henrik's order, driver go back, which would have brought us into a kind of more favourable reverse slope position, came too late, and now we began receiving hits from everywhere. Luckily, none of them armour piercing. As our panzer rolled back, to my horror, I saw the right track stretching out in the snow. I reported this to Henrik, who seemed very excited, and in a hoarse voice ordered me to bring the panzer down into the gully. Having shed its right track, however, the panzer sagged to the right, while the left track turned us in a circle. Out! I shouted, but nobody reacted. When I looked behind me next, I saw the crew compartment was no longer occupied, but that the turret was still turning. I switched off the engine. I noticed that the emergency exit hatch was open. When I removed my earphones, I heard for the first time what was happening around me. Nothing. Now I was seized by panic. The only thing that mattered was to get out. I opened the driver's hatch. The Russians fired and hit it. I locked it shut, noticing radio operator Franz Leyenbauer wriggling into the turret with a smoke candle. I can't get us away from here. I told him, "We've lost the right track." We'll make smoke," he replied. I thought this was a good idea to cover our escape, but searched in vain around the turret base for the igniter. Now we had no option but to evacuate the Panzer at once, and I dived headlong through the emergency exit into the open, making a soft landing in the deep snow by the wheels. I saw Eichmüller's tiger standing in a depression about a hundred and fifty meters away. Two men clad in black lay on the ground, motionless between our two panzers. For me, there now began a race with death. What we had been taught in training, I now had to put into practice: jump up, run, run, lie down, roll to one side, jump up again, run, run. Without gloves, I was suffering terribly with the cold. In a depression in the ground, I spotted the wreck of a Soviet tank, which seemed to offer good cover. I reached it breathless. Until then, Ivan had even been firing at me with armor-piercing shells. Looking cautiously beyond the steel colossus, I saw two gray figures with pointed caps creeping up stealthily. Without any kind of weapon, I had no chance. I thought of home and decided that it ended here. Suddenly, I heard the noise of an approaching Panzer. Here was my last chance. First, I saw the rod aerial appear. Then I waited at the edge of the earth bank until the Panzer was close enough, and then, with a couple of leaps and bounds, I was in front of the Tiger, waving to its driver, Plachek. He opened the hatch cover, and in an instant I was inside the Panzer and slid behind the driver into the crew compartment, fighting for breath like a hunted wild animal. By Loda Hans Zorner stood the infantry colonel, who, like the lieutenant with us in three two four, had wanted to experience an attack at first hand. Eichmüller gave me a cigarette, and his Panzer set off again. On its turret lay Franz Leyenbauer, still alive, and the infantry lieutenant in a winter camouflage suit, wheezing from a chest wound. He had not been able to climb, and the brave little Schmerling had helped him up on the Panzer. That had cost Schmerling his life. Franz said he had been shot in the head. Our commander Anton Henrich had been killed while abandoning three two four. Gunlayer Anton Schunort was hit between the two Panzers. 
You bring the lieutenant to the main battle line and stay with him until help arrives, was the order we survivors of 324 were given as we dismounted. The lieutenant could hardly stand, and when we delivered him to his unit, he collapsed almost lifeless into their arms. Behind us, Eichmüller's 88 suddenly thundered off and finished off 324, around which the Russians were already gathering. On the way back, when we passed the church where our attack had begun, Franz said, Now I'm a believer again somewhat. Surviving crew of Wagon 324 reporting back, I informed Oberleutnant Fritz Neumeyer and Spiech Battalion Sergeant Major Ignaz Bäumler on our return. They merely stared, and after a few questions we were dismissed. A year later, I met Anton Schunort at the Fallingbostel training depot. After escaping from 324, he had been wounded by MG fire in the neck and arms, and had collapsed unconscious. When 324's turret fell off, it woke him, and he waited until dusk before making it back to our lines. We had reported him dead. Franz Leyenbauer and I were allocated a fresh billet. We were driven to the church at Zlotchov, which was still adorned by the five-pointed red star of the Soviet Union. Probably nobody had had the time to take it down. Our hostess, an old babushka, blubbered when she saw me and lamented for her child, who was my age, and stroked my cheeks. I was ashamed that I found her mother's distress irritating. Her son was probably a soldier or partisan somewhere, it was difficult for anybody to know what was going on in Galicia. It was a bright moonlit night as I stood my turn as sentry. I saw a figure dart into a barn. I advanced, which was imprudent, and heard a rustling in the straw. Nobody obeyed my order to come out. I was doubtful about shooting, and so just kept my eye on it from a nearby haystack. Perhaps it was Malinky, the landlady. Once my relief came, I spent the rest of the night on an old sofa in Zlotchov. Hubert Hagenberger, Final Rank Gefreiter, My Memory of Operation Tarnopol After we had had 324 shot out from under us on the 24th of March 1944, I was put into the rear echelon at Zlotchov, and was present when they discussed my next posting. Leutnant Bernhard Feufer a hefty Nuremberger with whom I had served at Chikasi wanted me as his driver. The commander of 3rd Platoon Oberfeldwebel Heinz Dietz was also in the market when Stabsfeldwebel Bruno Betger ruled, I'll take him, you youngsters all fall out. Betger was apparently a man who commanded respect, even if, as in this case, he had a very unmilitary manner. Feufer accepted it, however, and naturally my own opinion was not consulted. With a smart Yavul, I marched out under the gaze, through gold-rimmed spectacles, of 3rd Company Commander Oberleutnant Fritz Neumeyer. I introduced myself immediately to the crew of my new Tiger 313, to which Betger had appointed me as driver. Gunner was Hoffman from Bad Kissingen. Radio operator Joachim Moyer from Leipzig, and loader Franz Pass from Lower Austria. While the Panzer was still at the workshop, we were housed in a wooden shack and slept on a bed of straw on the floor at night. Franz Pass had organised farm produce from the locals, and Betger was very complimentary about his brave loader's home-brewed egg flip. One day, watched by Neumeyer, and probably with his approval, at long range with a 98k carbine, France killed a hare hopping across ploughed land. It did not surprise us to learn that he had hunted a bit in the past. At the workshop I made the suggestion that a segment of track could be fitted to the front of the panzer, not only as a spare, but also for additional armour protection. This suggestion was not only accepted, but fitted immediately to all battalions' panzers. On the 14th of April 1944, we were given notice of a very important operation for this sector, the relief of Tarnopol. At Torov, on the way to Horodice, and further on towards Stobotka, we received artillery fire. 
The bridge over the Vozokar was still being constructed by the pioneers, and so we had to wait in open country. Through my viewing slit I saw Oberleutnant Wiersching, 2nd Platoon Commander, going from Panzer to Panzer, probably to pass instructions to each commander. He did this with surprising imperturbability, disappearing occasionally behind great fountains of earth and dirt. We had scarcely received the warning of mines when Wiersching's panzer ahead to our left was suddenly enveloped in smoke, having apparently run over one. Finally, the new bridge was ready. Under the great weight of each tiger, it adopted an alarming angle of tilt every time, but survived. On the other bank was a fairly steep slope where numerous panzers and SPWs of SS Panzer Division Hohenstaufen had assembled. We were attacked by a Rata, Polikarpov I-16 fighter. Somebody placed an MG on Placek's shoulder, and after a few rounds the aircraft departed, never to return, giving us the chance to sort ourselves out without Ivan watching from above. We set off. Reaching the crest of a hill, we came under heavy artillery fire, but hardly had any other opposition. We overran their artillery position in the next village, but 313 was far out on the right flank and took no part. Along the railway line, 313 was mined, leaving the left track stretched out on the grass amongst the primroses. The railway embankment had been secured by the Waffen-SS for some time, but after the entire force moved forward, we were left to our own devices. About a kilometre away, on the far side of the embankment, was a small wood, with a much larger one to its right. Left of them both, an onion-shaped church tower appeared. Before our eyes, a swarm of Ilyushin II fighter bombers destroyed the Stanislaw Tarnopol railway line. One of these aircraft headed directly towards us, but then dropped his bomb on the permanent way, leaving the ends of the rails reared up vertically. Open all hatches and lower the gun barrel, Betka ordered. It's best we play dead until we fit the track on again. The noise of the battle for Tarnopol could be heard to the east. I jumped down and saw that the track was so far behind the panzer that the thin hawser wouldn't reach it. Therefore we had to remove segments of the track for reassembly where we were stranded. This kept everybody busy for some time. The mine explosion had deformed the drive sprocket into a slightly oval shape, and thirteen track members were no longer usable. Luckily we had enough in reserve. Meanwhile Betka had been observing the woods and established that the enemy had been infiltrating the larger wood without let-up and so we increased our efforts to the maximum. That beautifully warm spring day had been the last for one of the soldiers lying on the railway embankment. When I removed his damaged steel helmet, I read his name. Horst had been just nineteen. We might have been able to help another soldier beyond the embankment in a field of green corn. With binoculars, Betka could not make out if it was one of our infantry or a Russian. I heard his dreadful cries in my ears long afterwards. They sounded more Russian than German, and his uniform looked more like one of theirs. He was lying unfavourably positioned between ourselves and the woods, therefore in the field of fire of both sides, and so nobody dared go to his aid. This war was ruthless, with neither space nor time for humanity. At last we got the track out for the panzer wheels to roll over. We had to dig out a meter at the end of the track before we could hammer home the last bolt. Without our knowledge, a German Nebelwerfer unit had moved up two kilometers to our rear, and suddenly their rockets came howling past overhead to fill the woods where the Russians had formed up to attack our flank. We had fixed the track without any attention from the enemy, but when we went into the village, members of a Russian battalion were there to fetch water and chased us over the fields like hares. Our midday meal was rolled barley heated with a blow lamp. Naturally, we might have had something better, but Papa Betka was saving it. The Shocker Cola chocolate drink had long since been used up and the coffee tins refilled with ballast. At the inventory of rations, the controllers were satisfied if the contents of the tin felt the right weight. Tarnopol had been relieved. Some figures appeared from the town, probably the first to break out of the encirclement. 
no longer soldiers, most of them unarmed, their features marked by tension and struggle in their torn and tattered rags, they looked like refugees. Pale and famished, they tottered over the ploughed meadows of flowers towards a fresh uncertainty. 313 was ready to roll, but our mission was now to secure the area against Russian attacks. That night on sentry duty, I was even issued with a machine pistol and flare gun. Towards midnight, when something white came towards me from the railway embankment, I fired a flare to see it better. Unfortunately, I was standing close to the panzer, and my elbow struck it hard with the recoil. This put me out of action for a while, and with one arm hanging down, I finally made out what was approaching. A cow loaded with bedding accompanied by a man and woman. Were they really fugitives, or spies coming to assess the situation? I accosted this strange party. In response to my question, they pointed to the west and said, Nadamoy, going home. I let them pass. There were so many fugitives in those days. Next day, panzers drove back with infantry riding on the hulls, or followed by prisoners. 313 had 35 men aboard, and we hightailed it out of there. For us, Operation Tarnopol was over. Dr. Max Viersching, Final Rank, Hauptmann, Special Operation Brody, Spring 1944. Brody, in Polish Galicia, a town near the southern source of the Buk River, was surrounded. Inside it were 800 seriously wounded German troops trapped without medical supplies or provisions. Several attempts had been made by the Waffen-SS, Divisions Hohenstaufen, Frunzberg, to relieve the town or at least send in help for the wounded, but all had been unsuccessful. A possible umbilical cord was the road between Pothorza and Brody. Though open, it was mined, and in general, the Russians kept an eye on mine barriers. The mission received by the commanding officer of 507 Panzer Battalion, presumably from General Mayor Frieber, required that a convoy of supply vehicles, supported by Tiger tanks, would proceed from Pothorza to Brody in order to supply the 800 wounded soldiers trapped in the encirclement. For this probable suicide mission, Major Schmidt appealed to the platoon leaders for a volunteer to lead the operation, and let it be understood that this operation, the success of which would save the lives of numerous German soldiers, would merit the Knight's Cross. Despite that, nobody came forward, and so Major Schmidt stated that he was obliged to appoint somebody, and his choice fell on Oberleutnant Wiersching as the oldest and probably most experienced officer. Wiersching insisted that every Panzer crew member must be a volunteer, and as a result it was mainly men of his own platoon and second company who manned the Tigers protecting the convoy. Attached to this convoy would also be one platoon of pioneers and several SPWs with Panzer grenadiers and medical teams. Five Tigers would form the spearhead, a sixth the rear guard, and between those panzers would be around eighty lorries and the SPWs. The journey, according to the map, was 12.5 kilometres. All drivers had to keep an eye on their mileage indicator, and so remain aware of how far it was to the objective. The convoy left at dusk. Hauptfeldwebel Hugo Arnold's leading panzer was the first to run over a mine. The crew transferred to an SPW, which continued on towards Brody. Wiersching's Tiger was the second to be disabled by a mine. Wiersching and his radio operator transferred to the third Tiger, and this was repeated three more times until he got to Brody in the rear guard. I have explained how we overcame the enemy resistance, including by the use of our disabled panzers, we saw a light 300 metres left of us and fired at it with armour-piercing shells. We hit a structure, apparently a barn, which burst into flames and illuminated the battlefield for us. Each of the commands I transferred to was mined. I had no contact with company, battalion or division, and finally, when I had to bring up the last tiger from the rearguard, I was doubtful if there was any point in going on 
for if we lost the sixth and last tiger, we would have had it. Thinking of the eight hundred wounded men was decisive, quite apart from the fact that the lorries would not have been able to turn back even after the prisoners had cleared the minefields. Vishing also recalled that one of his tiger drivers, who sustained a serious leg injury in a mine explosion, was taken back in a motorcycle sidecar. He himself was deaf for weeks due to the explosions. Surprisingly, this special operation was forgotten until 1985, when besides Max Wiersching and Hugo Arnold, other men present, Helmut Gutmann, driver, Willy Wolf, commander, Johann Steiskel, radio operator, and Rudolf Pointer, loader, all gave their accounts of it. Max Wiersching was not awarded the Knight's Cross hinted at for this operation, although he received it in 1945 for other reasons. Probably someone else had a prior claim. Soon after the relief of Brody, he received other honours, such as the German Army Honour Roll clasp and a mention in the Wehrmacht Bulletin. Helmut Kusner, from the Everyday Life of the Workshop Company Helmut Kusner was chief of the workshop at the time when 507 was being formed and recalled the following. The CO had promised panzer drivers that those whose tigers went 2,000 kilometers without requiring a change of engine would receive a long special leave. This led to the following interesting case. A tiger, whose number I cannot remember, was brought into the workshop with the complaint that the engine stuttered when running. On the test stand, however, it ran perfectly. Because the fighting unit was not in action, we could search for the cause with due diligence. Trial runs brought the same result. Therefore, it could only be the fuel supply. So we exchanged the carburetor, filter, fuel lines, and finally the entire engine. Nothing made it any better. This meant that the problem must be the fuel tank. We discovered that the Tiger had received a hit on the rear side which had dented the hull and the fuel tank. Part of the tank's inner layers had flaked off and settled at the bottom. On the move, these flakes continually obstructed the filter of the drain pipe and disturbed the uniform flow of the fuel. We changed the tank, put back the old engine, and a short time afterwards the driver was awarded his well-deserved special leave. The number of panzer drivers who achieved this desirable goal was surprisingly high. I think it was 17. In order to speed up repair times for Tigers and release technical staff for more complicated repairs, I selected 15 men with technical qualifications from amongst the Russian prisoners brought in by our battalion, and these men were put to work on tracks and suspensions with an interpreter. The unit was led by an Obergefreiter from Poland who oversaw the work. These Russians were very hard workers, and so were well paid and fed. When the retreat crossed the German border, we had to hand these heavies over to a POW camp. Rudy Biofus, initially a platoon commander in 1st Company, recalled the first operations of the company. During the work in the spring of 1944 in Galicia, First Company fought until the 30th of April at Kovel, in terrain unsuitable for heavy panzers. For this reason, the Commander-in-Chief 4th Army General Oberst Erhard Raus released the company to battalion. After the situation around Tarnopol and Brody stabilized, First Company was assigned to 8th Panzer Division under General Major Frieber. Gert Eichmüller, The Art of Bailing Out from a Panzer Gert Eichmüller, already mentioned in Hubert Hagenberger's report, recalls one of seven missions in which he took part over the tarnopol Brody area as follows. As commander of the 2nd Platoon, 3rd Company, my crew, being Placek, driver, Engelhardt, gunner, Zauner, loader, and Graf, radio operator, we were part of a large troop unit led by panzers, and followed by infantry in SPWs. Making an attack, we passed a village on our right. At its edge, we observed that the Russians had dug in packs. One of them fired and hit our fine, previously undamaged tiger on the left side. 
the shell passing through the bodywork, igniting powder spilled from a damaged shell, and tearing away the seesaw pedals for the turret rotating mechanism beneath the feet of the gunner. A few seconds later, Engelhardt, his feet burning hot, was sitting on my lap. Driver and loader had left the Panzer through their individual hatches without difficulty, but the gunner and I found it more difficult because the turret entrance was not designed for two men to pass through at the same time, one wearing a pistol whose holster was fixed very firmly to a broad belt. Nevertheless, the flames were now such that a way was found, and we got to freedom together, though the pistol holster tore off. The situation for the radio operator, whose hatch would not open, looked hopeless, because the gun was at the 130 position. This angle of traverse was unfavourable if one was receiving pack fire from the left, for then the whole linkage gear stood behind the radio operator's seat so that he had no access into the turret. Fortunately, Graf was slim, and the temperature so hot that the impossible was achieved, and after a short time, we four who had already bailed out of the panzer could greet our fifth man joyfully. We had all been more or less singed, and were picked up by one of the SPWs behind us. Siegfried Beck In Memoriam Leutnant Bernie Feufer and Victor's Story when we were then Panzer Battalion 507, Tigers, I was the driver of 311, which was the platoon commander's panzer of 1st Platoon, 3rd Company. Our commander was Lieutenant Bernhard Feufer, Gunner Paula, Loder Moyer, Radio Operator Schreckenstein. In our baptism of fire in Galicia, a T-34 shot away a track cover. We were spearhead panzer, and as we neared a village held by the enemy, I noticed a pack, but my warning shouts were drowned by Lieutenant Feufer. Go over the Holman! Holman means beams or spars. I was already in forward sixth gear, but what did I know about Holman? I crushed the pack starting from the muzzle. Luckily, our tracks remained intact. Lieutenant Feufer was a very daredevil type. I remember on an attack, as I was about to run over some civilians lying on the ground, and whom I had taken for enemy close combat troops or partisans, he stopped me. I had just shortly before received a hit to the viewing slit shield from an anti-tank rifle. On the operations to break the Tarnopol encirclement, 314 drove through a minefield. I saw the traces ahead left by a Russian tank and was pleased to have found a way through, but hit a mine all the same. We received a pack hit simultaneously in the right drive sprocket where the shell came to rest. In order to get the Panzer mobile again, we had to insert some replacement segments into the damaged track while under fire. For this purpose, we enlisted the services of some prisoners who had been brought in shortly before. Amongst them was Victor, who was from Moscow, and he had been a member of the pack gun crew, which had probably fired the shell to do the damage. The gear rim of the drive wheel was so badly damaged that we had no option but to return to the repair staff workshop. As we were crossing a river, we nearly overturned on the bridge when the subsoil shifted. On our way back, Victor sat forward with me on the hatch, lighting my cigarettes. At a stop, I was about to jump down from the bow of the panzer, but Victor held me back, pointing to a coffin mine lying directly below. It was dug in, and the part of it which remained visible looked like a piece of wood. I expressed my gratitude to Victor for saving my life by letting him change the engine oil when we got back to base. To do that, the ground plate had to be unscrewed in order to open the oil drainage screw. This was a filthy job, because the oil would first of all run down your sleeve. Therefore, while Victor was busy changing the oil, I went off to the kitchen to get us both a meal. When I came back, Oberleutnant Neumeyer, the company commander, was standing by my panzer, mesmerized by the pair of Russian boots projecting from underneath the hull. When he heard the story, he put Victor on the fuel detail and not into a POW camp. Heinz Thracker, 
Radio Operator, Final Rank Gefreiter, Rest Days at Podhorza. Coming from Paderborn, I arrived at Podhorza, Galicia, where the third company was resting after its first operation in the Tarnopol Brody area. In the castle, little involved in the war, were located the battalion staff and elements of third company. The tigers were parked well camouflaged. By the wall of the castle garden, in the shadow of old trees, was the third company field kitchen, whose cooks made sure we were well fed during the R and R. As a newcomer, I lived with a crowd of other company members in a large house along the main road, where we made the occasional effort to cook for ourselves. In those days, I would receive from home a parcel containing, amongst other things, items much sought after by the local civilian population. And which were therefore suitable for barter. A driver from the support platoons, whose name I do not recall, was a skilled negotiator to whom I entrusted a number of articles. In exchange for combs, flints, earrings, and rosaries, he would bring us eggs and bacon. Since we had numerous Austrians, particularly Viennese, in the company, pancakes were also much favoured, for which the cook would sometimes add seasoning and a garnish. Many blackbirds flew around the massive square castle tower. These were identified by the ornithologists amongst us as jackdaws. One day in the castle park, we found a young bird which we picked up and fed initially with pre-chewed bread, but later he did it himself. Jacob, as we christened him, could fly, but never left us. Often he would be out of sight, but when we called, he would come fluttering over with a loud caw. After a while, he would even repeat his name, and so the small black ball of feathers gave us much pleasure. At the end of June 1944, the rest period at Podhorza came to an end. We were loaded up, and when the heavily laden tank transporter train headed to the west, the glad word was Western Front. But it did not turn out like that. Hubert Hagenberger, from Podhorza to Baranovitsa. The great departure from the so familiar Podhorza began on the twenty ninth of June, nineteen forty four. We trundled through Sasov and Zlochov to the marshalling yard where the transporter trains awaited. That night we were bothered constantly by those nuisances, the duty NCOs, Russian light bomber aircraft. We awoke to a glorious summer's day, and the train went via Ravaruskaya to Lublin. Which, with its pointed spires and huge water towers, provided a wonderful picture of peace in the hinterland of the approaching front. We stopped just outside Lublin, alongside a hospital train on the neighboring track. The soldiers in the cattle trucks made a pitiful sight in their cut-open uniforms with bloodied bandages on all possible parts of the body. This is what's in store for you," one of the patients shouted over. Which made us all feel uneasy. Who would want to finish up like that? At least they had the advantage of coming away from the front. Our train continued into the warm summer's evening, and soon the stars were twinkling high above us. The rumors were doing the rounds that we were bound for the invasion front in the west. But when the train stopped in Sielza, I looked for the pole star. And as the train set off again, I could advise my fellow travellers that we were heading east. It is difficult to describe the disappointment. Everybody had been hoping for a more pleasant enemy in the west. On the second of July, nineteen forty-four, we crossed the river Bok at Brest-Litovsk. It was spanned by a huge steel bridge, which I photographed as we crossed. On the morning of the third of July. We could make out a pair of silvery, glinting radio masts on the eastern horizon. After searching my memory, I was able to inform everybody that we were at Baranovitsa. Towards midday, we arrived there and alighted from our rolling transporter under the protection of a quadruple flak gun. Chapter Four, from Baranovitsa to Schaffenwiese. On the twenty-second of June, nineteen forty-four, the third anniversary of the beginning of the campaign in the east, the Russians launched an offensive with a hundred and forty infantry divisions and forty-three tank groups. 
Army Group Center, against which it was unleashed, was holding a thousand kilometers of front line, with just 34 infantry divisions, 18th and 25th Panzer Grenadier divisions, and 20th Panzer Division. The front collapsed, and the enemy armor and masses of infantry headed westwards unstoppably towards Minsk. Comprehensive destruction of railways by partisans prevented German reserves being brought up in time. In the wake of these events in the central sector, Panzer Battalion 507 was transferred to the area around Baranovica. On the 5th of July 1944, 4th Army was overwhelmed, 9th Army forced back to Baranovica, and 3rd Army to the Lithuanian border. Contact with Army Group North was lost, and new Russian offensives began simultaneously against Army Groups North and South. The enemy tank armies broke through the border between 1st and 4th Panzer armies and surged deep into Galicia. After three years learning it the hard way, the Red Army had now mastered German panzer tactics and developed them further while assembling masses of tanks and men. If the Russian tank tactics of 1941-2 had been unwieldy and disorganized, now they were the equal of the German Blitzkrieg in focus and maneuverability. Here follows the calendar of Battalion 507 events for the period 4th of July to the 8th of September, containing the details of Panzer actions and the diary entries of Eichmüller, Eichinger, Siegfried, Raab, Gutmann and Obermeier. Then come approximately chronologically the experiences of Beck, Hagenberger, Dietz, Durst, Eichmüller, Kramer and Zinker. Calendar and Diary Entries 30th of June 1944 Obermeier, Rail Transport from Zlochow, Waited at Lublin 1st of July 1944 Obermeier, Crossed the book at Schirmaker 40 kilometers from Grabarka, then via Yasinovka and Nerevka. 2nd of July 1944. Obermeyer. At 0900, train passed through Slonim. Towards midday, we arrived at Baranovica and were unloaded at 1800 hours. Then we drove to the assembly point. 3rd of July 1944. Eichinger. Unloaded at Baranovica and drove 12 kilometers to battalion assembly point. Obermeyer, 0100 hours left with 1st Company, went to a position on a height. Siegfried, our SPW, driver Martin Braun, threw a track. I got out to help him. We came across some wounded to whom I gave first aid. Then we were attacked directly by a bomber. A signal rocket followed the bombs. We took cover in a field, pressed to the earth. Once the attack finished, we had no casualties and could continue work on the track. When we arrived at Singerska, it was past midnight. 4th of July, 1944. Eichinger. In a wood near Litva, we came under attack by US-built aircraft. First company was deployed against an enemy attack from the southeast. Eichmüller, Dietz. Counter-attack against Kleck. Obermeyer. New formation. Attack on Kleck against Hungarians who had changed sides. Siegfried. At 0800 hours, we advanced with orders to free the Hungarian prisoners at Kleck. On the way, Walter's SPW got stuck in a ditch and could not get free. The house nearby began to burn. Since the heat could set off the ammunition and explosive charges, we jettisoned them. Later, two SPWs towed us out, and then we took part in the fierce house-to-house -house fighting for Kleck. It made a dreadful picture, everywhere dead or wounded Hungarians. The resistance in Kleck itself was soon broken. After that, we languished in the blazing sun on watch. In the evening, we pulled out. The Hungarians we had freed went with us. When we got back to Singerskar, everything was being blown up. 5th of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Attack on Jatviez. Obermeyer. In the early morning, we were near Baranovica again. Eichinger. 
From Muscovice, we experienced an air raid on Baranovice and the approach road. The main battle line is being pulled back 20 kilometers. German troops have been surrounded at Minsk. Six men were wounded by the bombing. Siegfried, we came to a village where it was quiet all day. In the afternoon, we entered a neighboring village where all cattle were slaughtered in expectation of our being encircled. When we returned to our village, it had just been ravaged by aircraft and half of it was in flames. We stood security again at night. 6th of July, 1944. Eichmüller attacked Wiedzma and advanced south of Zalabicha. Eichinger, we are at Chepulov. Obermeyer, O200 hours as radio post for third company. Heavy artillery and pack fire. Siegfried, in the early morning we roasted some poultry. At 1300 hours, orders came to take provisions to third company east of us. On the way, we were met by its tigers heading towards us, and even the infantry were pulling back. There was talk that we were encircled. Back at our village, Ivan was bombarding it with Stalin organs, so that everything seemed to be on fire. We left the place as quickly as we could and sheltered in a nearby wood until nightfall. At about 2200 hours, when the retreat continued, we were the tail SPW, and so when we shed both tracks, our disquiet can be imagined. We set to work until suddenly hearing shouting in the darkness, which seemed to be in Russian. A sergeant and I went cautiously nearer, machine pistols and hand grenades at the ready. As some figures passed by, we scarcely dared breathe. We were that close to them, but they failed to notice us. Finally, the driver, Wolfer, came to report that the tracks had been refitted, and soon we roared off in pursuit of the other SPWs. 7th of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Security duty on the main battle line. We counterattacked southeast of Baranovitsa to clean up. Obermeyer. Back to Baranovitsa. Broken down in A platoon, Braun and Lindenbauer. Siegfried. After driving all night, we received the radioed order, SPW platoon proceed spearhead direction sun. As we set off eastwards, some Russians ahead took to their heels. Suddenly the fuel canister on Braun's SPW was on fire, and we saw Martin hang it over the side and then toss it away. He got back aboard, and a second later received a direct hit from an enemy tank which had suddenly appeared. Bobby and I jumped out and ran to Braun's SPW to find a horrific scene of carnage. On the driving seat, only half of Lindenbauer was recognizable, and Braun lay stretched out in the vehicle, also dead. Only Stelzig was still alive, but with a serious leg wound. I took him on my shoulder and carried him through the enemy fire to the nearest SPW. Upon returning to my own vehicle, I found Dutzler and Bindel also seriously wounded. As we drove back, we bogged down in a swamp. To add to our woes, a T-34 appeared on our flank. We feared the worst, until driver Steidel came up and towed us free at the last moment. Braun's SPW was beyond repair, and in the evening a tiger shot it in flames. On the withdrawal which followed, we passed through the burning Baron of Witzer. The Russians were closing in. 8th of July, 1944. Eichmüller, engaged in fighting at Piotrovice and Polonka. Eichinger. After a drive of 75 kilometers, we reached Volkovisk. We were hit by a pack and had six dead and several wounded. We lost two Tigers and an SPW. Obermeyer. Assembly area near Baranovitsa. V Company gave cover against partisans in the woods. A platoon had more losses. Arrival at Slonim. Siegfried. We were at Hinsevitsa when everyone received the order at 0800 hours. Panzer Battalion 507 would advance today to break out of the encirclement. We were to go with V Company to the roll barn. As soon as we started, we were attacked by Yabos, fighter bombers. I got a splinter in the back. 
Suddenly a lorry was hit and its cargo of ammunition went up. One of the Panzer IVs ahead was hit and burned. Unteroffizier Zauer, too, moving up with his SPW, received a hit from a 9.2 centimeter pack of U.S. manufacture. When I went forward with Bobby to help, we brought out Schildorfer of the reconnaissance company, but all the rest were dead. A terrible sight. Bobby jumped into the SPW, started it up, reversed a bit under my directions, but the track was torn on one side, so that the wagon side-slipped and stopped. Feldwebel Ruhr towed us off to the repair yard, where we buried our dead. After that, I went to the main dressing station. 9th of July, 1944 Eichmüller Defensive actions to the east and in the northern part of Slonim. Obermeyer. At Slonim we buried Unteroffizier Zauer and Gefreiters Zauer, Netraval and Busch. 10th of July, 1944. Obermeyer. Went to repair yard at Jelenica. A tiger crushed the VW Kubelwagen of Unteroffizier Knocker while reversing. Siegfried. All our SPWs are with the repair staff. In the early hours, while cleaning weapons, Hoofinger shot himself in the thigh with his pistol. Towards 1400 hours, we drove back. 11th of July, 1944. Obermeyer. Drove back to Falkefisk on a fine asphalt road. Siegfried. For the next 14 days, we stayed with the workshop company. 12th of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Defensive operations in Zelvianka sector. 13th of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Defensive operations at Miedzezech in the Kelpache sector. Obermeyer. Leutnant Zedl and Goliath wounded. 14th of July, 1944. Obermeyer. Assembly area in woods as radio post. 15th of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Attack at Zanke. Obermeyer. Drove with Major Schmidt to battalion command post. In the evening, moved back westwards. 16th of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Attack. Withdrawal at Kriki. 17th of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Northeast of Krustov. 19th of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Secured the front east of Potosiemi and rearguard action east of Novivola. 20th of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Secured bridge and counterattack at Treshkotki. Obermeyer. Attempt on Führer's life. A general arrived by Wiesler Storch. 21st of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Counterattacking south of Trestotki. Obermeyer. Attacking one kilometer northeast of Odroniki. 22nd of July 1944. Eichmüller. Counterattacking south of Trestotki. Obermeyer. O 0300 hours back over the Neff. 23rd of July 1944. Eichmüller. Secured Lochnika sector. Rab. Counterattacked south of Odroniki. 24th of July 1944. Eichmüller. Counterattacked in Lochnika sector. 25th of July 1944. Obermeyer. Feldwebel Ruhl took over A Platoon, Staff Company. 26th of July 1944. Raab. Attack on Kostele Sternia. Siegfried. Left the workshops and reached battalion in a wood near Bielsk. In the night, the withdrawal continued. 27th of July, 1944. Raab. Attack on Tubiazine. Eichmüller. Fought during withdrawal at Saki and Zubovo. Siegfried. During the day, it fell quiet. Towards 0930 hours, we went to Colonia as radio relay post. Obermeyer drove southwards towards Bielsk, attacked with Third Company. Eichinger at Vlosti Ulshanaka, we dug in our staff car against splinter damage. 
28th of July, 1944. Eichmüller. Counterattacked at Biala. Raab. Attacked at Krasnavis. Siegfried. Remained at Colonia until evening when relieved by Steidel. 29th of July, 1944. Raab. Attacked eastwards near Bielsk. Eichmüller. Attacked Dubiazin and Bozhinovka. Siegfried. Instruction and weapons cleaning. At 1800 hours we proceeded to Banki as radio post. Then at 2100 hours were ordered to pull out immediately. We received fresh instructions from our command post. 30th of July 1944. Raab. Attacked Augustov. Gutmann. Attacked Reisk and Pulsa. Siegfried. We waited in a wood all day. At 1800 hours we were bringing up rations for the companies. As we came to open country beyond the wood, heavy artillery fire forced us to return. We took with us three wounded, Leutnant Feufer, a Feldwebel and a loader. Then we took over the radio post at Stichy. Shortly after midnight we received the order to pull back. At Malasher we set three houses on fire and butchered the cattle. A civilian who refused to obey our order to leave the village was also shot dead. 31st of July, 1944. Siegfried. At 0400 hours, we reached the battalion command post. In the evening, the withdrawal continued. 1st of August, 1944. Eichinger. Waited north of Zambrov, six kilometers from the roll barn. Gutmann. On height 169, eastwards of Hodezhev. Raab. Counterattacked north of Mien. Siegfried. At 0500 hours we went forward as radio post, but returned at 0700 hours. Over the next few days nothing of importance occurred. 2nd of August 1944. Gutmann. Mopped up breakthrough south of Lisa Stara. Eichmüller. Vilkov. 3rd of August, 1944. Gutmann. Defending line, southeast Stioni. Eichmüller. Height 140.7, west of Lunas. Eichinger. Crossed the Narev and set up a base. In a handbill, General Field Marshal Modal exhorted us to advance against the enemy. 4th of August, 1944. Gutmann. Fighting to secure the line southeast of Stioni. Siegfried. 1300 hours. Bobby received the Iron Cross, second class. 5th of August, 1944. Siegfried. We played football. 6th of August, 1944. Siegfried. At 10.15 hours, an alert. We drove to brigade. Rab. Attacked height 158.1, east of Lupyanka. Eichmüller. Zanilov, on height 140.7. 7th of August, 1944. Raab. Attacked east of Lupyanka. Siegfried. The village ahead of us was under attack all day from Russian Yabos. One machine crashed in flames. The pilot bailed out and was captured. He is a highly decorated sergeant. Bobby brought along a small dog, and in the afternoon we gave him a good bath. 8th of August, 1944. Gutmann. East Hodeshev. Siegfried. We held the Russians until evening, then withdrew farther west, via Sokoli. 9th of August, 1944. Siegfried. In our crew there are misunderstandings. I had to see Feldwebel rule to discuss the matter. 10th of August, 1944. Siegfried. Schmelzer and Bobby are being replaced by Utzig and Hausmann. 11th of August, 1944. Siegfried. We drove to the repair staff via Lomscher, then looked for an inn. 14th of August, 1944. Siegfried. When our vehicle was serviceable again, we went via Ostrov to battalion. 15th of August, 1944. Eichinger. 
Oberschirmeister Motorpool Superintendent Deutschmann left for officer training in the Reich. Muhl is replacing him. Siegfried, I have received the wound badge. Towards midnight, we drove to an assembly area. 16th of August, 1944. Siegfried, at 0400 hours, we moved out for another attack. We had contact with the enemy at 0600 hours. The Russian artillery was very active. Suddenly, Yabos appeared and attacked at once. Now began a very unpleasant concert. At ten hundred hours, we drove to the brigade with Major Schmidt, and then to 5th Regiment, where we received orders to take an artillery spotter ahead of our lines. As we did that, at 15.30 hours, we received fire from a pack. We crossed the field this way and that in the attempt to get out of range, before finally reaching a wood where the Yabos found us. We jumped back into the SPW, but they were remorseless with their bombs, rockets and guns. Under the numerous near misses, the vehicle shook from side to side. Luck was on our side, and we escaped the inferno. Towards 1800 hours, we retired to the wood near Kalaki. 17th of August, 1944. Operational Orders. First and Second Companies, Rollbahn, Zambrov Bialystok. Siegfried. At 0500, mounted new attack, broken off at 0800 hours. We drove back to Kalaki, and in the evening arrived at Saltis as radio post. 18th of August, 1944. Siegfried. At Saltis until evening, when we were stood down and drove to Viotta to direct traffic from 2200 hours until 0400 hours next morning. 19th of August 1944. Siegfried. We followed behind the battalion and rejoined it in a wood where at 1500 hours Major Schmidt took his leave of us. Hauptmann Fritz Schuck has taken over as commanding officer of the battalion. 20th of August, 1944. Siegfried. Nothing special to report. Obermeyer. Schuck is taking over the battalion. 21st of August, 1944. Siegfried. At midnight, an alarm. The enemy has broken through at Zambrov. We had to direct traffic into the readiness area. We came in for so much attention from night bombers that we spent more time lying on the ground than standing. 22nd of August, 1944. Operational Orders. First, Second and Third Companies. Counterattacks and defend northwest of Zambrov. Siegfried. At 0700 hours, Ivan began an artillery barrage with Stalin organ accompaniment. We could not move out with our SPW. Ten tigers bogged down in the swamp and had to be destroyed. We held out until 0900 hours, then were forced to withdraw. The situation is beyond our control. As we pulled out, we were attacked on the roll barn by Yabos. They dropped their bombs directly on the highway. Martin Bauer received a head wound. Our panzers have heavy losses. Lieutenant Lischke fell. By evening we had shaken off the enemy. 23rd of August 1944 Operational orders, first and third companies, defend around Teravone Bor. Siegfried. During the day there was a lull. At 18.30 hours we advanced, carrying infantry as passengers to their positions. At 1900 hours our attack began. By then it was fairly dark. We were in hilly bushland covering the rear and flanks. It was a very nervy time. Nearby, some Russian MGs began to chatter. The situation was damned critical. At 2300 hours, we pulled out and arrived at a wood at 0400 hours. We slept nearly all the next day. 24th of August, 1944. Operational orders. First and third companies defend northwest of Sniadov. Obermeyer. The commander of 3rd Company has been promoted to Hauptmann. 25th of August, 1944. Operational Orders. 
First and third companies defend northwest of Sniadov. Eichinger, Jednorodza, fuel transports, two killed by aircraft. Siegfried, we indicated the route for the companies by putting up shields. Driving back, a panzer handed us the body of Lieutenant Lautmann, who had been killed in the air raid. We took his body into the woods and buried him there. At night we guided the supply company into a wood east of Debov and returned to the command post at 0500 hours. Otherwise, nothing to report. 27th of August, 1944. Operational Orders. Third Company, counter-attack from Krostov to the south. Second Company, southeast of Debov. Siegfried. We accompanied Third Company as radio post. 28th of August, 1944. Siegfried. Ivan launched an attack. This was crushed by our Tigers. 29th of August, 1944. Operational Orders. First Company, Piski. Siegfried. The enemy resumed blasting us at 0500 hours, boxing us in with artillery and yabos, with the aim of recapturing Grostov Ladimansk. In the evening, we returned to the readiness position. 30th of August, 1944. Siegfried. We have been mentioned in the Wehrmacht Bulletin. Heavy Panzer Battalion 507, led by Knight's Crossholder Major Schmidt, distinguished itself especially by outstanding steadfastness and cleverly executed counterattacks. At 1600 hours, we drove to the Narev to reconnoitre a fording point for the Tigers. We took the opportunity to have a refreshing bathe. 31st of August 1944 Obermeyer. The Corps Command Post has transferred to the other side of the Narev. Siegfried. We drove to Ladisin as radio post. 1st of September, 1944. Siegfried. 5th anniversary of the outbreak of the war. Nothing else to report. 2nd of September, 1944. Siegfried. We went to the battalion command post in a wood south of Gavorka. 3rd of September 1944. Operational orders. 1st Company, Trojin. 2nd Company, Fighting Northeast Dabek. Siegfried. I was awoken by an air raid. Today Ivan attempted unsuccessfully to capture Schaffenwieser. 4th of September 1944. Siegfried. Air attacks all day without pause. Towards evening, some pack rounds went so wide they wrecked the field telephone hanging at the back of the SPW. 6th of September 1944. Operational orders. First and second companies secure southwest Napiorki. Siegfried. The morning passed quietly. At 1600 hours, we delivered rations forward and then I directed traffic until next morning. 7th of September, 1944. Siegfried. At 0830 hours, Russian artillery bombarded our wood. I sought cover in Oberleutnant Wiersching's Tiger. We left the wood at 1400 hours. At 1700 hours, Hauptmann Schuck was summoned by a colonel, name unknown, to receive from his hand the award of the Knight's Cross. 8th of September, 1944. Siegfried. We lay under Russian artillery fire all day. 9th of September, 1944. Siegfried. I think I have caught something dreadful. Spent all day in bed in the tent. I felt so bad that I didn't get up even for artillery near Mrs. A towing tractor brought me back to base. Then I rested in an ambulance. 11th of September, 1944. Siegfried. Apparently it is dysentery, and at 1300 hours I was taken to the main dressing station at Mackheim. I lay there in a ruined house until about 2100 hours before being brought to the military hospital at Prashnitz, and admitted there until the 25th of September. 12th of September, 1944. Eichinger. 
The battalion is moving towards Sikenau. Oberleutnant Peter Hiesch is now commander of the staff company. Oberleutnant Schaup is in charge of the rear echelon. Oberfeldwebel Wolfram becomes the Spies, and Unteroffizier Klump, near me the 1A clerk of staff company. 13th of September, 1944. Obermeyer. At night we moved off to the woods at Rebkov. Heinz Zinker, Gunner, final rank, Unteroffizier. The undulating road to Polonka. I had been discharged from the military hospital at Paderborn after recovering from my wound and now hoped to return to my old unit. I went with a Panzer Reserve Battalion 500 transport. Getting back to the mob was not so easy at that time. The Reserve Battalions were fairly high-handed about who went where, and one could even end up in a different branch of service. Pothorza was where Battalion 507 had rested for a while after its first deployment in the Tarnopol Brody area. Therefore, I was very fortunate to get to Pothorza for a mustering out. We paraded, and Oberleutnant Neumeyer, in company with Spies Baumler, drove down the ranks in the Kubelwagen. I was the only man whom Baumler recognized, and he had Neumeyer stop and ask if I could shoot so I was employed by him as a gunner. At this time the Belarusian front had advanced, broken through our lines at Vitebsk, and was now advancing smartly via Minsk. Since the Germans were retreating at the same rate, not least because some of our brothers-in-arms were proving not to have the expected steadfastness, it was therefore understandable that Panzer Battalion 507 should be ordered to the centre of Army Group Centre as the Fire Brigade. The wonderful days at Podhorza were over. At the end of June the battalion was sent northwards by train and set down at Baranovica. It went into action, so to speak, straight from the unloading ramp. I do not remember the exact route, but we were on the move the whole night and got to the assembly area at Baranovica towards daybreak. After the necessary technical preparations, we set out the same morning for the town of Polonka, forty kilometers away, where an enemy base had been identified. The squadron set off through a sparse pine forest in which a kind of roll barn had developed. The terrain fell slightly downhill the dry sandy ground causing a long banner of dust to fan out behind our file of tigers. The wood ended after a few kilometres, and the countryside ahead of us was barren of trees. The road rose and fell, providing a wave-like impression, and so we called it Waves of the Danube. Our route passed from one crest of the undulating road to another, until finally we arrived at the last hilltop before Polonka. Here we had a significant overview of the region. What was going on in Polonka itself could not be seen, for it stood hidden behind houses, trees and bushes. It was about 2,000 metres from our squadron of tigers to the edge of town. After leaving the pine wood, we had formed into a broad wedge in order to guard against surprises. Now we were in line with the reverse slope, looking down from the crest. There seemed to be no shortage of soldiers in town, of various branches of service, predominantly horse-drawn. After making the corresponding preparations, we opened fire. The Soviets had apparently felt themselves fairly safe, for when our first salvos arrived, there was total chaos, people running around wildly, vehicles being driven in all directions at once. The surprise effect did not last long, and very soon we received an accurate reply from heavy-caliber guns. This caused us our first unserviceable tigers, mainly with damaged tracks. The shells which came towards us from good cover were well spread apart, leading us to conclude that we were under tank fire. Their camouflage was first class, and they could hardly be made out. First we had to use intact tigers to tow back damaged tigers from the crest to the dead ground, and after four hours of all this, our unserviceable tigers were so numerous that a general retreat was ordered. 
Six serviceable tigers were withdrawn from the crest to cover the withdrawal. After a while, an enemy tank unit sorted out to exchange fire. They wore us down gradually until only two third company tigers were left to cover the withdrawal over the undulating road. Since this towing business was not possible at top speed, the Russians were soon hot on our heels. The two tigers forming the rear guard had their guns pointing to six o'clock and held the enemy tanks at bay from each crest to give the squadron cover for as long as possible. At the last crest before the entrance to the pine wood, we watched as twenty-five to thirty enemy tanks formed up into a broad wedge between one thousand and one thousand five hundred meters away as if on exercise. Besides the known types, we were very interested in some very large examples, with a flat, semicircular turret and huge gun. I aimed at these unknown types to disturb their advance, in vain. Previously, with our 8.8-centimeter gun at this range, we had never had difficulty in doing serious damage, but this time the hits ricocheted off. Finally, the other rearguard tiger reported a breakdown while I was now out of ammunition. As we went into the sparse woodland with our turret at six o'clock, I could still see the enemy tank vanguard heading for us. We moved close alongside our companion tiger to ship aboard their last shells. Neumeyer suddenly made an emphatic demand for smoke. Fortunately, in this regard, I had obtained a good supply, and soon we were enveloped in clouds of orange-red. Just at the right time, too, for now several Stukas appeared overhead, probably a Staffel, and were soon howling and hurtling down towards the enemy spearhead with apparent success, for soon we saw their bombs exploding. The Stukas had saved us. Our joy was indescribable. As we heard later, they were led by Ulrich Rudel. Siegfried Beck, a prisoner in the Warsaw Uprising On operations after the unloading at Baranowitza, our Tiger 311, of which I was the driver, dropped out with damaged gears. At the same time, I reported sick, was diagnosed with lead poisoning, and transferred to the military hospital at Warsaw. I had more or less recovered and had my written orders in my pocket to return to my unit when, on the 1st of August 1944, at 16.30 hours, the Warsaw Uprising began. It was chaotic because the Poles were wearing German uniforms. I got through to the Vistula Bridge and came across a platoon of SS, Regiment Germania, equipped with Tigers. They were short of a driver, and so, to the general amusement of all, I was made an SS man by donning the Germania cuff title and took over the role for which I had been trained in their panzer. On the seventh day, at the Marshaltovska crossroads near the main railway station, the panzer received a direct hit. I was the only crew member to get out, but was then hit by infantry fire and collapsed. I regained consciousness to find myself surrounded by insurgents. A lady who was about to slip my throat was prevented from doing so by the others. There then followed two dreadful months of beatings while living in constant fear that I would be killed in a German raid or by the Poles. The insurgents had my Hitler Youth Leader's identity card and would always greet me with, Now, Hitler Youth, later Gestapo, before handing out the next beating. Only later did it become clear that their boundless hatred for me was the result of the indefensible circumstances in force in the Warsaw Ghetto since 1940, and from the incredibly brutal procedures of the SS, Special Unit Derlewanger, in putting down the uprising. On the other hand, a Polish officer calling himself General Baron Oworski, had me tell him something about tiger tanks. Two days before the insurgents capitulated, I was freed by German commandos and spent the remainder of the war in a military hospital at Bad Tulz. Richard Durst Memories of Feldwebel Ebel In the weeks after the rail transport and the unloading at Baranowitza, 
we were always moving back westwards, accompanied continually by the deadly music of the Stalin organ. On one of these first operational days, at the heart of Army Group Centre, a pig's carcass had been hung up for butchering in the Third Company field kitchen. A salvo from the Stalin organ exploded in our midst, destroying the carcass. I was lightly wounded. Our repairs group leader, Feldwebel Ebel, was so seriously wounded that he died on the way to the main field hospital at Baranovica. Hermann Henner and I had to bury him there and then in the presence of an army pastor who spoke a few words. In the staff car number WH1568386, in which Ebel was being transported, there was also a badly burned Oberfeldwebel. He wore the Knight's Cross and was a member of a tank cracker unit. I have often wondered if he survived. Gert Eichmüller Operations in the Central Sector of the Eastern Front After the unloading, I was a platoon commander in First Company from Zlochov to Baranovica. The entries in my Zoldbuch relating to days engaged in operations run from the 4th of July to the 6th of September, 1944, and geographically from Klek to Napioli. In the following account, I remember situations which I cannot arrange in strict chronological order, and so I mention first a day which was much the same as the others, except for the greeting by the division CO. First company had quarters in a village. Except for the sentries, the crews slept. In the earliest hour, they were awoken abruptly by the thunder of an artillery barrage. Ivan was therefore about to launch an attack on the position in front of us. I had a slightly uncomfortable feeling in the stomach region, and heard at the same time, Company commanders to commanding officer, and soon after that, platoon leaders to company commander. There my colleagues and I were each given the extract of a map, in itself a rare occurrence, on which the routes to our operational areas were marked. After brief instructions to our panzer commanders, we set off with the task of supporting our infantry in the field in their defence of the expected onslaught. I therefore remember this particular day because I had orders to report my platoon to the main command post of an infantry division. There an ecstatic welcome awaited us, in which the division CO, a friendly, well-loved general, almost embraced the platoon's four 8.8-centimetre guns in his joyful relief, since they would greatly strengthen the firepower of his men. He dismissed us to proceed to the forward lines, but not until his paymaster, probably a staff quartermaster or similar, had fetched a bottle of schnapps for each panzer crew, which we received with thanks, and stowed carefully against breakage for use after the mission concluded. We tiger men were very impressed by the welcome we got from the infantry, their waving and rejoicing as they emerged from their trenches, making us aware once more of the high regard in which we were held as a privileged clique. Things which occurred frequently in the retreats were bogging down in swampy land and having a track ride up over the drive wheel or come off against the undercarriage. This was generally cured by taking off the track and inserting new segments. I remember one case in particular in which all efforts proved in vain. Our tiger had shed its tracks and bogged down in a swamp on the wheels. The Russian infantry, which we had raked with MG fire beforehand, were now closing in, and after quickly dismantling the radio equipment, the five of us homeless panzer men sought refuge in another tiger of my platoon, which now had ten men inside it instead of five. By radio I ordered no shooting until I gave the order. The first of their infantry had crept up warily to the abandoned tiger, went round it, then climbed up the hull, some of them disappearing inside. Now I gave the order to open fire and destroy the panzer. Whether any of the Russians survived, I never found out. It did nothing to assuage my contrition at losing my panzer. 
In a letter to my parents of the 27th of August 1944, according to my Zoldbuch, on the 25th of the month I was northwest of Sniadov, I wrote these lines. My guardian angel has spread his wings once more above me. The day before yesterday I was forced to abandon again after a battle with enemy tanks. All the crew got out except the driver, who had an awful end. Although this happened very close to the Russian lines, we got back to our unit more or less unscathed. Early yesterday I drove back to the baggage train to fetch the most essential items of clothing, because naturally I lost everything again. Yesterday afternoon I drove with my old company commander, Oberleutnant Neumeyer, into a small German frontier town. Schaffenwiese? We watched a German film, had a glass of beer, and after all that lay behind us, felt almost at home. It was quite a special experience to see small, clean German houses again, and to hear German being spoken not only by soldiers. This afternoon I am going forward to take over a new panzer already allotted to me. For the moment it is fairly do or die, but we shall come through it, gritting my teeth until it's over. Now I must close. I have to drive to the workshop to look the panzer over. Heartfelt wishes, your Gert. To conclude my spotlight on engagements in Army Group Center's sector, according to my Zoltbuch there were twenty-four, I would like to mention a rather amusing incident. In the fighting during the retreat, as is known, our battalion was subordinated for a while to one cavalry corps, Hartenek. During this time I was engaged one day in building a defensive line forward of a row of hills. Before it the ball terrain fell slightly towards a large, dense forest about two thousand metres distant, occupied by the Russians, and from inside it one could hear clearly the sounds of tracked vehicles. Suddenly a small Kubelwagen drew up, and a lieutenant alighted, announcing himself as the aide-de-camp of a unit attached to the cavalry corps, and passed me the following order from his commanding officer. In the wood in front of you are Russian tanks. Drive your panzers into that wood and destroy them. I replied that I required the order in writing. The lieutenant looked at me nonplussed, and I explained— not so that I will do it, but because, according to my instructions, I have to report the order to channels and through them to the General Inspector of Panzer Troops, General Guderian. The lieutenant gave me a slightly quizzical look, then saluted, got back into his car, and was never seen again. Hubert Hagenberger From Polonka to Slonim we came down the transporter ramp at Baranovica and headed for the radio masts I mentioned. The log road was very narrow in places, so that many drivers slipped off it. We came through safely, which had a very favourable outcome a few days later. It was fairly hot and radio silence was in force. Everybody was keyed up with fearful expectations of what lay before us. We were soon forced to leave the roll barn because it was totally blocked by army vehicles which had been abandoned during the withdrawal. What a discouraging sight! Thousands of vehicles, among them new SP assault guns, crewless. Between them were some burning lorries. Their drivers had simply legged it in panic. Prepare for action, our fatherly panzer commander, Bruno Betka, ordered. I closed my hatch in subdued mood. After a few kilometres driving near the roll barn, we came to an abandoned village. I remember its admirable cobbled pavements along the broad uphill street. We were the leading panzer, and Betka told me to halt for a man in railway uniform coming towards us waving his cap. There was a brief exchange which I did not hear. I had the impression that he came from the railway junction at Slutsk, to where we were bound. Whatever the reason, we continued to a wood on our left hand, from which up to a dozen German infantrymen emerged, led by a general, face covered in dust, an MP-40 at the ready. I wondered if this was our main front line, 
for the general was indicating that a wood a few kilometres farther on was where the Russians were. On the road leading to this wood was a depression where some houses with straw roofs formed a small village. The convoy of panzers came to a halt, and in the headphones we heard Neumeyer's voice say, To everybody, wedge formation. We veered to the right, and at once our tiger sank down to the undercarriage in a watery meadow. I could not reverse us free, but some logs from the road laid behind the tracks enabled the panzer to reverse out and reach terra firma. Next we followed a road to arrive at the roll barn which went from Bobruisk via Slusk westwards. Three years before, we Germans had marked it out in the opposite direction. The village ahead was said to be held by the Russians, and from intercepted radio traffic, we assumed that enemy tanks were massing in the woods. As it happened, we needed to take no further action, and became spectators, as a Staffel of Stukas arrived. Quick, put the flag out, Betka shouted. In a flash, the Reich war flag was fixed across the stern of the panzer, and our front line was indicated to the Stukas by flares. Shortly after, with sirens howling, they tipped over and fell towards the village and woods. We saw the flashes and fire as the bombs exploded, and also a column of fire marking the probable crash site of a Ju-87. This Stuka unit was almost certainly led by the tank cracker Oberst Rudel. The rapid-fire cannons built into the gull wings were distinctly recognisable, and we watched their effect. One after another, black columns of smoke rising above the wood confirmed that on this occasion our work had been done for us. The show was not yet over, for now came the cavalry. That's a Hungarian unit, Betka shouted as he watched them gallop past, enveloped in dust, leaning forward on their steeds, as once Attila's warriors had done. The hordes of Genghis Khan must have looked like this, but these Hungarians were fleeing in panic, only horses and riders without wagons or guns, wrapped in a gigantic cloud of dust which still had not settled long after the spectacle had passed. We got back on the roll barn and ran down to the village in the trough between two hills. Some of the surviving houses in which we suspected a Russian presence were burning but there was no sign of life except from a hut where somebody waved and raised himself gingerly from the ground. "'They're Hungarians!' Betka shouted and gave orders to approach. A Hungarian officer reported the situation to him. We had misjudged the situation and done wrong by our allies. The Russians were behind the woods from where the columns of smoke still rose into the blue skies from their burning vehicles.' As we dismounted from the tiger, Franz Pass spotted a pig on the loose and gave chase. After catching the animal, he tied it up with telephone cable from the reel in the undercarriage and secured it to the ribs of the radiator grill, where it continued to squeal. This soon got on our nerves, but was tolerable for the thought of roast pork and sausages to come. When food was to be found, Franz was unsurpassed. He was the organiser to whom everybody was indebted for the reserves in their backpacks, from flour to cognac. As I approached one of the still intact houses, I heard a whimpering and groaning coming from below. The entrance to an earth bunker, covered by a square wooden lid, led down three metres. Ida Shuda! I shouted down, at which an elderly and gaunt woman wearing a headscarf appeared and began climbing the wooden ladder. She probably had a shock at seeing the death's head badges on the collar patches of my field tunic, then fell at my feet and kissed my filthy shoes. I thought this was weird, but didn't laugh. She pointed to what once had been a house and was now a heap of rubble. Malinky, she said, and spread the fingers of her raised hand towards it. There had probably been five children in the house, and now all were gone the contents of the house, and all happiness. I had no time to reflect, nor time for sympathy. Vutiest, she stammered, and looking around me I noticed on the road a smoking Hungarian field kitchen. 
Voda, I agreed, and we went to it. She put a green bottle to her lips, but spat it out immediately. It was probably vinegar or soup seasoning. When I lifted the lid of the cauldron, I found the ingredients for the midday meal. Beans and water. I handed her a full ladle of it. Once she had finished it, she fell at my feet again, cried, Jesus Maria, then returned to her earth bunker, apparently strengthened. As a twenty-year-old, I felt strangely moved by this episode. In a meadow near the village street was a Kubelwagen flying a pennant from which I concluded that it had once served a senior officer as his wheels. Perhaps it had belonged to the infantry general we had met recently. The noise of battle had died away completely. We all returned to the Panzer to take up a security position, but the Russians did not come again that day, which pleased us. At dusk, however, there appeared a shadowy form going putt-putt above us. The Duty NCO Hubert Hagenberger Stabsfeldwebel Betger's Last Day Reports came flooding in by the dozen. Air reconnaissance showed that 320 enemy tanks were moving out from Polonka. Our Tigers had to stop them. Since leaving the railway ramp at Baranovica on the 2nd of July, we had seen our army in flight and disintegration. All must have been assailed by panic, the fire stoked by the Yabo and partisan attacks. The weather was hot. I sat next to the hot gearbox where I could find some relief by squatting on the backrest, a foot on the gas pedal, my head through the hatch for fresh air. In this way I would drive through waving fields of corn. Our panzers also suffered from the heat. Some failed to reach the area of operations due to engines overheating. Now we were pushing forward in a fan formation towards a rounded hilltop, behind which we assumed the enemy was lurking. Personally, I was not greatly keen to follow the course of battle through my viewing slit. I thought of Ludwig Gassander, who had had his nose torn off when a round from an anti-tank rifle hit his viewing slit. If we were in the thick of it, I would push myself back as far as possible while still having my foot on the gas pedal and able to accelerate the traverse of the turret when needed. Now it rotated. Hits thundered against the armour, making the interior paintwork flake. Betger maintained an iron calm, exuding confidence and security. Round after round we fired, the ventilator sucking out the powder smoke from the ejected casings. The clouds of dust which I could see over there suggested the presence of many enemy tanks, amongst them the heavy Joseph Stalins and T-34s. Entwined in the walls, a symphony of fear in the night's dark fall. So the whispers in the shadows, a warning to beware. Dancing with danger in the cool night air. Heartbeat escalating as the danger grows. In the shadows, it lingers where fear truly shows. which were not to be messed with. Their 12.2 cm and long 7.62 cm guns, respectively, made them both the equal of the Tiger. So that was the fifth, Betger said, his last words in life. Then we were hit as if by lightning, a metallic splitting noise followed by the deafening explosions. Daylight streamed into the interior. Betger had collapsed and fallen back into the turret. I resumed my position and tried to restart the engine, which I had turned off, but it would not respond. Probably a problem with the carburetor, I thought. Everybody was desperate to bail out. In a panic, I scrambled free and ran several hundred meters while shells howled and hissed around me, until at last I reached the edge of the cornfield and threw myself down. Pass called to me, 
Bertel, what's happening? I replied by gesticulating that he should get clear. It then occurred to me that perhaps I should have turned on the electric fuel pump above the armature panel in order to restart the engine. Our tiger stood on a slope of the rounded hill, solitary and abandoned except for Stabsfeld Webel Becker, alive or dead inside it. Quickly I took the decision to return to the Panzer and at least make one last attempt to save the vehicle and ascertain the condition of its commander. As if I had received the order from Betger myself, I ran to Schreiber's damaged panzer. At my request he drove me as far forward as he could, while still hugging the reverse of the slope for cover. Then I sprinted the last stretch to 313. Gasping for breath, I reached the stern and took a brief rest between the two exhaust covers. Our panzer unit had been forced to yield to the enemy's numerical superiority and pulled back. The noise of battle had abated somewhat, but access to the driver's hatch was very tricky. I ran, bent double alongside the wheels, then had to jump up on the track cover and dive through the hatch. I caught my overalls on the hatch lever and hung like that, upper body forward. As a result of my effort to reach the button for the injection pump, I managed to tear free of the restraint and, thank heavens, I was in. To start up and select fourth gear was now easy. The panzer ran back down. I waited for the right moment, then brought the head round to face west, selected up to eighth gear, and roared off. I drove through waving fields into the sun. On the horizon were some poplars and a village. Near the first grey house was something squarish and grey, which I could not make out. Driving with my head out, I was without radio contact to the unit. From the village came a sudden lightning flash, and 313 was hit. To my right lay a depression with a patch of beech trees. I careered through them, stopped the panzer, and climbed into the radio operator's seat. I switched the equipment to send, and stuttered in my excitement. Vehicle 313 here. I am in front of a village which is firing at me. Where should I go? At once came Neumeyer's calm voice. Yes, you've gone over to Ivan. We can see you from here. Turn ninety and a half right, and then drive straight ahead until you reach us. What's up with Betger and the rest of the crew? Feverishly, I supplied a brief answer and slipped back into the driving seat. Having made the turn ordered, I drove like crazy. I heard the Russians firing at me from the rear, but kept my head outside, knowing that the gun turret would protect me. At last I caught sight of our unit, then the command Tiger 300, and pulled up alongside it. Neumeyer was startled when I tapped him on the shoulder. "'So you're here, Hagenberger,' he said, and pointed towards the west." That cloud of dust you see is Feldweber Schreiber. He's going to the workshops at Bialystok. Follow him. Jawohl. I had driven some distance through more cornfields when, passing by a beechwood, I noticed a group waving to me to come in. Schreiber and my crew were already there. As Franzel gave me a coffee, I told him, Look after Betger. He's still in the panzer. He was still alive when they lifted him out. He had lost his hands, his head was spattered with blood, yet he raised the stump of an arm as if in a last salute. Could we have done more for him, this big, brave Berliner? Could he have been saved? These questions plague me even today. If he had lived, however, it would have been as a blind man with no hands. He died in the ambulance on the way to Slonim. I still mourn him today, Father Bruno Betger for whom we were his boys. Hubert Hagenberger, On the Road with Neumeyer Schreiber was taking his tiger to Slonim. It had received a hit on the cylindrical gun mantlet, which meant that the weapon might require adjustment. We tailed along behind Schreiber, since we had no commander. Everybody was in retreat. Why not us? In the afternoon I was too excited to drive any more, partly as a result of partaking too much Serbian white wine a little earlier. 
Despite the noise, I fell asleep under an oak near the roll barn, and it was almost dark when we arrived at Slonim. On its streets, an indescribable chaos reigned. People were fleeing. I saw a sudden flash from the pavement. A civilian had fired a Schreiber but missed. Two of us who had witnessed the incident jumped down from the panzer and seized him. I did not see what happened to him next. Without having realized it at first, we were parked close by the army arsenal. When a drunken Pole came by, clasping a bottle of red wine, we inquired of him where he had got it, and he pointed in the direction of a warehouse. Heinz Zinker recalls the following episode at the Slonim Army Provisions Compound. I remember a young Wehrmacht administration official who had not received orders to open up the warehouse, gesticulating in vain with his Walther pistol as a large number of German infantry forced in the gate. We too had a look round, then loaded some cartons and crates on the rear of our tiger. On the continuing retreat, whenever we overtook infantry and horse-drawn units, we shared out a hundred packs of Egypt and camel cigarettes, which were accepted with howls of joy. Hagenberger continues. Schreiber was no longer with us, leaving us practically leaderless, which would otherwise have inhibited us from entering the halls to help ourselves. Cigarettes lay in great mounds on the floor. We quickly became very selective and took only valuable wares, Egyptian cigarettes of the highest class, Coca-Cola drinks, flints, cutthroat razors and sides of bacon. Unfortunately, there was no bread. The steering gear of 313 had failed and condemned us to a standstill. In this hopeless situation, we shared out a hundred packs of cigarettes to infantry hurrying by. On the pavement, people were slurping noisily from a barrel of beer. Somebody must have had a very impressive talk with the paymaster for all and sundry to have the run of the place like this. The Russian artillery were already in range of the town, the odd round causing one or two houses to burn. Traffic was heading only westwards. Suddenly, Placek's panzer appeared in front of us. I told him my problem, and he said at once, I'll give you a tow. Once again, he was my saviour. After his people had raided the warehouse for everything they needed and could carry, we made off. By then the pace was hotting up, and the air more dangerous with whizzing splinters. When we came to a wobbly wooden bridge over the broad Sashara River, a tributary of the Mamel, field gendarmes redirected us to an island in the middle of the river. As we stood there, most of us in the open, without warning, a concrete bridge nearby was demolished by a tremendous explosion. We ducked down near the wheels of our tigers as great clumps of debris flew past overhead. Now we were free to turn about and drive back to the eastern bank. From there we headed to an intact road bridge farther up, by which we crossed to the western bank. Here we were received by an infantry colonel who ordered us, Stay here with your guns facing east. We obeyed this order with reluctance, but after some time were happy to observe a staff car containing high-ranking panzer officers, including our battalion adjutant, Oberleutnant Koltemann, who ordered us to proceed towards Zelva. The last order is the holiest. On the way to Zelva we stopped for a rest in a field, in the afternoon, when retreating German infantry appeared over the hilltops coming towards us, we decided to resume heading westwards, but our misfortunes continued. Turning the panzer in the field resulted in so much earth clogging the running wheels that the track tightened and wouldn't move. It required seven hand grenades to get it off so that we could clear away the earth. Then it had to be refitted, replacing the damaged segments and bolts. It was dusk when we were finally roadworthy once more. Sep took 313 in tow until 0100 hours, when we occupied a cornfield for the night and had a few mouthfuls of white wine before retiring. During the night, an overzealous sentry shot Gefreiter Salfelter in the thigh. 
He had crawled into a haystack and had fallen into such a deep sleep that he failed to respond to the sentry's challenge in the agreed manner by clearing his throat. A towing tractor drove over both of Obergefreiter Dietrich's legs, causing flesh wounds but no broken bones. We arrived at Zelva next evening. We were to have driven up a ramp onto a low loader of the transporter train. The low loader, a six-axled Sims wagon, should have been anchored to the rails at its far end, but this had been overlooked. As the first tiger mounted the ramp, the far end tipped up, depositing the tiger on the rails. This destroyed the ramp. Hagenberger went on to write, We then had to load from the side, but here he is evidently confusing it with another incident, for Helmut Kusner recalled this one very clearly. In a reply to Schneider's question, Kusner wrote on the 22nd of December 1990, You said in your letter something about a report by Hubert Hagenberger to do with loading damaged panzers on the head ramp. This was probably the case in which I was principally involved. Unfortunately, I cannot recall the name of the place, but it must have been the summer of 1944, because at the time I slept in the open VW. The situation was as follows. After a major operation, the workshop platoon had a lot of work on hand with about ten tigers to repair at the same time. There was no let-up in the Russian pressure, so that the CO, at that time still Major Schmidt, ordered the forward workshop platoon to pull back. Therefore I gave the order to get the least damaged panzers operational as soon as possible, while the remainder, about six, should proceed alone or with assistance to the nearest workplace. However, the swift Russian advance forced me to choose a workplace much farther back still, and I sent these damaged panzers ahead together next day. After we had spent three days without the possibility of setting up a workshop, I looked for a railway yard with a head ramp, which would be much farther west, particularly since the damaged panzers and I with my staff car were cut off from supply, especially fuel. I found the railway yard, apparently at Zelva, and at once ordered six Sims wagons. I spent almost two days on the telephone. Meanwhile, our tigers had been joined by a half-dozen panthers, which were also to be loaded. That went off fairly quickly without a hitch. Hagenberger continues. Finally, when the Sims wagons arrived, a squad of pioneers were aiming to blow up the station while a colonel of the general staff wanted to requisition our operational panzers. Thanks be to God I convinced him that none of them was even halfway ready for battle. The loading, therefore, had to proceed as quickly as possible. In our haste, contrary to regulations, we had not fitted the rail clamps to the Sims wagon, so that when the first tiger drove up the head ramp, the loading surface rose, the forward axle slipped out of the pivot pins and rolled away, with the other wagons, while half the wagon and the panzer finished up on the rails. We acted fast. The locomotive pulled the five wagons clear, and once we had the panzer free of the head ramp, we used that in conjunction with railway sleepers for the panzer's fresh ascent, now always using rail clamps for each wagon, of course. The mobile panzers drew the towed panzers up the head ramp, and I don't believe that the side ramp was used on this loading because we had had bad experiences with the practice in the past, the panzer transporter had just left the small station when a powerful explosion announced the successful involvement of the Pioneer's demolition squad. After that, I went to battalion to report to the CO that six damaged Tigers had been got out before the demolition of the station. Everybody heaved a sigh of relief when the transporter, with about thirty vehicles, including six Tigers, set off via Falkafisk for Bialystok. After spending a night sleeping in a pine forest, I was then summoned by the company commander to drive his command Tiger 300. Oberleutnant Neumeyer had promoted his previous driver, Unteroffizier Georg Ziegler, a parade-ground soldier from Gentin, to Panzer Commander. 
Now I was drafted into a new crew, and moreover the command crew, with Funkmeister, senior radio operator, Krug, Unteroffizier Heinz Zinker, gunner, and Fritz Gamsjäger, loader. After some operations in this area, one day Neumeyer informed the company by radio, I am a captain. Neumeyer, whom we considered fairly young to be of Hauptmann rank, had been awarded the German cross in gold at Pothorza. After Polonka, he had handed me the Iron Cross second class, of which I was mighty proud and still am. Heinz Zinker, 30th of July, 1944, Augustov We were in a trough-shaped valley, Augustov being two kilometres away on its southern edge. The elongated village was of predominantly small straw-roofed houses with some barn-type structures. The weather was hot and dry, corresponding to the continental climate. From north of the valley, the advance of the Red Army was proceeding, the method being to infiltrate in individual small groups in absolute silence, moving from bush to bush and blending in with the natural surroundings. It was strange how they always managed to be ahead of us, preventing our laying any ambush. Only now and again would we see a head raised above the steppe grass to disappear the next instant. Our panzers were facing west with their turrets at three o'clock towards the direction of enemy advance. Suddenly we received pack fire from the edge of the village. Our panzer was hit several times by four-centimetre shells, which bored into our armour on the left side but failed to penetrate. Turret, nine o'clock, H.E. round. We silenced the pack but also set a house on fire. The flames spread to the straw roofs of the neighbouring houses. Favoured by the hot, dry, easterly wind, soon a sea of flames engulfed the whole village. We had not intended it, but how else could we have defended ourselves? In the fighting at Augustov on the 30th of July, 1944, radio operator Karl Frischertz from Bruck, Leiter, and also Feldwebel Ostermann fell. These hard defensive battles involved heavy losses, and were probably the bloodiest in the history of 507 Battalion. Hubert Hagenberger, The Naref Bridgehead Adventure the Russians had established a bridgehead over the Naref in the Bialystok area. At first light there was an alert. We had had little sleep for many days. The Russians were breaking through the weak front everywhere, and often we managed to repulse an attack only with the most brutal desperation. Still drunk with sleep, I started the panzer engine while the crew cleared off the camouflage. We set off alongside the woods to the roll barn, then through some small villages, apparently resting in peaceful slumber. Above swathes of mist to the east, the horizon reddened, heralding sunrise. At the end of one such village was a ford across a swampy stream. I thought that the tracks looked very deep. We crossed safely, but once we were in the adjoining meadow with the rising sun in our eyes, Russian tanks attacked from the mist. Our radio aerial was ripped away by a shell or splinter so that our commanding officer lost contact with the company. Therefore, he took his files and changed panzers. A few minutes later, Unteroffizier Giza came to replace him. The Russian tank force was about 80 strong, attacking frontally and from our right flank. Because the driver knew only a limited amount about a battle, mainly what he heard through his headphones, this time I did not know what was going on. From the talk inside the panzer, I was aware that it was getting very lively outside. Giza ordered me to pull back a bit, and then we received a hit which broke the left side track. I jumped down to ascertain the damage and saw the track lying stretched out in the meadow. While I was assessing the possibilities of refitting it, a shell hissed by overhead, luckily missing the panzer, and convincing me that repair work was out of the question. I re-entered the vehicle to report the situation. Giza said the situation was shit. The radio operator and gunner had made frantic attempts to restore radio contact without success. 
To make the repair, one had to crouch motionless in a small box on the hull where certain death awaited if one became a target. The race with death could now begin. This was, incidentally, the first day of battle in which 507 was led by Hauptmann Schuck. Very many enemy tanks were destroyed, but we failed to eliminate the bridgehead for lack of infantry. Because our hinterland was swamp, probably for this reason, Giza gave the order, Prepare Panzer for destruction. Of the two Z-85 demolition charges, one was laid in the V-shaped trough of the engine between the partition walls, and the other in the open breach in the loading tray of the gun. In this way, all panzers which fell into the hands of the enemy would have the same parts destroyed. We all bailed out of the panzer into the next nearest. Kurt Lehmann opened his hatch, and soon I was sitting behind his seat. After a few seconds we heard a dull report, and our abandoned 300 began to burn. We now had to resolve the difficult question of how to get back over the swampy brook. Its banks were overgrown with alders and bushes, and concealed enemy infantry, who would have to be wiped out by the MGs of our tigers. It was congested at the ford. Julius Quaker, an innkeeper's son from Neunkirchen, Lower Austria, informed us that Lieutenant Lischka was dead, and his panzer was sinking into the bog. Unteroffizier Engelhardt had received severe burns from the burst barrel which had killed the commander and loader. We decided to board. The turret was still projecting above the swamp as we made our way gingerly towards it. Lieutenant Rudolf Lischka was in the commander's seat, his head fallen back, face upwards. His blond hair and the skin of his face were burnt. The dead loader lay in the revolving stage, bare from the waist up. Engelhardt, the driver, and the radio operator had bailed out successfully. Driver Quaker said that after the explosion he had wanted to save the panzer, but had missed the ford and been sucked down. Lehman, who had gone quite white at hearing this, now headed for the muddy waters of the ford which lay before us, its bed furrowed by numerous vehicles. On the panzer hull, a crowd of panzer crews armed with MGs and machine pistols kept up a permanent fire into the bushes on the river bank. When the panzer rose from the waters after the brief crossing of the ford, the sigh of relief was audible. Ivan's artillery was shooting from the village. On the way, we picked up panzer commander Unteroffizier Karl Krestau from a cornfield. He was wearing gas mask goggles. Later we were told that we had destroyed 36 of the 80 Russian tanks for the loss of 10 of our own, though mainly these were lost due to indirect enemy action, and we had to retreat. Therefore the Narev bridgehead adventure had to go down as a defeat. We moved out towards Teravone Bor, Redwood, as far as Lonka. That was probably on the 23rd of August, 1944. From a main Franconian newspaper. 507 Battalion Sergeant wins Knight's Cross. During the fighting southwest of Bialystok on August 1944, the platoon leader of a panzer company, Fahnenjunker Oberfeldwebel Rolf Gebhardt, received the order to secure a location with two Tiger tanks. After some time there, he noticed a heavily armed Soviet regiment coming up from the east through a valley basin and decided to attack. He drove first to the western end of the valley with both tigers and destroyed a large part of the enemy force at close range. When a German grenadier battalion then counterattacked from the west, he detached his second tiger to support their operation and proceeded. Ignoring all dangers from nearby woodlands to the eastern end of the gully where he attacked the Soviet regiment from the rear and wiped it out. The Fuhrer has therefore awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross to this highly proven senior sergeant who since April 1944 has destroyed 27 enemy tanks and 35 guns without loss to his own force. Fahnen Junker Oberfeldwebel Gebhardt, who was also a wearer of the German cross in gold, was born in Karlstadt in 1915 and comes from Würzburg. Heinz Zinker, 
Zambroff as I saw it, 22nd of August, 1944. We had taken up a position with several panzers east of Zambroff, at the foot of a gently rising hill whose crest we were unable to survey stood a hamlet of unknown name. It was from there that an enemy tank attack had begun over terrain favourable to the Russians, and in the course of the exchanges we received a hit on the cylindrical mantlet close to the gun. The round had lodged there and was preventing the gun running back after firing. We pulled back, allowing Neumeyer to transfer to another panzer. In rolling back, we received another hit, which tore off a track. Above us, enemy bombers were heading for the hinterland. We had little infantry support. The Russians worked their way forward in groups, almost impossible to observe, since the terrain offered the best protection. At the edge of the village, to our left, the first enemy groups dug in and took us under fire. Despite the shooting, I crawled out to the track and hung it on. Radio operator Kurt Kramer, who had just watched my action through his viewing slit, said afterwards, I was sure you were a goner there. Finally, another panzer arrived to tow us out. The hawser was attached, but the attempt failed. A countershaft of the towing vehicle broke, typical weak point, and we had no option but to blow up both tigers. If I remember correctly, there was a swampy area in the downhill surface not overlooked by the enemy. When we went back, we passed the tiger of the dead Lieutenant Lischka, which had suffered a barrel burst. Heinrich Dietz, Memories of Tiger 331 In the operational area, Tarnopol Brody, my crew consisted of Kurt Lehmann, driver, Kurt Kramer, radio operator, Helmut Schneider, gunner, and Heinz Ziedl, loader. In the Army Group Center sector, Schneider, who left Porhutzer for Officer Cadet School, was replaced by Unteroffizier Dickhoff, and shortly before I went to Officer Cadet School myself, at the end of August, Kramer became the leader radio operator in Neumeyer's Panzer. Kurt Kramer, in praise of an old bones. In putting together Panzer Battalion 507, first and second companies recruited the majority of their people from veteran panzer crews, while for the most part, third company preferred to rely on reinforcements born after 1924 for its leader positions and commanders. Who would be surprised, therefore, if these 19-year-old boys considered that a panzer commander ten years older than them was due for his pension? In Tiger 313, with Oberfeldwebel Heinrich Dietz, leader of 3rd Panzer, 3rd Company, as our commander, as far as we were concerned, he was one of the old men, in our eyes an old fossil, a little senile, always trying to divert our youthful high spirits along the path of good military discipline. After the first battles in the Tarnopol Brody area, however, it became clear to us that in our commander we had actually won the lottery. His battle experience, his circumspection, his calmness exuding confidence, and his conviction in critical situations gave us all a feeling of security for which otherwise in those days there was really no justification. 331 seemed vulnerable to every mine which Ivan dug in our path but this did not shake us. In the company, Dietz was known as Mines Heine, and soon became mentioned often. Of the first 25 victories over enemy tanks achieved by 3rd Company, 331 claimed 13 of them, surely a sign that here one of the smallest battle units functioned like clockwork. Tarnopol, a sunny day, but a thin layer of snow covered the ground. We stood in a security position five hundred metres from a village where nothing stirred. A lazy day lay ahead. Half left was a wrecked T-34, its cannon turned aside. A Russian came out of a house, leant against the wall in the sun, and began picking off his lice. The turret MG shot him dead. Shortly after, a second man came through the door without seeing the body of his dead comrade, and he suffered the same fate. 
While we were discussing the stupidity of these two, the commander ordered, Turret, half past ten, AP shell on the T-34. Ready, fire. Direct hit. While we had been picking off harmless individuals, our commander had noticed that the gun of the apparently wrecked T-34 was bearing round towards us. Coming out of its coma, the T-34 was a dangerous animal and the alertness of the commander had saved us. A couple of days later, we were again on security duty elsewhere. At our back was a large village. Suddenly a round hissed past from the rear, apparently from a Russian pack. We looked towards the village, but nothing was to be seen. A second round was fired, no muzzle flash, and missed again. As we heard the explosion, Dietz turned about and saw where the shell hit. Now he had the line of fire back from that point and above our panzer, which led to a barn with a door panel missing. Schneider's HE shell tore the door to shreds and exposed behind it our pack. At dusk the tigers of our company were driving two abreast through a long village. Company commander Fritz Neumeyer occupied the position twenty metres ahead to our right. Close to our left stood the last house. Apart from distant MG fire, there were no sounds of resistance to be heard, nor anything we could see which might have given Dietz reason to traverse the turret to nine o'clock. Neumeyer, looking ahead, had already passed the last house, and as we drew beyond it, we saw an enemy tank aiming at Neumeyer's panzer. Our fast, close-range round blew up the enemy tank, after the operation, Neumeyer came over with a great pack of cigarettes and pressed them into our hands without speaking. Just by chance, in turning on a spot, our tiger had unearthed a giant bone from the earth of Galicia. Lacking training in paleontology, we were unable to determine whether it came from a dinosaur or a local camel. Either way, we preserved it carefully in order to present it to Dietz on his thirtieth birthday, Podhotza, the 22nd of June, 1944, and then celebrated in the tower. An old bone for an old bones. A few days later, we loaded up for the Army Group Center sector, and straight from the ramp at Baranovitsa, set off for our new operational area. The line of tigers threw up massive clouds of dust, which not only stung the eyes and burned the throat, but also lay millimetres thick on equipment and weapons, not good for sensitive MGs. Third platoon veered away from the direction of advance to protect the flanks northwards. In a large field of maize two metres tall, the gunner had little chance, and the driver or radio operator even less, of seeing anything. The commander could see 360 degrees, but only above the tops of the maize plants. Whole regiments could hide themselves in these fields. From higher up in the cupola, Dietz saw two Russian assault guns which we destroyed. At the edge of a field of maize, where it grew more thinly, the outline of a pack became visible, later found to be a US-supplied 9.2 centimetre gun. It had been tracking the engine noise of our neighbour, but then traversed its aim to us. "'Gun and MG fire at will!' Dietz shouted. Nothing happened. Stoppage on all weapons, probably clogged up. The worst that could happen in this situation. "'Ram, layman!' Dietz ordered, and standing in the turret began shooting with his pistol at the pack gunners. The tiger bounded forward, after which Dietz attempted to engage the pack with hand grenades. About fifteen metres short of the collision, the Russian anti-tank gun fired again, but to no avail. The tiger kept rolling, and seconds later Lehman rammed the pack barrel, which contorted and crushed the splayed outriggers. The pack crew fled into the maze. How they had managed to miss us twice at such short range remains a mystery. Yet such wonders rarely happen by themselves. The commander's understanding of the situation and speed of reaction were definitely major factors in unnerving the enemy pack crew. In the course of the defensive fighting northwest of Snyadov, Army Group Center sector, 
3rd Platoon was detached to support an infantry unit under heavy pressure. Since they had no ammunition, we gave them some of our MG belts. While doing this, there came the shout, "'Enemy tanks from the right!' apparently Joseph Stalin's. Lightning fast came our reaction, and we destroyed two of them within seconds. When our 8.8-centimetre gun fired again, Dietz fell as if struck by lightning from the turret cupola into the vehicle, his forehead bleeding. "'Commander is dead!' somebody shouted. "'Commander is alive!' the calm voice of Dietz replied. When the gun recoiled, our panzer had jerked back a hand's breadth, that is to say, the tracks teetered. As a consequence of this movement, a Russian sniper's bullet only grazed his forehead. That operation was to have been my last with Oberfeldwebel Dietz, for meanwhile I had been nominated to take over in the company commander's panzer as radio operator. Third company stood at readiness at the edge of a wood. The commander, Oberleutnant Neumeyer, was in conference with the CO. He had given orders that should an action develop suddenly, his deputy should take over, but whatever the circumstances, the crew of his own panzer should stand by and wait for him. I'm not having my own crew shot to pieces. Suddenly the order came down to intercept and destroy twelve enemy tanks heading for our main battle line. Dietz was apparently not happy with the new man assigned to him as his driver, came over to me and asked, "'Will you?' I agreed, disobeying the express order of Lieutenant Neumeyer. Our platoon rolled across our battle line, protecting its left flank, but then we came under heavy fire from the woodlands to our left, which posed us a difficult problem. Dietz found partial cover in a depression, but his request to the deputy company leader, twice repeated, to deal with the threat on our own flank was ignored. Dietz, fall back at once. That is an order. Up until that point, apart from our panzer, the company had had no contact with the enemy, so we drew back. Scarcely had we shown ourselves over the reverse slope than we received a fierce cannonade, which resulted in immediate damage to the lateral countershaft, causing the panzer to proceed in a circle. It was only a matter of time before the next hit arrived, and so, bail out! We jumped down into a potato field, the commander's fall softened by the back of a Russian. Seconds later, the panzer was hit again and again, and began to burn. The potato field offered such good cover that despite enemy infantry and even pack fire, we got far enough away for Dietz to explain his plan of escape, which was for each of us to make his way back individually to a haystack in the distance where we would be safe. However, despite heavy fire, a tiger came towards us at full speed. Klaus Peter Müller's 334 brought us out of the danger zone dropped us at the haystack, and then carried on forwards. Now another tiger came up from the rear, the command panzer of Lieutenant Neumeyer. He waved aside my stammered apology for disobeying his order with the words, Get in, I'm just happy that you're still alive. For the first time I realised what Neumeyer meant by his earlier remark. He identified so closely with his crew that he did not want to trust their lives to anybody else. Heinrich Dietz was sent off to officer cadet training shortly after this episode and received his commission before the war ended. He managed to conceal his German cross in gold from all searches during captivity and brought it home. With the exception of Kurt Lehmann, who fell later in the command panzer, all members of Dietz's first Tiger crew in 331 survived the war, captivity, and the early post-war era. As pensioners, Gunner Helmut Schneider, Loder Hans Ziedel, radio operator Kurt Kramer and I still recall in thankful remembrance the close ties we had to our commander. Kurt Kramer, the great fluke shot. I can vouch for the truth of the following story. Somewhere in open country, a pair of tigers stood on security duty. With the exception of the watchkeepers, the crews were inside their panzers. Six to eight kilometres away was a roll barn controlled by the Russians. 
The whole terrain was flat and easily surveyed, and so no great watchfulness was necessary. In one of the tigers was gunner Obergefreiter Franz Dietrich, from Nienberg Weser. He was seated at his sights looking out at the view when suddenly he saw a convoy of lorries, escorted by a single tank, appear at the far end of the roll barn. The range of nearly eight kilometres was far beyond the effective range of an 8.8-centimetre KWK gun, but Dietrich thought that there would be no harm in trying a pot shot, however, and obtained permission from the commander. The loader took a single armour-piercing shell from the supports and pushed it into the breach. The sliding block fell. Clack. Dietrich now realised how tiny the target was in the sights. To fire over such a range required indirect aim with elevation, but to have the gun pointing that high obstructed the view through the sight. Therefore he lowered the barrel in order to aim, allowed 200 to 300 metres for lateral deflection, raised the barrel again and fired. The shell rose high into the blue sky. The length of time it took that 8.8-centimetre shell to cover 8 kilometres on whatever trajectory it happened to be flying is not known, but myth has it that France was able to borrow some tobacco, fill his pipe with it, borrow a lighter, and then take a few puffs before he saw the spectacular result of his gunnery and shouted aloud his success. The crew, speechless, tore open the hatches and saw in the far distance where once the Soviet tank had been, a cloud of black smoke through which streaks of fire flashed. The plunging shell had been a direct hit. The incident was observed by other Tiger crews and confirmed officially. Chapter 5 The Battle for the Narif Bridgeheads once the Russians had begun their offensive in Army Group Center's sector on the 22nd of June 1944, the Red Army's advance, despite bitter defensive fighting and the occasional counterattack, had proceeded so efficiently that its forward units established a number of small bridgeheads over the River Narev, as for example at Shelkov and Serok, where they attempted to expand and merge during the course of the next few months. Panzer Battalion 507 was deployed here until November 1944, either as reserve, in action, or on security duty. On the 4th of October, heavy fighting broke out, in which the German objective of destroying the Narev bridgeheads was not achieved, although limited successes were obtained, at times in cooperation with Panzer Battalion 509. In the fighting on the 5th of October, 1944, 3rd Company Commander, recently promoted Hauptmann Fritz Neumeyer, fell. In August 1944, 507's commanding officer, Major Erich Schmidt, had been transferred out to take command of a panzer regiment of the Führer Grenadier Brigade. Hauptmann Fritz Schuck became the new commanding officer, having been commander of 2nd Company. Oberleutnant Georg Reinhardt was appointed as the new adjutant, transferred in from Panzer Battalion 509 to replace Oberleutnant Wolf Koltemann. The other changes at company level were as follows. First company, Hauptmann Holzheit was transferred to a supply battalion and replaced by Oberleutnant Rudi Bielfuss, former leader 1st Platoon, 1st Company. Second company, Hauptmann Schuck was replaced by the former leader of 1st Platoon, 2nd Company, Max Wiersching. 3rd Company. Following the death in action of Hauptmann Neumeyer, his replacement was the former adjutant, Oberleutnant Wolf Koltemann. The entries for operational days in the Saltbuch of Leutnant Gert Eichmuller confirm him as leader of 1st Platoon, 1st Company. See also diary entries for Erwin Eichinger, Staff Company, Anton Siegfried and Siegfried Obermeier, A Company. Calendar and Diary Entries 25th of September 1944 Siegfried I drove from the military hospital at Prashnitsch to Sichenau and then on to Miliau, where I went to the cinema and spent the night at the Wehrmacht Hostel. 27th of September 1944 Siegfried 
I was sent by the front light stella to Nesielsk and joined second company. From there a horse-drawn wagon brought me to the staff echelon in a wood near Vinica. 28th of September, 1944. Siegfried. At 1400 hours I went with the senior paymaster to the Tross for a few days' convalescence. 1st of October, 1944. Eichinger. We are at Kroschitsa. We have to destroy a Russian bridgehead west of the Narev. 2nd of October, 1944. Obermeyer. Russian attack at the Narev. 3rd of October, 1944. Obermeyer. Fighting at the bridgehead. 4th of October, 1944. Obermeyer. Fighting at the bridgehead. Eichmüller. North of Serok, Serpov. 5th of October, 1944. Eichinger. Hauptmann Neumeyer fell. Obermeyer, Hauptmann Neumeyer fell. Eichmüller, Jersenjin, 6th of October 1944. Eichmüller, Jersenjin, 7th of October 1944. Eichmüller, Height 108. 8th of October 1944. Eichmüller, South of Niestopov. 9th of October 1944. Eichmüller, Southeast of Niestopov. Siegfried. I went to the command post and attended the burial of Unteroffizier Lachner, who fell on the 8th of October. Hauptmann Fritz Neumeyer is buried there too. On the following day we left the Vinica woods, giving our fallen comrades a last salute as we passed their graves. On our journey towards Mackheim we were attacked by Yabos. 11th of October 1944. Eichmüller, north of Lass. Siegfried, at the support point as radio post. 12th of October, 1944. Eichmüller, Tsharnov, south of Plusk. Obermeyer, Russians broke through. Siegfried, nothing special to report. 13th of October, 1944. Eichmüller, Probostvo and Soya. Obermeyer, we are west of Mackheim. Siegfried, we went into another wood from where, at 0945 hours, we had to go forward with the commanding officer. On the way, Carden shaft broke. We are at Bloniafi. Carly is radioing the support point for help. 14th of October, 1944. Siegfried, towards midday, a towing tractor arrived from the recovery platoon. It already had Feldwebel Rule's SPW in tow. Rule, Fischer and Redl are seriously wounded. We were towed to the repair unit where both vehicles were made operational within 48 hours. Eichmüller. We are on height 107, south of Czieslov. 15th of October 1944. Eichmüller. Height 107, east side Yaklichev. 17th of October, 1944. Siegfried. We drove to the support point where I took over the radio connection to battalion, which is engaged in heavy fighting at Rosan on the Narev. 18th of October, 1944. Eichinger. Poor quarters at Grudus. Obergefreiter Pospikal assigned as writer. Siegfried. I spent all day until midnight at the radio set. 19th of October, 1944. Eichmüller, Yaklichev, and Height 109. Siegfried. I resumed at the radio set at 0400 hours, and at 1000 hours took down a message stating that the enemy has taken a village which we must recapture in a counter-attack. 20th of October, 1944. Siegfried. I was relieved by Zeman at the radio because we have to take provisions and ammunition forward during the night. 21st of October, 1944. Siegfried. There is a lull. 24th of October, 1944. Eichmüller. Bobi, west and southwest of Bobi. 25th of October, 1944. Eichmüller, west of Bobi. Obermeyer, 
We are stationed near a Gross Deutschland Panther unit. 26th of October 1944, Eichmüller, eastwards of Dlodov. 7th of November 1944, Obermeyer, we are at Zabin Karniewski, two kilometers from Karniewo. 8th of November 1944, Obermeyer, saw Frau Luna in the cinema at Karniewo. Gerd Eichmüller, Impressions of 16 Days of Operations After approximately two months of defensive battles in Army Group Center's sector, we had so dampened down the Russian strength that at first they gave up the idea of launching out from their two strong bridgeheads at Rosan and Nazielsk on the Narev River, north of Warsaw. Panzer Battalion 507 was therefore able to spend four weeks recuperating from the strain of fighting these endless retreats and to lick its wounds. As I recall, a large section of the battalion laid up in a sparse wood, which was soon converted into an assembly area for very substantial numbers of our troops. It was there that I got to see the King Tiger for the first time, with which the newly formed Panzer Battalion 505 had been equipped. On the 4th of October 1944, we began the attempt to crush and, if possible, eliminate entirely the bridgeheads on the River Narev. That day, the tiger of my company commander, Oberleutnant Bielfuss, was hit, killing the driver, while the commander himself was seriously wounded and had to be transported to military hospital. As a result, I was called upon to take charge of First Company, an unexpected task for which I was unprepared. From my Zaltbuch entries, I see that this attack occurred north of Serok, that is in the sector of the Nazielsk bridgehead. There now followed five full days of operations, details of which I no longer remember, except that on the 5th of October, my former commander in 3rd Company, Hauptmann Neumeyer, lost his life. 1st Company lost platoon leader Oberfeldwebel Zulauf, his driver and gunner, to a pack hit. Feldwebel Weber, Panzer Commander, 1st Platoon, was killed when a round from an SU-152 self-propelled gun tore off the turret of his panzer. That the aforementioned six days of battle, the last was my 23rd birthday, not only involved heavy casualties, but were also extraordinarily tiring, can be seen by the fact that during an attack made by our company on a broad front as part of a larger unit, I fell asleep in my commander's seat and only awoke when my gunner, who must have noticed how silent I had become, gave my left leg a strong shaking. The numerous mines sown by the Russians to complicate our penetration of their bridgeheads caused us great vexation. I can still picture myself and my crew on our knees, stabbing into the ground with long metal rods trying to locate mines and render them harmless. Nevertheless, my panzer was not spared running over these evil things. Twice they knocked us out with track damage. Such repairs as were possible with the tools we carried aboard were always nerve-wracking. Apart from the heavy labour involved, repairs were not only carried out under pressure of time, but occasionally also in the greatest danger, for mined areas were almost always under enemy fire, whose purpose in being there was to finish off the lame ducks. In connection with mines, whose explosions permanently damaged my rather sensitive hearing, I remember that a panzer of my platoon, or in any case of first company, whose gun muzzle was about two metres behind my turret hatch, fired around while I was surveying the area with binoculars. The sudden tremendous noise and air pressure threw me back into my seat, perforated my left eardrum, made me completely deaf for several hours, and condemned me to live ever more in the world of the hard of hearing. After that six-day spell of operations, I was given a rest day, followed by another five-day spell of combat, my last two days as recorded in my Zoldbuch, being west and southwest of Bobi on the 24th of October, and east of Glodov on the 26th. To my relief, on the 29th of October, Oberleutnant Bielfuss returned from military hospital and resumed command of First Company. Even though we and the other units with which we were deployed failed to crush the Narev bridgeheads, 
and despite our fairly high losses in men and material, we inflicted such heavy casualties on the enemy that for the remainder of 1944 he decided not to attempt to advance any farther westwards. Kurt Kramer, Hauptmann Neumeyer's Last Day Decades after the Lost War, there is so much we have forgotten or repressed. We found that there have been more important things to do than write up the past. In addition, today we see much from another angle, that is to say, from the perspective of men of pensionable age, who remain amazed that they survived those events which broke over their untroubled youth. Certain events are stored in our memories with astounding clarity, those which cheered us in our dour times, others because they haunt us still for having robbed us of part of the protective shield of comradeship. I refer now to one of the latter. On the evening of the 5th of October 1944, 3rd Company had taken up a position on the edge of a wood. Our mission was to prevent expansion of the bridgehead which the Russians had built at Nazielsk, near Razan, across the Narev River, in an approximately northeasterly direction. Before us lay a slight downward slope which provided a good view. In the distance, half hidden behind a rise in the ground, was a village, and down there, too, was sure to be an anti-tank ditch. Of the enemy there was no sign. All we heard of him was light artillery fire coming from the distance. Everything pointed to a quiet night. Radio silence was in force. This meant that radio operators had to maintain a listening watch and not transmit except in an emergency. Shortly before, we had been able to hear the Russians on our frequency, which meant that they could probably hear us. This was also the reason why the company commander had gone on foot that evening to give the platoon leaders their last instructions for the night. Because the command panzer was non-operational, I had transferred into another panzer with Hauptmann Fritz Neumeyer, as was customary for the senior radio operator, and I was now waiting with the rest of the crew for the commander's return. Fritz Neumeyer belonged amongst those officers who could command a unit with a light touch. With him, conversation had precedence over an order and the homogeneous cooperation within the company was more important to him than the constant demonstration of his power of command. Undoubtedly, his upbringing played a major role. Raised in Berlin, he brought with him the cheerfulness, the easy manner, and the amiable charm of his home region, which, together with his own calmness and the certainty he radiated, were for him the fundamental principles of command. I became very irritated when, in the absence of the commander and despite radio silence, the completely unencrypted words of a senior officer came over the ether saying that the leader of a certain infantry assault group wanted to speak to the commander of 3rd Company. I began jamming the frequency at once, but the most important part of what he had to convey had already been broadcast. The said officer, a major as I recall, was brought to our panzer on foot where Hauptmann Neumeyer had arrived meanwhile. The major reported that during the early evening Russian infantry had infiltrated the village ahead of us and he intended forcing them out in a single night attack. For this purpose he was requesting the support of our unit. Neumeyer deliberated for some time. All panzer men knew how risky such night attacks could be for we could see little but be easily seen. The large moving target of a panzer offered a fine opportunity to well-camouflaged anti-tank defences at night. At the urging of the Major, Neumeyer finally decided to provide the protection requested, but not the whole company, on account of the risk. So far as I recall, there were only two or three panzers which felt their way slowly forward through the darkness under Neumeyer's command. He was leaning well forward out of his hatch, while I also stood up through my hatch, so as to spot any obstacles in the terrain or signs of the enemy. Soon we reached the anti-tank ditch. It was only 2.5 metres deep, but had very steep sides. As it was impossible to cross the gap, we veered right and drove alongside the ditch, in the hope of finding a crossing point. This course of action showed the enemy our side profile. 
Everything remained quiet, however, and the tension in the panzer gradually lessened. After several hundred meters, we found a place where the ditch had not been completed, crossed to the other side, and drove back to opposite the point from where we had made the detour. Then we turned right again and headed on course for the unseen village in the darkness. Because of our now assumed proximity to the Russians, I had meanwhile resumed my seat, but when I glanced back I noticed Neumeyer still standing up in the turret. Over the intercom I suggested that he should lower his head a little. No worries, he laughed back. I'll be paid for it in the end. Those were the last words he ever spoke. In the same instant we saw muzzle flashes ahead. The fire was well aimed. The shells howled close by the panzer, and then a light bump told us that the armour had been grazed. Judging by the brief lapse of time between the hiss of the passing projectiles and the audible report of the gun being fired, it was clear that we had come devilish close to an enemy anti-tank position. Before we had time to react, there came another, harder blow, and a rain of fire pattered through the open turret hatch into the tank. The body of Fritz Neumeyer collapsed and tipped head first onto the floor of turret. Commander dead, the gunner shouted. A shell had hit the cupola and sheared off the mount for the anti aircraft machine gun, which had then inflicted a hideous injury on Neumeyer, killing him instantly. There were no other casualties. As the senior NCO, I now took command and ordered an immediate pulling back in order to get crew and panzer out of the danger zone. The driver, Schmidt, did not react at first. Perhaps the intercom was temporarily out. Not until I gave him a blow in the back with a hammer did he get the message, and finally we rolled back, still under fire. Then abruptly my fatal error became apparent— under the pressure of events and in the excitement, I had quite forgotten there was an anti-tank ditch to our rear somewhere. In the split second when I remembered it, it was already too late, and with a hard jolt the tiger tipped backwards into the ditch, causing everything not lashed down, including all the shells, and not least the crew, to whirl about in a heap. Fortunately nobody was injured. The panzer now rested on its tail fairly steeply upright a good part of the lightly armoured bottom of the hull inviting the enemy to finish it off. I gave orders to evacuate the panzer, since efforts to move it proved fruitless. For some reason best known to themselves, the Russians now ceased firing their anti-tank guns, replacing them with rather wild MG fire. This gave us the chance to get the dead commander out, and using a tarpaulin, we dragged him away to our side of the ditch. Having returned to company in a state of collapse, I was immediately ordered to return to the panzer and blow it up. Oberfeldwebel Hohenwater saw how exhausted we were, and his objection was accepted so that somebody else got the job. I still thank him for that today. Oberleutnant Wolf Koltmann, the CO's former adjutant, had returned to battalion on the 5th of October from a company commander's course and took over third company that same night. In a Polish birch forest bathed in autumn sunlight, we took leave of our much-loved commander with military honours. The commanding officer of 507 Battalion led the last salute. Fritz Neumeyer was laid to rest in the local cemetery at Neidenburg. I had the opportunity later to restore his grave to a worthier condition. A friendly farmer lent me some tools and provided flowers. A short time afterwards, the war broke over East Prussia. My hopes of revisiting the cemetery after the war could not be realised because of the political circumstances then prevailing. Kurt Kramer, Panzer Battle with Live Commentary by Radio Young lieutenants transferred into the battalion did not always have it easy. Now and again one would be drafted to the staff group so that the commanding officer could look him over. Therefore, Lieutenant X, for example, who had immediately been appointed a panzer commander, remained under the wing of the battalion commander before being entrusted with a platoon. In radio traffic between the battalion staff and companies, it was the practice to use code names for persons and the turret number for the panzer contacted. The following interesting event could be overheard by a company commander's vehicle 
whose radio equipment was on the battalion frequency. I shall assign the following code names for the three-way communication. Schwalbe equals battalion. Rosa equals company. 004, the Tiger of Lieutenant X. The battalion was occupying a position on a plateau where it had a security assignment to watch to the east. The terrain sloped downwards to the southeast and into a valley out of our sight. Reconnaissance of this valley was necessary and the following radio messages were passed accordingly. Schwalbe to 004. Drive forward and make observations in the valley in front of you. 004 to Schwalbe. Understood. I am driving forward. After a few minutes, very hastily, Enemy tanks! Enemy tanks! Schwalbe to 004. Understood. Open fire on them. 004 to Schwalbe. There are thirteen. Schwalbe to 004. Understood. Fire on them. 004 to Schwalbe. I repeat, there are thirteen tanks. Schwalbe to 004. We understand you. Shoot at them. Ahead it now grew very quiet. We held our breath. What was our otherwise so cautious CO up to? Surely he wasn't trying to force the poor lieutenant to do something reckless. Soon the next message followed. Schwalbe to 004. Pull back at once. Schwalbe to 004. Pull back at once. Schwalbe to Rosa. Leader Rosa, take command of Schwalbe. Leader Schwalbe proceeding ahead and signing off. What did all this mean? After a period of quiet, we heard 15 to 20 easily recognizable 8.8 centimeter rounds being fired, dull explosions occurring between each. Then came another message. Schwalbe to everybody. Schwalbe reporting back and taking command. 13 enemy tanks destroyed. The young lieutenants did not have it easy, and so the criticism of their handling of a situation by radio was discontinued forthwith. Heinz Stracker, Memoirs of Action with Third Company I was at Pothorza with the first batch of reinforcements from Paderborn for Third Company and transferred a few days later with the battalion to the Army Group Center Sector. After a couple of days, in which some T-34s were destroyed, the young crew could claim to be experienced. On another operation in sandy terrain, a track of our tiger jammed. We had to get out and attempt to remove it with explosives. It was the right-hand track, and as the radio operator, I vacated my position and removed everything which might be endangered by the explosion, MG ammunition, radio equipment, provision box, radio code tables, etc. After this was completed, hand grenades were placed on the track and ignited. We jumped into cover. After the smoke had cleared, we saw that the track had survived intact, but we now had a hole in the hull which had not been there before. This should have been foreseeable, for the hand grenades needed to have a shield above them, such as segments of track or packed earth. Two panzers had stood guard during this activity, and as the repair staff had now arrived, all went well. The workshop people welded over the hole, and we rolled out. Another time we were near a village under continuous Russian artillery fire. We had to shift our position repeatedly to avoid being hit. Despite that, they got us. The shell made a strange noise, but our luck held, for the dud came to rest between the gun and the radio operator's hatch. As a result, we lost electrical lighting, probably because the fuse had burnt out. The replacement fuse restored interior lighting, and the ventilator began sucking out the bluish-yellow smoke. Nevertheless, we had to go back to get the gun adjusted while the bolt for the radio operator's hatch had jammed so firmly that it required a large hammer and crowbar to open it. A panzer track is only as strong as its weakest link. This truism was confirmed one day when the last panzer of a column was crossing the bed of a small river with a steep slope on its far bank. The warning came by radio. Stop at once. Your right track will soon part has received damage. Our driver, Gerhard Schwartz, said he would proceed slowly and steadily. 
In this way we reached the slope, ascended, and found a safe spot to change two sections of the track, of which more than half had been shot away. Here the weakened track had been strong enough. Gerard Swartz fell later at Sichenau, when we were no longer together. After a mission, we returned to the assembly area, where we had plenty to keep us occupied, refueling, re-ammunitioning, collecting rations, cleaning weapons, caring for our panzers, etc. Our gunner, Otto Ledermuller, noticed a small gap between the running wheels and began poking inside with a stick. We gave it a closer look. It was about two to three centimetres in diameter and went through the whole thickness of the hull wall. After clearing away shells and debris inside, deep down in the hull we found the steel core projectile of a rifle grenade. This had penetrated the sixty millimetre armour of the lower hull. On an operation I served as radio operator in the Tiger of Oberfeldwebel Dietz, leader of 3rd Platoon, 3rd Company. Ledermuller was gunner, Horvat loader. We had been given new steel cord ammunition for our MG. When the MG was suddenly needed, I reported target recognized and received permission to fire. After one round, the MG refused, and the same happened with the turret MG. Following the report, MG jammed, the barrel was changed, but without effect. I still had some belts of the previous issue of ammunition, which I then loaded and fired normally. The steel projectiles had jammed so tight in the barrel that when they were ejected, the base of the cartridge case was torn away. Fritz Schreiber My cap flew off. One evening we were driving with two or three panzers at top speed through burning Bialystok. It was dark, and only the flames of the burning houses illuminated the streets. This drive was nearly the death of me. I was leaning out of the turret when suddenly my cap was torn from my head. The cause was a cable or telephone wire strung low across the street. Ten centimetres lower at that speed, and it would have cut my throat. A little later, also at night, while driving through a village, we received aimed rifle fire, apparently from partisans. I had to leave the turret and crouch down outside the panzer behind the driver's hatch so as not to offer my silhouette for target practice. Chapter 6 A Resting Place at Sikanau Mielau during November 1944, the Eastern Front came to a gradual standstill. In the northern sector, where Panzer Battalion 507 was involved, the Front ran along the River Nareff to its confluence with the Buk and Vistula near Warsaw. But the two bridgeheads which the Russians had established at Rozan and Nazielsk could not be crushed. In this area, 23 Army Corps, with 7th, 129th, 299th Infantry Divisions and 5th Jaeger Division, formed the southern wing of 2nd Army under General Oberst Weiss. What we had facing us on the other side, or better put, what was brewing up over there between November and mid-January 1945, could only be guessed at. The supreme leadership was much better informed though General Galen's Foreign Armies East intelligence network, the usual reconnaissance reports made locally, and by the sad certainty that the collapse of the Eastern Front in the summer of 1944 had not happened by accident. Hitler rejected all reasonable suggestions from his army commanders, however, dismissing the reports on enemy strength as filthy lies and the fear that the Russians were capable of a major offensive as idiotic. He also refused to listen to General Guderian, whom he had appointed Chief of the Army General Staff in July 1944, and who had been quoted as comparing the Eastern Front to a house of cards. If the front is penetrated at a single place, it will collapse. The soldier in the field had felt for some time that the Eastern Front was like a growing child's shirt too short at the back if you pulled it down at the front, and vice versa. 
that this was the bitter truth after the Normandy invasion became much more obvious when we heard the special announcement of the Ardennes Offensive on the evening of the 16th of December 1944. It sounded promising that 6th SS Panzer Army, Dietrich, 5th Panzer Army, Manteuffel, and 7th Army, Brandenberger, supported by 1,700 aircraft, were participating in such an offensive. But it was also clear to us that these 28 divisions would now be missing from the Eastern Front. Knowing this, our belief in final victory received another blow, though the will to fight continued unbroken. The important thing was to protect the Reich against the Russians, while at all costs avoiding the danger of falling into their hands. Panzer Battalion 507 lay at this time with remnants of 7th Panzer Division as the only army reserve in the sichenau machheim area which could hold out into the winter pause, immediately behind the bridgehead built by the Russians across the river Naref at Shelkov. It was located as follows. The battalion staff at the agricultural estate of Mosaki. First company, Oberleutnant Beilfuss at Bogate, as a kind of stiffening behind 299th Infantry Division. Second company, Oberleutnant Wirsching, south of Masaki. Third company, Oberleutnant Koltermann, which had spent some time at Slasi Slotki, was now at the farmstead of Helenov, north of Masaki. Supply company, Hauptmann Müller, mainly at the Wroblev Estate. Workshop company, W1, Oberleutnant Kusner at Paluki, W2, Oberleutnant Steinborn at Grzybov, northwest of Sichenau. From sober reflection on the situation, it was clear that in these two months the entire battalion had no choice but to bring panzers, wheeled vehicles, weapons and reinforcements to the highest state of readiness, while allowing for rest and recuperation. Calendar and Diary Entries Irvin Eichinger 9th of November 1944 Memorial Day for the Fallen was held at a farmstead at Grudusk, together with Panzer Jäger Battalion 560. 17th of November 1944 Savatitorsky Further changes in personnel made to economize on manpower. 20th of November 1944 I have now been made Supply Company Clerk. Hauptfeldwebel Enker is being transferred from Staff Company to the Workshop Company. Oberleutnant Hiesch is also being exchanged. 22nd of November 1944. I am with the Supply Company at Milev Debki. 24th of November 1944. Drove to Wroblev on poor muddy field paths. Then I have leave for Christmas and the New Year. Lieutenant Dieter Jahn. 17th of October, 1944. At the end of the gunnery instructor's course at Putlos, returned to Reserve Battalion 500, Paderborn, Unit Black, which is the core for the formation of the new Panzer Battalion 513, transferred to Bentfeld, west of Paderborn. 27th of October, 1944. Submitted the gunnery manual I have written, Enlargement and Commentary on Army Service Regulations 470 and 20, with regard to Panzer Gun 43 in the Tiger B. Now I have leave until the 10th of November 1944. 10th of November 1944, I have been drafted to Panzer Battalion 507. 15th of November 1944. Lieutenant Gustl Statler and I each took over one transport train with six Tigers. 21st of November 1944. Arrival at Sickenau after the train was diverted via Ortelsberg. I have been introduced to officers of Battalion 507, Commanding Officer Hauptmann Schuck, Oberleutnants Koltermann, Kusner and Meissner, Stabsatz Dr. von Malferer. 22nd of November 1944. Went via Karnievo to First Company and reported to its commander, Oberleutnant Weilfuss. He assigned me to 3rd Platoon. Leader 1st Platoon, Leutnant Gert Eichmuller. Leader 2nd Platoon, Leutnant Heinz Jahn. 
My crew in Tiger 131 consists of Unteroffizier Schorling, loader, Obergefreiter Wagner, gunner, Obergefreiter Lukas, driver, Gefreiter Panzer, radio operator. Leo Stuckler was appointed loader later. Georg Reinhardt has been promoted to Oberleutnant. 31st of December, 1944. I have to take on the instruction and general welfare of the reserve officer applicants. 1st of January, 1945. By Volkswagen to 299th Infantry Division and 7th Infantry Division. The major Russian offensive is expected to begin on the 11th of January, 1945. Stabsatz Dr. von Malfra at Mosaki. Drove to 5th Jäger Division and 129th Infantry Division. 13th of January, 1945. End of peace and quiet. Anton Siefried, 6th of January, 1945. Went on leave. His last diary entry. Hauptmann Johann Baptist Müller, CO Supply Company. How did the ordinary soldier live? Winter clothing with padded jackets and trousers, fur-lined leather boots and hair fur headwear were excellent. With the aid of the Fuchsgerater heaters, the cooling water for the 12-cylinder petrol engines could be warmed so that even in the worst cold they would start reasonably quickly first time. Not far from their well-camouflaged tigers and protected by hedges or similar against snowdrifts, the panzer crews lived in earth bunkers four metres deep, the roofs being protected against artillery fire by wood beams and earth. These bunkers were relatively spacious, had Hindenburg lamps, tea-light candles, or battery lighting, homemade iron bed frames and a round iron stove to provide a certain degree of comfort. The traditional thunderbox was available for calls of nature and had skillfully designed protection against the wind. At the Vroblev farmstead, the supply company quarters, about six kilometres east of Sichenau, an agricultural leader had previously worked for Gauleiter Koch, this man threshed corn and stocked silos with potatoes and sugar beet well into December, and so 507 did not lack for a staple diet. Johann Baptist Müller, Our Russian Heavies Many men will remember Our Russians, who preferred to take their chances with the German Wehrmacht than wait for the Red Army to liberate them from captivity. The supply company had about 30 of them, whom we put to good use as co-drivers for the ammunition and fuel staffs. They received the same clothing and rations as ourselves, and we had the impression that they felt happy to be with us. Shortly before Christmas they asked me if they could attend church in nearby Paluki. My objection that they were not Christians was rejected with indignation, as was my objection that they were even less Roman Catholics. That is irrelevant. We wish to go— when I gave in, they paraded, freshly spruced up, trousers pressed, boots highly polished. After two hours' absence, they marched back, beaming joyfully, and grateful that so much trust had been placed in them. When I took over the supply company, the Spies, Nikolai, suggested as my batman a blonde Ukrainian who did not look typically Russian. Nikolai was reliable and always ready to lend a helping hand, but fate did not favour him. In early 1945, he was at Göttingen Station fetching fuel from tanker wagons when USAF bombers appeared and attacked the railway yard. Nikolai ran off to find shelter and on the way was killed by the blast of a near miss. Honour to his memory. Johann Baptiste Müller, The 1944 Christmas Truce for many of us, it was the sixth time that we had to celebrate Christmas at the front. Would Ivan ruin it for us? Loud Russian voices through loudspeakers announced a truce. We shall let you have your Christmas, but afterwards... A couple of days before Christmas Eve, the Lord of the Manor at Palinov invited us to take part in a partridge shoot. He himself brought down a couple of these birds in flight, and we ate them on Christmas Eve. 
It was already dark when we were welcomed by the gentleman's very pregnant wife and invited inside to dine. The room was tastefully furnished with Christmas decorations, and the female Polish cook had prepared the partridge so beautifully that we truly had a banquet. The war was discussed, of course, and what lay ahead, but even so the Christmas mood held firm. Helmut Schneider, A Document of the Time while Panzer Battalion 507 was resting in East Prussia, it was half-term at the Officer Cadet Training School, Grossleinecker, and I had just been made Fahnenjunker Feldfabel, Officer Cadet Sergeant. I was awarded retrospectively the Panzer Assault Badge Grade 2, and a little later received a small parcel, which apart from cigarettes contained a greetings card from the Feltweben of 3rd Company Panzer Battalion 507. I have treasured it to this day. Court Kramer, Advent 1944 In mid-November 1944, 3rd Company settled in at Slushy Slotki, a village between Mackheim and Karnievo, the other elements of the battalion having quarters in the Masaki area. Still in the shadow of the long arm of the enemy's artillery, we dug in and built some marvellous bunkers. My crew's one even had a white-tiled stove with knee-high surrounding wall. Scarcely had we rested than the military circus began with polishing boots, cleaning weapons, hours of instruction, and the Spies even ventured out on horseback. Around Christmas the Russian counterattack was expected from their bridgehead for our aerial reconnaissance had reported strong enemy forces moving up. Our greatest concern was of being cheated out of our Christmas, and so we decided to bring Christmas forward by a fortnight. Ivan had his own calendar. The village barn was swiftly converted into a ballroom, and in dim lighting later even looked like one after inventive minds had provided the decorations. Volta Fuschig, practiced his belly dance for the event. Zinker and Kramer authorized a Christmas magazine, as ill-begotten as a lurid carnival production. Having neglected to clean the gun of their panzer, they were given a dressing down in the presence of the whole company by the commanding officer, who could not for the life of him imagine how this lousy crew could ever have the effrontery to present this shitty drainpipe of a gun on parade. Nothing could dampen the hilarity of the Christmas event, however, particularly when Klaus-Peter Müller unearthed some barrels of pickles in the ground using a mine-detector prod. The truce held, and Ivan was even tactful enough to suspend over the Christmas period the regular visits by his Ilyushin flying sewing machines. About ten days before the real Christmas, Third Company transferred to the large Helenov Agricultural Estate, north of Masaki, which apparently belonged to Gauleiter Koch. Here there was plenty of room for both men and vehicles, and on the 24th of December 1944, thanks to charitable gifts from the supply company and much grog, we celebrated Christmas a second time, while teetering on the starting blocks in expectation of the coming offensive. Heinz Zinker, Toothache During the Lull We had a peaceful time in the Karnievo masaki area before being transferred to the advanced lines in mid-November 1944. Our bunkers in the small village of Slashy Slotki had been dug by our predecessors and were now cleaned and enlarged by ourselves. We had therefore become underground dwellers, something which happened only rarely. The front, or in any case our sector, remained relatively quiet, except for the usual tension at nightfall when Soviet biplanes, which we called Rollbahnstenza, wandered the skies, dropping bombs at random. Worst of all was their monotonous engine noise, often of hours' duration, which could be heard whether distant, close by, or overhead. When it stopped, we knew there was going to be an attack. The pilot would search for the tiniest source of light and then rake it with bullets. I hated these pests with a passion. Not far from our bunkers were modest huts and large straw-covered buildings like barns. We poor soldiers rummaged through all these structures, 
what furniture and appointments we found were not worth the trouble of removing them. It was then decided to inspect the earth floor more closely, and using the mine detector probe, Stabsfeldwebel Mansenuther began an intensive search. He was rewarded by discovering that the former occupants of the village had dug deep to store their emergency rations in wooden barrels containing sides of bacon floating in a salty broth. This was very welcome, these being rich in fat. All the floors of all the buildings were eventually dug up and more discoveries made. Some of it tasted of train oil, but we didn't complain. The fat in them was the important thing. The weather was tolerable, the cold not too bad, and snowfall modest. Then I developed severe toothache. There was a dentist's surgery, or better said, a portable container of instruments in the neighbouring village about three kilometres away. The way there seemed long, but worse are my memories of the road back. The anaesthetic was a spray. While he was attempting the extraction, the tooth broke. The rest was sheer torment. The spray lost its deadening effect, if it ever had any, on the serious inflammation, and the dentist's light to work by was a torch held by another patient. It was already dark by the time the root was removed, which coincided with the arrival of the Rollbahnstenzer, dropping his payload nearby. More dead than alive, I made my way by night through the dark woods, fortunately marked by any number of signposts, which enabled me to find my way back, and not end up on the other side. Dipranka, Big Paw during the rest period at Sikhanau Milau, there appeared for the first time Dipranka, the newspaper of a Viennese tiger battalion, edited by the late Lieutenant Dr. Hans Moll, and published in four numbers, of which the originals and copies have survived. Issue number one came out on the 20th of December 1944, the 29th birthday of Hauptmann Fritz Schuck, the CO, who wrote the foreword, Shuk, former commander of 2nd Company, had taken command of the battalion on the 15th of August 1944, after Major Erich Schmidt transferred out. Issue number 2 appeared on the 5th of January 1945, and looked at the year 1944 in retrospect, when our operational areas had been Tarnopol, Brody, Lemberg, Olesko, Sukadola, and Kovel. Oberleutnant Max Wiersching was given special mention for having kept open the supply road to Brody while leading elements of 2nd Company. On the 20th of April 1944, Operation Tarnopol had ended. Oberst Frieber and Major Schmidt had both been awarded the Knight's Cross, and the battalion had been moved to the Army Group Center sector to concentrate its efforts on trying to eliminate the two enemy bridgeheads on the Nareff. According to Di Pranka, during the 77 days of operations, the following were destroyed. Vehicles, 252 tanks, 80 self-propelled assault guns, 8 prime movers, 1 armoured personnel carrier, 14 towing tractors, 72 lorries, 218 horse-drawn wagons. Weapons 74 field guns, 705 pack or flak guns, 2 automatic guns, 55 mortars, 14 heavy MGs, 135 anti-tank rifles. Enemy troops, infantry amounting to 9 regiments and 2 companies. Between the 23rd of March and 17th of November 1944, our repair staff and the workshop company restored to serviceability 488 panzers and 407 wheeled and half-track vehicles. The achievement of the four repair groups of our fighting companies and staff company was quite outstanding. There was almost no day involving our contact with the enemy on which they did not have to go forward as flying workshops to repair immobilized panzers exposed on many occasions on the battlefield to enemy artillery and heavy mortar fire and fighter bombers. Issue number three of Die Pranke appeared on the 16th of February 1945 and the fourth and last issue on the 2nd of March 1945. 
Some of the contents can be read later in this chronicle. The editor would like to make today's reader aware that De Pranker appeared in the closing months of the war when the paramount interest was survival. For some time the man in the field had not had much enthusiasm left over for political tomfoolery, but there was no way he could ignore it. He received regular injections of the political picture of the enemy. In reports and orders it was no longer the enemy who was spoken of, but the Bolshevists, which meant for the common soldier, Ivan. Here we could insert a long account about the editor of Die Pranke of the time, Dr. Hans Mohr, finding fascination in his appointment as an NSFO, National Socialist Leadership Officer, with the task of instructing members of Panzer Battalion 507 on the wealth of National Socialist thinking. As with all authors, our dear Hans Mohr contributes his own experiences in the passages that follow. Chapter 7 the fighting between the Narif and the Vistula. Situation Report On the 12th of January, 1945, the major Russian offensive began. In our sector, however, it was still quiet. It was known that we had opposing us Second Belarusian Front under Marshal Rokossovsky, but had no idea of its make-up. As we were to discover later, it consisted of 5th Guards Tank Army, 2nd Assault Army, the 47th, 48th, 49th, 65th and 70th Armies, 3 Guards Cavalry and 7 Mechanized Corps, and 1 and 8 Guards Tank Corps. The seriousness of our situation announced itself at 0700 hours on the 14th of January 1945 with a massive artillery barrage. For us it was a case of warm up the engines, then a short conference headed by the commanding officer in the battalion command post at Mosaki. After this, the companies rolled into the previously ordered operational areas south and east of Karnievo, as set in preparatory training. First and second companies towards Charnostov Svelitsa, third company eastwards towards Slasi Slutki, where Infantry Regiment 19, Regiment List, had already formed a hedgehog from which it would have to be hacked free first. On this first morning, and in the days of battle that followed, we soon appreciated that the Russians were carrying out their attacks with a ruthless deployment of men and materials. We also noticed particularly the appearance of massed armour in the form of the heavy Russian JS-2 Joseph Stalin tank. Experience of the new Russian tactics was gained on the first morning when 3rd Company Tigers, favoured by mist, approached a large formation of JS-2s to the minimum range of 150 metres and destroyed all 22 in a brief clash. An undoubted advantage for us was the significantly higher rate of fire of our 8.8 centimetre gun as against the 12.2 centimetre gun of the JS-2, which used two-part ammunition. Knowledge of this fact helped alleviate our fear of this new tank from the first day. Our commanding officer, Hauptmann Schuck, was wounded, though fortunately only lightly, on the opening day of the Russian offensive, and so was absent for a few days. During this period, the commander of 2nd Company, Oberleutnant Max Wiersching, took command of the battalion, bringing it carefully and successfully through the perils of the next few days. Now the high morale, excellent fighting spirit, and good standard of training of our battalion proved itself, and by the end of the second day of combat we had destroyed over a hundred of the enemy's tanks and assault guns. The extract from the Wehrmacht Bulletin of the 19th of January 1945 reads, Heavy Panzer Battalion 507, under the leadership of Oberleutnant Wiersching in the Sichenau Prasnich area, destroyed 136 enemy tanks in three days of heavy fighting. 66 of these victories were achieved in the first two days without loss to ourselves. On the 27th of January 1945, General Oberst Weiss, Commander, Second Army, mentioned expressly in an order of the day the steadfast defence of the battalion in the Zsichenau Miliau area, where the enemy was forced to halt repeatedly and lost 172 of his tanks. Calendar and Diary Entries 
14th of January 1945, Sunday. First Company, Biofus. Counterattack Southeastwards, Kanyevo. Second Company, Vishing. Counterattack Southeastwards, Kanyevo. Third Company, Koltaman. Slashy Slotki. 15th of January 1945. Fighting eastwards of Kanyevo. Counterattack and security northeast Marnostov. Obermeyer for A platoon. Moved to Kanyevo. Jan. Commanding officer ordered me to reconnoitre with four selected panzer commanders. We encountered the fiercest Russian defensive fire. In pulling back, my tiger stuck in a shell crater. Feldwebel Ratacek pulled us out. We returned with damaged panzers but no casualties. The artillery officer with the CO had his 21-centimeter mortar battery bombard the Russian assembly area. Feldwebel Klemmer, whom I had not taken on the reconnaissance despite his request, fell when hit in the head by a shell splinter. Eichinger. Returned from leave, I am with the supply company at Vishny. Hauptmann Schuck has a splinter wound to an eye. 16th of January 1945. Tank battle at Vielki Gogoli and at Kanajev. Unteroffizier Lehmann fell. Jan. Thirty of our Tigers destroyed, seventy Russian tanks. Our losses, one. Obermeyer. Back to Sichenau. 17th of January 1945. Jan. Oberleutnant Biofus ordered me to take the commander of an infantry regiment to his old command post, which, having regard to the way things are, must have been in Russian hands for some time already. Immediately behind a railway underpass we came across a formation of enemy tanks on the move. We destroyed the two leading Joseph Stalins and made off. Obermeyer. The leader of the reconnaissance platoon, Leutnant Moser, has fallen. 18th of January, 1945. Jan. During the night we looked for Feldwebel Berendt in wooded country, and in connection with that, led by Oberleutnant Wiersching, brought out the surrounded wheeled elements of the battalion. 19th of January, 1945. Jan. In First Company we still have six Tigers operational. The gun of my own Tiger was damaged when a German assault gun reversed into me in a narrow village road. We destroyed three tanks from an enemy column shooting down from a height. At Zarensk we just managed to cross a bridge before it was blown up. The road into Bietzen was blocked by a retreating division, probably the Hermann Göring division. I had to perform security for the six operational Tigers. At night I was ordered back to the Gut Tepsin supply base, where the lightly wounded CO, back from military hospital, took command of the battalion again. Obermeyer, in the early morning, arrived at Rapine, continuing to Strasbourg. 20th of January 1945, Obermeyer, retreating through Goslarhausen. 21st of January 1945, Obermeyer. In the morning we arrived at Graudens. Kusner. On the retreat to Graudens, the workshop company served as a collection point for battalion members without panzers. Heinz Zinker. The beginning of the Russian offensive, 14th of January 1945. The time passed in endless waiting, roll calls and cooking, until at last, on the 14th of January, the Russians unleashed their great winter offensive. A carpet bombardment by their artillery covered our entire sector and awoke us early. It was a morning of thick fog. Attack is the best form of defence, and so we manned our panzers and advanced into the P. Super. Warning was given of enemy tanks, but it was some time before we came across them, we halted from time to time to listen, forming up as a company. There was zero visibility, and a picture of events was only possible by radio. Our panzer, the third company command panzer, halted again. The path we had been following had a slight downward slope, and then turned left. We could hear the noise of tank tracks close by, but the enemy was too far away at fifty metres to be made out. We stared at the wall of fog in suspense. Suddenly a dark shadow emerged through it. 
the monster approached astoundingly fast. My first fleeting impression was that it could only be a JS-2, Joseph Stalin, into whose muzzle I was staring. We had the advantage of him, however. Therefore, AP shell, traverse turret, fire. A hit knocked out at full speed. The Russian tank came to a standstill, but close behind came a second one of the same type. It approached its stricken partner rapidly, drove around it, and then headed for us at maximum speed. I had it in the sights, hit the trigger, but nothing happened. The commander knocked my knee gently to tell me it was high time to shoot. To my right, the loader, also surprised that I had not fired, suddenly noticed that he had not released the safety catch. This lost us precious time. When I brought the second tank to a halt, it was literally right in front of us. Why he had not fired was a mystery. At least he could have rammed us, which would certainly have done us no good. In Memoriam, Kurt Lehman On one of the following days, having fallen victim to several mechanical defects, we had gone into an outpost east of Sichenau with six other vehicles. We found cover behind a semicircle of farmsteads. We had had little rest over the previous few days and could probably have slept standing up. In our command panzer, the electrical system was on strike so that neither the intercom nor the starter motor were working properly. Hauptmann Koltermann had therefore transferred to another Tiger to be replaced by Oberleutnant Hisch as commander. He told me immediately, "'You'll have to handle the fighting,' I've got no idea how to go about it. Despite my objection, he then set up the scissors binoculars in the turret in order to be able to follow all that went on. We agreed that I would advise him, I am shooting, before firing. We had just refueled and received our rations when all hell broke loose. Shells exploded all around us. The supply vehicles made off in top gear. We threw everything to hand into the crew compartment, Luckily the starter motor worked this time, and we drove to a spot between the houses to obtain an overview of the situation. What we saw through the optics horrified us. Over the broad expanse of lightly snow-covered terrain, almost bereft of any vegetation, about forty Russian tanks of various types were coming for us, well spread out and at a good speed. They were shooting as they approached, although the effect of doing this was primarily psychological. I decided that we had to stop the assault by aimed fire, and after the first direct hits had claimed their victims, the enemy force turned about to ponder its next move. We remained for hours in our favourable nook and repulsed all further attacks. At midday we withdrew. The ground to our rear was slightly uphill, and when we had sight of the summit there suddenly appeared in my sights the protective shield of a large anti-tank gun. Being overtired and unsettled by the constant trickle of attacks, I fired a round at the gun, which passed over it, luckily. We had reached our main battle line. We nestled down before our lines on this hill, and the infantrymen who had watched our battle from a safe distance were happy to have us as reinforcements. Our panzer stood before the German trenches which had been dug in great haste in an open area. Naturally, we did not find this location at all appealing. Our electrical system had meanwhile ceased to function entirely, and we could only start the engine manually. Contrary to my advice, Oberleutnant Hisch had turned off the engine, and so here we stood. All was quiet on the enemy side, and we could make out no sign of troop movements, but appearances were deceptive. At 1300 hours on the 16th of January 1945, later I saw that my watch had stopped at this hour, we received, without any kind of warning, a large caliber shell which penetrated the armor near the driver. A host of splinters ripped my padded trousers. Another even found my buttocks, causing me a major problem later whenever I sat down. My first thought was that this round could be the harbinger of others. The scissors binocular was still mounted in the turret, and it took precious seconds for me to convince Oberleutnant Hisch that we had to bail out. Rouse, I demanded several times. Then finally I got through to him, and we evacuated the panzer. 
I rolled over the side of the turret not a moment too soon. Scarcely had I landed than a second shell hit the turret. Eyewitnesses reported later that this hit released from the turret face a segment of spare track which rose straight up and then fell back between Heesh and myself, striking the Oberleutnant on the head and leaving him with a slight wound. Our panzer was smouldering. Heesh, Kramer, Gamsjäger and I crawled out of the danger zone. Unteroffizier Rolf Meisner's panzer came along and picked us up. That was very brave, for at any moment the enemy could have switched their aim to him. I was totally done for. Pain in my buttocks and left leg led me to believe I had a serious wound. Fortunately, they were only contusions. The several pairs of trousers I wore had taken the brunt of the splinters. Despite the unfavourable position of our wrecked panzer, the radio operator and loader managed to get to our driver, Unteroffizier Kurt Lehmann. He had bolted his hatch, and it was not possible to enter the panzer through the hole bored by the shell. Even if he had survived, we could not have got him out. Another hit set the panzer on fire. Thus fell in action our comrade, Court Lehmann, a good and reliable man to us for so long. Court Lehmann was appointed driver of Panzer 331 under the command of Oberfeldwebel Dietz when Battalion 507 had been formed. He was the only member of the original crew not to survive the war. Kurt Kramer, my last operational day in the East. Because the 14th of January 1945 fell on a Sunday, Revali was set for 0800 hours, but we were awoken an hour earlier by the Russian artillery barrage. Within a short while we were ready to roll and had orders to advance southwards in order to link up with 2nd Company after crossing a highway. This proved to be impossible because of thick fog. Although spreading out was not feasible for the same reason, we knew the terrain from sandbox games. Instead of 2nd Company, two JS-2 tanks appeared unexpectedly at 50 metres range. Zinka neutralized these with two hits to the turret after a ricochet. The fighting around Karnievo lasted three days in all, in the course of which the Russians lost 134 tanks destroyed by our battalion alone. We had hardly any losses, but naturally the usual technical breakdowns. On the 15th and 16th of January, 3rd Company was involved in heavy fighting west of Karnievo, in the course of which our panzer was damaged and abandoned, and our driver, Kurt Lehmann, fatally wounded, as reported by Zinka before. Although until then we had prevented the breakthrough by the enemy, who apparently had inexhaustible reserves and could bring up streams of reinforcements, the front had to be pulled back eventually, because the Russians had broken through on either flank of our sector. As I remember, it was on the 17th of January, close to Sichenau, when we ran into another strong tank formation, while having only six or seven of our Tigers operational. Towards dusk, when we went in search of quarters in a small village and had left our panzers, a great body of Russian tanks, estimated from 40 to 45, streamed down the opposite slope and headed spread out for our village. Shouts of alarm and mount up rang out simultaneously. We opened a tremendous cannonade, leaving 25 enemy tanks immobile or burning while the survivors fled back up the slope. Unteroffizier Rolf Meisner reported seven kills, ourselves three. I do not remember who else contributed. Apart from a few hits sustained and one breakdown with sprocket damage and brake failure, we had no losses. In this case we had had a distinct advantage over the attackers because they had had their work cut out to distinguish between buildings, poultry sheds and so on, and our half-hidden panzers. After the ten-minute-long encounter, we took the damaged tiger in tow and left the inhospitable village. The western horizon was still reddish when we discerned the silhouettes of twelve yups, Joseph Stalins, proceeding parallel to us in the same direction. "'We will attack them,' Coltman said over the intercom. I glanced at the driver. He tapped his temple meaningfully. I did the same, then said, totally without emotion, We will not attack them. 
it fell deathly quiet above us in the turret. After a while I continued, We have only three AP shells left, and are towing another panzer. At that time we did not know that our gun was also damaged after receiving a hit on the cylindrical mantle during the previous action. Only after a long pause did we hear, In order. After that we four probably had the feeling that we had dented military discipline but not caused it to collapse. What we had done did not amount to forcibly taking over command or cowardly refusal of an order but had been on the borderline of what was reasonable in the circumstances. Nevertheless I did not hide the fact that I was shitting myself, for it was certain that we would have hardly stood a chance if the order had actually been carried out. By coincidence, that 17th of January 1945 was my last operational day on the Eastern Front. Kaltemann gave me the job of using the non-operational command panzer to tow the damaged Tiger to the workshop at Milau. The road was lightly rising as we set out, but from its highest point ran straight and much more steeply downhill. The problem was that the Tiger under tow had defective brakes and was therefore not capable of being controlled or steered. Going downhill, no matter what our own speed, it was impossible to prevent the towed panzer catching up. Unrestrained by the towing hauses, it drifted left, uprooted a whole row of trees with trunks thirty-five centimetres in diameter, and then came to grief with a violent jolt in a hole three metres deep. The hawser slewed the towing panzer diagonally and stalled its defective engine, and the driver was not able to restart it. While we were deliberating on how to deal with these problems, Hauptmann Steinborn happened to pass by and ordered us to salvage the tiger in the hole at all costs. He would inform the recovery platoon. At that he went back but was not seen again, and the recovery platoon never came. I dismissed the other crew members with orders that they should break through to the west. When no tractor had come by next morning, I prepared the demolition charges. In addition to the two Z-85 demolition charges which every Tiger carried, we had twelve one-kilogram Pioneer's charges of dynamite, which I considered to be sufficient for the job in hand. It was obvious to me that I had to blow up both panzers together. If I blew up just one, I might not be able to approach the second for the danger of exploding ammunition from the first. The whole business seemed very tricky, since after I had set off the first Z-85, I would have only fifty seconds to get into the second Tiger and repeat the operation. I practiced a routine. Start in the crew compartment of Tiger 1, simulate igniting the first Z-85 on the engine hatch, then quickly to the shell rack to do the same thing, bail out and spring to Tiger 2, grab the antenna, swing over the track guard, jump in, repeat all I had done in Tiger 1, and then get out and run for it. I had found a stout spruce tree to give me cover against flying debris. When I reached it, I glanced at my watch and groaned. The run had taken well over sixty seconds. I removed my jacket and belt to lower wind resistance and the possibility of snagging on something inside either panzer. After several more trial runs, I had it down to almost fifty seconds and decided to chance it. I stuffed my combat pack with three or four salamis, which Sepp Placek had organized, two loaves of army bread, an adequate reserve of ammunition for the machine pistol, and then sat at the edge of the road and waited for whatever would come first, the recovery platoon or Ivan. Using the commander's excellent binoculars, I surveyed the area. To the east nothing stirred, although through the trees a village with small houses caught my attention. It was some while before it struck me that these were not houses, since they were moving forward, but Russian tanks spread out wide and heading westwards at top speed. Now I was forced to act. Everything went off without a hitch. Scarcely had I reached the spruce tree twenty metres away than the first charge went off but not so loudly as I had expected. The dynamite charge I used on the second Tiger brought about the desired fireworks. The powerful explosion literally tore the panzer apart, 
causing a hail of steel and wood splinters to whiz past my ears. I was fully protected, however. The force of the blast lifted off the turret and dropped it a few meters nearer me. I buckled up, hung the light's binoculars around my neck, put on the rucksack, shouldered the MP-40, and headed for the Reich. Two weeks later, after playing hide-and-seek with the Red Army, which had meanwhile occupied the territory ahead of me, I saw German soldiers in the distance for the first time. Just east of Graudenz, the VW Kubelwagen of our repair staff, with Oberfeldwebel Hans Strohmeyer at the wheel, pulled up beside me. He told me that I had been reported missing and brought me to the orderly office where I made my report. Filthy and infested with lice as I was, I asked to see the commander. He was busy with paperwork in an office, heard out the smart recitation of my adventures with little interest, and accepted the return of his binoculars with such a meager Dankeschön that I was greatly disappointed, although I did recognize that in our present predicament he had no use for binoculars. Wolf Koltemann was one of the first company members to visit me in my home province of Baden after the war and captivity, and later we met often. Heinz Thracker Sand in the Works During an operation in the Sichnau area, our Tiger had suffered damage to the rear gears, and a new left side set was fitted in the workshop. On the way to a fresh operation, the driver complained constantly of oil spraying around his ears. We called on the repair staff to take a look. Feeling around the drainage tube with a wire brought down oil mixed with sand. The new fitting had been prepared by saboteurs and had to be replaced immediately. This illustrated two important facts. One, a relatively small amount of damage could limit the mobility of a tiger and put it out of combat perhaps permanently, and two, the battle readiness of our fighting companies depended to a large extent on the operational readiness of our repair groups, who very frequently provided their assistance under fire. Joseph Stalin Naturally, not the Bolshevist dictator, but the JS-2 heavy tank named after him. The battalion staff issued a dramatic warning one day, Stalin tanks in action. As we were aware, we had to keep these tanks at least a thousand meters away if we were to avoid damage or destruction and injury to personnel. On the other hand, our 8.8-centimeter gun was only effective against them at a range less than a thousand meters. About 500 to 800 meters ahead of us, we saw a strange-looking bush with something like an oil barrel about halfway up. We let this bush have an H.E. shell which laid bare a Joseph Stalin. Our armor-piercing shell then ended its career. Johann Baptiste Müller Recollections of a Supply Battalion Commander Two hours after the Russian offensive began on the 14th of January 1945, 507 Panzer Battalion was sent into action as virtually the only reserve of Second Army. Deputizing for the commanding officer, Major Schuch, wounded at the beginning of the offensive, Oberleutnant Max Wiersching, commander of Second Company, took command of the battalion. Therefore, it was not rank or seniority which decided the substitute by line of succession, but experience at the front and proof of worth leading a fighting company. Towards ten o'clock that night, I had gone ahead to Carnievo, into the hot spot, to reconnoiter and establish the best routes for bringing up supplies of fuel, ammunition, and provisions. In the area southeast of Carnievo, I met Second Company on security watch well spread out through a sparse wood of pine trees. The Panzer men spoke of heavy tank battles all day and into the night, in which about seventy Russian tanks had been destroyed for no losses of our own. Other enemy tanks could be seen in the immediate vicinity, and a couple of these monsters could be made out through night glasses. The Panzer men were preoccupied by the lack of infantry protection and the fear of Russian close combat troops. Naturally, under these circumstances, refueling and re-ammunitioning was problematic. 
Being concerned to maintain full battle readiness of our Tigers, that night I went to the HQ of 23 Army Corps, General Lieutenant Meltzer, in the Dominium Opinagora, about five kilometers north of Sichenau, in order to report on the situation in Carnevo, and to request that the Corps send infantry support there. Upon conclusion of my detailed statement on the situation as it affected Panzer Battalion 507, General Meltzer took my map and with a charcoal pencil drew on it the front line which showed Carnevo as already given up. When I assured him that Carnevo was still in German hands because I had just come from there and seen our Tigers standing security, the General was overjoyed and amended my map in his own hand. It was 0600 hours on the 15th of January when I returned to our panzers to find them still involved in refueling. Using 20-litre canisters, it took some time to fill up a Tiger whose tank could take 540 litres, and reloading 70 shells was also heavy work. Punctually at 0700 hours, still not quite light, Ivan resumed his attack. Second Company Tigers stood in their loose security line at the edge of woodland. For reasons best known to themselves, the Russians preferred not to enter these woods, and chose instead to advance parallel to the edge. This offered the Panzers glorious target practice as the Russian tanks passed by. At the end of this second day of the Russian offensive, our battalion could report 66 Russian tanks destroyed without loss to itself a claim given an honourable mention a few days later in the Wehrmacht Bulletin. Dr. Hans Moll, The Battle for Carnevo, from Die Pranke, Issues 3 and 4. The battalion had received orders to secure to the south and southeast of Carnevo against advancing enemy tanks. Accordingly, first and second companies were deployed towards Svelitsa with the command panzer, while third company pushed forward into the woodland southeast of Kanyevo towards Slasishlotki to relieve the command post of Infantry Regiment 19, which had been forced to form a defensive hedgehog. On this first day of action, only third company had contact with the enemy. At Slasishlotki, they felt at home by virtue of their knowledge of the terrain although thick fog limited visibility. Third Company Commander Oberleutnant Koltermann could scarcely see his panzers as he gave out orders, mostly leaving the initiative to his platoon leaders. At 1100 hours, Third Company had contact with the enemy when the outlines of five heavy tanks appeared through the mists. These were Joseph Stalins, with the barrels of their guns pointing upwards and therefore not expecting action. The five colossi were given no warning, and short shrift when the range fell to a hundred and fifty metres. Shortly afterwards, other enemy tanks appeared, and came across the colossi reduced to smoking and fire-spitting ruins. The shock at seeing this caused them to turn off the direction of advance, some milling around wildly amongst themselves, and others turning back. Third Company naturally used this situation to advantage, and Coltermann ordered, Bagpipes, give chase and annihilate them. Third Company advanced into the centre of the disorganised mass, and by 1330 hours had destroyed them all. In little more than three hours, without loss to themselves, they destroyed twenty-two Bolshevist tanks, turning them into a heap of smouldering metal. The last of them came to rest before the regimental command post of Infantry Regiment 19, and therefore the task of liberating it had been achieved. Insofar as the situation allowed, there followed the heartiest Wiedersehen. Our 3rd Company and 1st Battalion Regiment List were old acquaintances from the fighting in October for Heights 109 and 107, and the reconquest of Zaklachev. In the course of the afternoon, 3rd Company took up positions ahead of the infantry, but when the fog returned thicker than before, the left wing of the company was detached on security duty to Zelki Dubrov, where the Russians were assembling a strong force under the cover of fog. That same evening, Oberleutnant Koltermann learned from the regiment list command post that the Russians had not expected heavy resistance in this area, and especially not from Tigers. 
This information had been obtained by our radio surveillance unit, listening to the bitter complaint of a Soviet tank group commander that all his tanks had been destroyed by our Tigers. Third Company was not engaged in any further tank battles that day, but concentrated instead on enemy convoys and the anti-tank guns and the like being brought up. Whereas the God of War had looked down very kindly on Third Company on the first operational day, he seemed not to want to bestow his favour on the other two companies and the fighting staff. In their operational area, only a couple of enemy tanks were destroyed. In addition, around 1,300 hours, two kilometres south of Carnievo, the commanding officer was wounded under the right eye and had to be taken to the military hospital at Krasna. The wound was fortunately not too serious, so that after a few days' treatment he was able to return to the battalion, which had been led in his absence most successfully by Oberleutnant Wiersching. On the second operational day the battalion was split up, 3rd Company to 299th Infantry Division and 1st Company to Battle Group Schmidt of 7th Infantry Division, Second Company initially remained at the disposal of the battalion commander. Attached later to 7th Infantry Division, it cooperated with Regiment List as the Russians made their immediate attack on Karnievo. The main event of this second operational day, especially for 2nd Company, was the bitter fighting around the town. Understandably, the Russians had a strong interest in obtaining control of Karnievo as soon as possible because of the Prajnich, Ostenburg and Makheim, golomin sikonau road junctions and also the road bridge running through its centre. Second Company was southeast of Karnievo with Regiment List and in the early hours had sent a pair of Tigers under Feldwebel Ebner to reconnoitre Zabin Karnievsky and to secure to the south and towards Makheim. This proved correct, for scarcely had the two panzers arrived than a pack of about twenty T-34s and assault guns came rolling up, turned west in front of Zabin and began their push along the road from Mackheim and south of it. This was naturally a piece of cake for Feldwebel Ebner and his companion Scheuerlein, who, in their well-chosen and well-camouflaged positions, simply waited for the unsuspecting enemy tanks to come into range. At optimum range they opened fire and quickly destroyed fourteen of them. The others turned tail and returned to the east. Despite this first-class victory by the two panzer veterans Ebner and Scheuerlein, a large force of enemy infantry that had been following the tanks infiltrated the eastern part of Zabin Karnievsky and took up positions between the houses. By 0800 hours, reconnaissance troop Ebner was back with the company. The Russians did not allow their plan of attack to be unduly affected by the fiasco at Zabin, and in the course of the morning another strong fleet of tanks forced its way through the regiment list security line south and east of Karnievo, the overwhelmingly greater strength of the enemy meeting heroic resistance. Second Company regrouped to oppose this fresh assault and supported regiment list. Feldwebel Ebner was now with three other Tigers about 600 metres from the northeast entrance to the town. Unfortunately, he was unable to prevent a group of three JS-2s and twelve smaller tanks, supported by at least a regiment of infantry, from crossing the road about 1,500 metres ahead and pushing on northwards, but otherwise there was a lull here. At about 1,500 hours, a single T-34 came from the east, apparently intending to enter Karnievo, and was destroyed by Ebner at a range of 700 metres. Radio surveillance provided the explanation. This tank had made a mistake in the timing and had broken cover too soon. No sooner had we been given notice of this than a group of four JS-2s and four T-34s emerged from the woods southeast of Karnievo and attempted to penetrate the southern part of the town, our own infantry having previously shifted position to the eastern part. Now the battle for Karnievo began. Almost at the same time as this predicted tank attack materialized, the Russians bombarded the town with murderous artillery and rocket launcher fire. Shells of all calibers collapsed buildings, causing many fires. 
The idea was to reduce Kanyefo to rubble and so force out the German troops and their commanders. Oberleutnants Wiersching and Reinhardt were surprised in the open as they made their way back to the command panzers from the commander's bunker, where they had been making contact with 23 Corps by telephone. They made it safely through the hail of fire, creeping and crawling, suffering no more than bruised knees and elbows. Feldwebel Ebner lost sight of the enemy tank group in the smoke and fumes, and when it had cleared, the enemy tanks were already in the town to mop up. Meanwhile, darkness had fallen, and the German infantry had to retire to the north, having sustained heavy casualties from the bombardment. The situation for the battalion had become very difficult. Second Company and the battle staff were north of the town setting up a roadblock facing oncoming movements from Mackheim. Second Company panzer commanders Bertholdt and Stadler had been cut off from the rest by the enemy panzer wedge recently arrived in the town. There was no chance of resisting the enemy pressure from the south. Wiersching therefore ordered the two stranded panzers to fight their way through to the rest of the battle staff. Enemy tanks and infantry blocked the roads through Karnievo. Besides the usual confusion and chaos of battle, it was a dark winter's night, the roads lit only by the dancing flames from burning houses. The tank obstacles set up by our troops earlier now threatened to become a mousetrap for our own panzers. They had been very speedily mined by the Russians. The gauntlet had to be run. All obstacles were overcome, and the two tigers roared past the Russians, close enough to shake hands. No man or panzer fell into their grasp. The last of those to break out was Feldwebel Halbritter. In the centre of town, his panzer had been attacked by a T-34, which had been skulking behind his quarters. A hit put his intercom and radio equipment out of action. Halbritter had to leave the turret and lie down near the driver's hatch in order to pass instructions to the driver. Then began a race through Karnievo, first a little way towards Golumin, therefore in the wrong direction. Then he turned and drove through the formations of enemy tanks and infantry which had assembled in the town centre. Wild shooting came from close range but did no harm, and so Halbritter came through successfully. An equally dangerous but interesting adventure was had by Feldwebel Bloss at the beginning of the tank attack on Karniefo. From the dust-dark shadows suddenly appeared before him, identified as KV-85s. One of them drove so close to Bloss that a collision occurred. Bloss had to disentangle his panzer from the enemy, reverse as far back as the closest safe range possible, and then fire at the Russian from twenty metres. Almost at once he noticed a second KV-85 behind the first, and dispatched this one too without resistance. Then Feldwebel Bloss brought his slightly damaged Tiger to the northern exit of Karnievo to join all the others. The tank barrier erected north of Karnievo, meanwhile, brought a glorious opportunity to destroy more enemy tanks. From the direction of Mackheim, a group of seven tanks and assault guns rolled up in the darkness, with their rations loaded on five lorries proceeding between them. As they reached the wreckage of the single T-34, destroyed by Feldwebel Ebner, which, still burning brightly, provided good light for shooting, they were as good as done for. The entire column was wiped out, beginning with the tail-ender. The flames licking from the wrecks cast a ghostly light on the roads and exit from Karniefo, where in November and December of 1944 the men of Second Company had spent their off-duty time and visited the cinema. While it appeared to the battalion commander, Oberleutnant Wiersching, still to be possible to eject the Bolshevists from Karniefo at a single stroke, unfortunately another plan had been developed by the corps command post. Naturally, they took great pleasure in receiving our report that on this second day of battle we had destroyed 46 enemy tanks, but nothing was to be hoped from a planned counter-attack. A new main battle line was already under construction, some of it already occupied by our troops, who had recaptured the territory while Battalion 507 was in action against the Russians seven kilometers in front of them. 
Corps therefore ordered that the entire battalion should assemble at Konarzhev for resupply to secure and stand ready to repel an enemy counterattack from the direction of Golimin. Johann Baptist Müller Further Observations of a Supply Battalion Commander Despite our steadfastness, the front line could not be held by panzers alone, and under pressure of the great numerical superiority of the Second Belarusian Front had to be pulled back to the line Scharfenwieser Milau. Although this prepared position was overrun on the 18th of January by Marshal Rokossovsky, our fierce resistance probably convinced him to change his main direction of advance from Graudens towards Deutsch Eilau, which fell to him on the 22nd of January. While his army group then headed north to the Frischershaf on the Baltic, we succeeded, though much disorganized, in reaching the Vistula near Graudens and assembled there as a company. At this point, mention should be made of the panzer ditches, the building of which had been authorized arbitrarily by the NSDAP, Gauleiter Erich Koch, without consulting the military authorities defending the East Prussian homeland. The main panzer ditch ran along the front sector, in which 507 Battalion faced the Russian offensive, about two kilometers north of Karnievo, towards Vroblev, and a little to the south of Sichenau. It did not present the Russians with too much trouble, while for 507 it was almost a mouse trap when involved in combat against them or retreating, as will be explained in reports later in this chronicle. Some of the crossings or fords had been blown up prematurely by our pioneers, which also made things difficult, if not impossible, for us. Wolf Koltemann Panzer Battalion 507 in January 1945 We had lost Karnievo, and 507 Battalion received the order from Corps to assemble the scattered elements in the Konarzhev area, which according to Oberleutnant Wiersching, it was still possible to recover. The new main battle line was in the process of being set up at Konarzhev, and our job there was to secure against anticipated tank attacks coming from Golimin. Since the overall situation had changed drastically and the new front line was being occupied by troops streaming back, the measure was sensible. The political leadership, Gauleiter Koch, was aware of the foregoing and stepped up the excavation work for a panzer and infantry trench system. This was done with little forethought and never in cooperation with the military commanders on the spot or with the higher staffs. The worst damage was wrought in the hectic activity when natural crossings or fords were blown up prematurely, causing serious limitation to panzer mobility. Workshop services, supply vehicles and recovery panzers were greatly impeded by these uncoordinated and irresponsible measures. Damaged tigers frequently became write-offs when their destruction became necessary for lack of the possibility of recovery. Despite that, the workshop company and repair service achieved the almost impossible in those January days. The partially delayed and chaotic repatriation of the civilian population to the West is also attributable to the failure of the political leadership. In the course of fighting the retreat, we experienced at first hand streams of refugees blocking the roads. Many thousands would have been spared death or martyrdom in fleeing during the icy cold if those responsible had not ignored their duty to humanity. The flight of civilians almost everywhere did not begin until the sound of battle made clear to the population that all promises and solemn declarations by NSDAP district and local group leaders were false and that the Russians were literally at the gates. What chaos! What misery! Naturally, our supply vehicles took many of these despairing people back with them insofar as this was possible. They are grim memories which still haunt us decades later, especially those images west of the Vistula when the guarded streams from punishment and special camps were added. After the loss of Sichenau, our battalion fought a continuous retreat towards Graudens, alongside elements of 14th Panzer Division that were headed for Schwetz. As a result of technical breakdowns, defects and enemy action, 
In the last week of January 1945, the fighting section of the battalion reached the Vistula at Groudens, much reduced in size, while the personnel and vehicles of the companies and staffs remained almost intact. Damaged panzers were often brought back into Reich territory for repair with their crews. Therefore, it was consistent and logical that the Army High Command should want to transfer Panzer Battalion 507 with its veteran front-experienced crews to the military depot at Zenelager near Paderborn to be re-equipped with the new King Tigers, but extracting it from Second Army presented major difficulties. Initially, all battle-worthy Tigers were held at Groudens with a swollen repairs staff and the battalion's own supply vehicles. Assigned to 1st Company under Oberleutnant Bielfuss, from there they were moved out to northeast of Groudens to help consolidate a planned assembly area. When Marienwerder was declared a stronghold, 1st Company was incorporated into its defence and only released when 7th Panzer Division and 28th Jäger Division took over the sector. Reichsführer SS Himmler had taken command of Army Group Vistula and seized any unit that looked reasonably intact, but ultimately the Army High Command Order transferring Battalion 507 Panzer crews back to Paderborn took precedence. Chapter 8 The Partial Return to Zenelager Panzer Battalion 507 had been successfully brought together in the Graudenz area. The bridge over the Vistula just north of Graudenz was found intact, but did not have the strength to bear the weight of a tiger. Therefore, the last tigers remained on the east bank of the Vistula with 1st Company under Oberleutnant Bielfuss, while the still battle-worthy elements of 2nd and 3rd Companies succeeded in crossing the frozen river to the military depot with Grupa, close to Graudenz. The supply company was accommodated at a farm at Michelau, on the left bank of the Vistula, two kilometres north of the bridge. The heavy losses of vehicles suffered by the battalion in the days after the loss of Sichenau were due mainly to technical problems resulting from action with the enemy or demolition charges. As a result of the serious shortfall in fighting units, it became the policy to get badly damaged panzers, or those irreparable locally, back into the Reich proper. Finally, Higher Channels, OKH, ordered the extraction of Panzer Battalion 507, which, as will be explained, turned into a very unpleasant series of events. On the 24th of January 1945, at an officers' conference at Graudenz, the first since the Russians launched their major offensive, Reichsführer SS Himmler announced that he was leading the newly formed army group Vistula. In two messages to 507, the new saviour of the Eastern Front came to our attention by awarding the Knight's Cross to Feldwebel Edmund Ratichak of our battalion and promoting him to officer with the remark, in the Third Reich, achievement is decisive. This generated the fear that the battalion might be drawn into the defence of Graudens, now declared a fortress. As usual, our diary entries for the period the 20th of January to the 24th of March 1945, Jan and Obermeyer, are given, together with the experiences of various members of the battalion. Calendar and Diary Entries 20th of January 1945. Jan. Tigers into workshop. Commanding officer Schuck gave me quarters. A former wheelwright's shop. 21st of January 1945. Jan. Resting. 22nd of January 1945. Jan. Tigers 102B and 133 to Raiden. For the first time came across columns of refugees. At midnight was ordered to Groudens Military Barracks. 23rd of January 1945. Jan. Wrote out recommendations for the Iron Cross. 24th of January 1945. Jan. Led six tigers to Ganzi. Feldwebel Ratichak's tiger bogged down on Sunken Road. Secured near railway line. Commanding officer came by at night 
ordered that Oberleutnant Bielfuss and Leutnant Jan take over the panzers while I accompanied the remainder of the battalion to the Reich for rest and reorganization. Obermeier, Graudenz, Grossvolental. 25th of January, 1945. Hulsmann, counter-attack towards Unterhenger. 26th of January, 1945. Jan, Commanding officer sent me in the VW to Marienwerder. Crossed the frozen Vistula by night. I have to winkle out the fighting commanders of the Battalion 507 Tigers stationed here. He assures me he will send them off towards Graudenz in the early morning. There is no bridge nearby suitable for a Tiger to cross the Vistula. 27th of January, 1945. Jan. Went with commanding officer to corps at Osterwitt then to Gruppe and 4th Panzer Division at Dress. Our remaining Tigers are being attached to this division, just arrived from Courland. 507's wheeled vehicles are transferring to Gross Volental. The Tigers from Marienwerder have not arrived. Reichsführer SS Himmler has been made Commander-in-Chief Army Group Vistula. Obermeier. Arrived at Gross Volental. The supply battery is moving out. 28th of January, 1945. Jan. The transfer to Butov is beginning. 30th of January, 1945. Jan. Commanding officer and I needed 24 hours for the approximately 90-kilometer stretch to Butov because we picked up refugees on the way. Obermeier. Gross Volental, Prusich Stargart. 1st of February, 1945. Jan. Drove to 1st Company at Konitz. Obermeier. Arrived at Butov. 2nd of February, 1945. Jan. 1st Company is in action south of Tuchel. 5th of February, 1945. Jan. Looked over printing press of the Buffel Propaganda Company. Telephone conversation with Stettin about train transports. 6th to 10th of February, 1945. Jan. Preparations for train transport to Paderborn. 12th of February, 1945. Jan. Train transport of Battalion 507, less 1st Company, to Paderborn will take until the 15th of February. Obermeier. 0600 hours, loading at Butov. Departed 2400 hours. 13th of February, 1945, Obermeier. Our train passed through Kohlberg and Kuslin. 16th of February, 1945, Obermeier. Our train stood all day outside Bielefeld. We arrived at Zenelaga during the evening. Jan. After arrival at Zenelaga camp, until mid-March, normal barracks duty, with numerous interruptions for air raid alarms. 27th of February, 1945. Obermeier. Schuck presented Wiersching with the Knight's Cross. 7th of March, 1945. Obermeier. Two Oberfeldwebern of Panzer Battalion 507 have been mentioned in the role of honor. Schuck presented an Oberfeldwebel with the German Cross in gold. 8th of March, 1945. Obermeier. Lieutenant Mohl went to Berlin to speak with General Ritter von Epp about leave. 11th of March, 1945. Obermeier. Bombers attacked Paderborn. 24th of March, 1945. Obermeier. Koltermann promoted to Hauptmann and awarded the Knight's Cross. Rudy Bielfuss. Madness at the Vistula. The operational elements of my first company remained at Graudenz alongside the reinforced repair staff and our own supply vehicles. After the vanguard of 7th Panzer Division arrived from the east on the 26th of January 1945, first company was sent north to Marienwerder for incorporation into the defense of the stronghold there. Once 7th Panzer and 28th Jäger Division took over the sector, the wheeled vehicles of 1st Company crossed the ice to the west bank of the Vistula. 
The panzers, commanded by Lieutenant Jan, headed for Graudens, where it was said there was a bridge able to bear a tiger's weight. This was not only not the case, but the rearward HQ had also not thought of preparing panzer ferries for the tigers. Since the Russians were now pressing forward to the Vistula, Jan had no option but to destroy his tigers with explosives to prevent them falling into enemy hands. In those weeks this was the fate which befell some twenty-two tigers, though the exact number cannot be confirmed. For us these proceedings were incomprehensible. What the enemy's second Belarusian front had not been able to do was finally done to them by our own side. Josef Hulsman, former Fahnenjunker Feldfabel, Tigers at Marienwerder. Four crews were put together from the panzerless elements of First Company, transferred by Lieutenant Jan to Marienwerder. The town had been declared a stronghold, and the guns of our Tigers were the only heavy weapons available to the commandant of the fortress. This resulted in our being well fed and supplied, but having to be the fire brigade always on call. Each crew received a bottle of schnapps daily after we informed them that this was the usual practice on active service. The days passed relatively quietly, apart from a counter-attack in the direction of Unterhenga on the evening of the 25th of January 1945, in which we fought a successful duel with Russian anti-tank guns and repulsed the enemy. Our Tigers all received at least some damage, and should have gone to the workshop urgently for overhaul. Thus, for example, Leutnant Jan's Tiger went there on the drive wheels, because the forward torsion rods had broken. On the 30th of January, we were released from the stronghold, and received orders to proceed to Graudens, in order to cross to the west bank by means of the bridge there. At Marienwerder, only the ice bridge had survived. This was naturally not strong enough to take a panzer. The crews were happy to go to Graudens, but then we received pack fire, which put a running wheel out of alignment so that the tiger concerned had to be destroyed. A little later we were confronted by an insurmountable difficulty. There was an anti-tank ditch between Marienwerder and Graudens. The bridge across it had been blown, a fine example of military cooperation. As there were no panzer ferries at Marienwerder, we drove along the ditch in the hope of finding a crossing point, but in vain. The ditch had been created with German thoroughness, and actually went up into the Vistula Mountains. Therefore we could not get to Graudens. We had the Russians on three sides and the Vistula River on the fourth, the thickness of its ice not being reliable and so we had no option but to blow up the three surviving tigers and then attempt to get to the other side on foot over the ice. Our heavily armed group was equipped with an MG and four machine pistols, and each man had his service pistol. After allowing a strong Russian patrol to pass by below us, we slithered down the slope and made our way across the ice. It cracked open twice under our weight, and some open areas could be made out but finally we arrived unharmed and dry on the western bank, where our meeting with the German sentries was a relief from the stress and strain of the last few hours. After that we celebrated our arrival with the Marienwerder Schnapps. Next day we succeeded in contacting battalion, which sent a lorry to fetch us. Our company commander, Rudi Beilfuss, was happy to have his twenty men back, Lieutenant Jan was court-martialed for blowing up the Tigers, but the charges were dropped. I was sent to officer cadet school at Vishau in mid-March 1945, and therefore took no further part in the operations of the battalion. Rudy Bailfus, Odyssey Towards Paderborn the wheeled vehicles of First Company reached the old Reichstrasse 1 at Konitz 4 via Mewa and Preussisch Stargard. The still battle-worthy Tigers allocated to First Company left Gruper, led by Oberleutnant Hiesch, and fought their way through the Tuchel Haida with other groups. The heavy fighting around Tuchel led to many losses amongst our operational panzers because the repair staff had no mobile crane and therefore were unable to carry out major works. 
These locally irreparable panzers were then transported with their crews back to Paderborn, where the latter were reassigned to newly arrived King Tigers or Jagd Tiger SP anti tank guns. Thus, as of the 20th of February 1945, only the wheeled section remained behind and finally received permission from Second Army to load up and proceed to Paderborn. Transport was arranged from Beerent for the 7th of March, from where the trains headed west via Butov and Schlava. Unfortunately, at Zanov, Russian spearheads coming up from the south had cut the danzig stettin railway line and the main stulp schlava kuslin highway. Our transport returned to Danzig, the assembly point for everything arriving from East Prussia and the cut-off parts of Pomerania. After occupying quarters temporarily at Neufarwasser, the unit moved on to the port of Gottenhafen. Since these elements of First Company had approval to be loaded up, following a request to Army High Command, OKH, by the battalion, and after much stubborn resistance, the unit avoided deployment as infantry and all vehicles were loaded aboard a troop ship as part of a large convoy which made land seven days later in mist and snow at Sveinemunda. From here the vehicles headed at once by Anklem to Markish Friedland. Only with a movement order signed by the Reichsführer SS himself authenticating the Second Army Order was it then possible to leave the National Socialist Gau of Pomerania, which had been declared a front region. At Markish Friedland, the wagons for the onward transport to Paderborn were procured, and in the last days of March, the final stage of this odyssey began. These remnants of the company were not able to rejoin the battalion at Paderborn, however, and arrived on the 6th or 7th of April at Bad Lipspringer, in the Teutoburger Forest, by which time the battalion had, to all intents and purposes, ceased to exist. Fritz Schreiber Remembering my return to Paderborn. March 1945. Finally the decision had come from Berlin. I was to hand over my repaired Tigers to a mixed battalion, which lay ready for action in a village at Frankfurt, Oder. The Tigers were to be loaded at Eckner, which took four days thanks to outstanding organization. I had obtained quarters with very nice people at Eckner for my crew and myself, and from there was able to visit an aunt, from whom I obtained assurance that my parents had come through it all and were at Bath, which was a great relief. I handed over my tigers after we had spent several days in action near Frankfurt Oder, and then we headed back to the old unit at Paderborn. Because all rail lines to the west had been destroyed, we had to try hitching from a couple of stations before Brilon. After much lack of success, Fortune smiled down upon us by sending one of our unit's lorries from Kassel. The diminutive company writer, Anspuk, thought he was seeing a ghost. "'Is it you, Herr Feldfabel? We wrote you off long ago.' Upon arrival at company, we had to report first to the Spies for quarters. Even here there was joyful incredulity at the arrival of our missing panzer crew. Naturally, it had to be celebrated with a mixture of alcoholic drinks left over from the last sergeant's evening. The motto was, whoever is well lubricated travels well. We followed this sensible advice very often. Johann Baptiste Müller thanks to Guderian. In the final analysis, we owed it to the then Chief of Army General Staff, General Oberst Heinz Guderian, for the main body of Panzer Battalion 507 having escaped Himmler's clutches. The first stage of our breaking free of the Eastern Front was the transfer of the wheeled vehicles of all companies, except First Company, to Butov, just inside the old Reich frontier. Johann Baptist Müller, Assembly Point, Butov, Pomerania. In the last days of January 1945, a convoy of wheeled vehicles of 507 Staff Company, the Supply Company, the Workshop Company, and the two Fighting Panzer Companies were strung out over several kilometers of the Tuchel Heath, heading for the town of Butov, about a hundred kilometers from Graudenz. 
streaming back with us were the endless columns of refugees picked up from villages and farms as we passed. The main assembly point of the West Prussian trudge was the small town of Berent in the Pomerellen, a coastal region stretching over southeastern parts of the Baltic. The burgomasters informed us that the columns of refugees would head along the Pomeranian lagoons to the west. The exodus had been fully underway during all January. Whoever saw it will never forget the sight. Crying children, pregnant mothers, the hurried covering over of the recently deceased who could not be buried because the ground was frozen solid. And behind all this misery was the fear of falling into the hands of the Russians. Mixed into this great withdrawal of the Germans from the east were prisoners of war and the inmates of concentration camps, these latter guarded by SS men. I shall never forget the picture of suffering of a walking work column of female figures moving along a snow-covered woodland path in the Tuchelheide in the freezing cold, driven on by their guards like cattle. As I passed by the ghostly column in the staff car, I looked into the many faces close to death and remember seeing bodies here and there in roadside ditches, and who had then collapsed and then been given the coup de grace, as I observed for myself. This is how war is for those forced to see it. Butov, a small Pomeranian town inside the Reich border, was known for its massive castle, which had once housed the knights of the German brothers of St. Mary at Jerusalem. Now it was a haven for refugees of all kinds in those last days of January 1945. There was no possibility of obtaining lodgings. I was overjoyed to be offered an armchair in which to doze at the house of the local midwife. Thousands of refugees from the East Prussian Corridor and the Pomerellen had naturally hoped to get a train west from Butov, but the railway timetable no longer existed. The party bigwigs, the gold pheasants, had seen to that, for wheels must roll for victory, but naturally only eastwards. They fled in their own automobiles when the time came. The only question for the fleeing masses at Butov was, how can I get to the west? The word had got round that panzers at Butov were to be loaded aboard westbound trains. Whilst we waited on edge for the promised transporters, the situation on the Eastern Front had deteriorated dramatically. On the 30th of January 1945, the Russians had succeeded in establishing bridgeheads on the west bank of the Oder at Kustrin and Frankfurt, which meant that the Front had advanced 70 kilometres closer to Berlin. Our great concern now was that the Russians might push forward to stettin Altdam and cut the last remaining railway line to the west. Thus it came as a relief when the Reichsbahn notified us that three transport trains would be arriving at Butov for loading on the 12th of February. As our soldiers were well practised in driving vehicles aboard trains, the work proceeded smoothly. In this case, since it was not tigers which were being loaded, but much lighter wheeled or half-tracked vehicles, loading was effected by means of a ramp after the low loaders had been bridged together with steel plates. This enabled the vehicles to drive up one after the other aboard the 47 transporter wagons, then be lashed down and wedged in place once in position. News of the transporting out of our battalion had got around quickly, and we were hard put to defend ourselves against the throngs of refugees. Under the circumstances, who would have refused humanitarian aid? Therefore, every free spot, even in the vehicles themselves, was used, provided it was not in the open, for this would have meant certain death in the freezing temperatures. Our panzermen occupied their vehicles, heated to some extent with the Fuchsgerat engine-warming equipment, the three cattle wagons being given over exclusively to women and children. At the centre of the long train was the field kitchen, richly stocked with provisions of all kinds, with hot water always available for beverages. There were no sanitary facilities, and the train had to make frequent stops along uninhabited stretches of track, the hurriedly organised system of chamber pots for the children proved insufficient. 
Everybody heaved an audible sigh of relief as the train got underway. The route followed was Schlava, Kuslin, Kolberg, with a short stop at the latter two stations. Here thousands of refugees stormed the platforms and our trains. It was extremely difficult to get these desperate people to understand that we only had limited ability to accept more passengers. We could only help where it was possible for some to squeeze inside a few of the wheeled vehicles. In order to be able to control the number of passengers, I made them all register, but unfortunately these listings were lost. They would have been of invaluable help later in enabling families to reunite. Looking back, I can say that under the circumstances all went well. There was no illness or accident, nor a single case of somebody freezing to death. The journey continued via Treptow, Golnov, Altdam, Stettin. What good luck that the last loophole to the west remained open. Regrettably, 1st Company of Panzer Battalion 507, which loaded at Beerent on the 7th of March, found the gates shut. Upon arrival in Mecklenburg, many of our guests left us, including the family of a dentist from Marienwerder, with six pretty daughters, on whose behalf at Butov we had loaded a large wooden trunk with medical equipment, which will no doubt have contributed to the creation of a new life for them. The transport steamed day and night via Passavalk and Neustrelitz. The general mood relaxed gradually. Our train made an enforced stop at a small station because of an air raid alarm, and everybody left it for cover. It was a foretaste of war in the Western Theatre. On the 15th of February, after passing through Wittenberger, Zeller and Hanover, we reached our final destination, Zenelager Camp at Paderborn. Richard Durst, Officer's Celebration in the Devil's Mill Tavern Our train brought us to Paderborn via Stettin, where we came under MG fire and Berlin. At Zenelager Camp we were given conversion training to the Tiger II, King Tiger. We NCOs, eighteen or more of us, were given quarters in one room. In those days there was plenty of booze available from various sources, pure alcohol, and also Guntersblum wine from the vineyard of our Lieutenant Gustl Stadler. An officer's evening was held in the woodland tavern Teufelschmull. Earlier I had to drive a wood-gas lorry to fetch a group of driver trainees, so when I eventually got to the party, most of those present had already reached their limit. The commanding officer not accepted for he had had to respond to every toast for his promotion to Hauptmann and his knight's cross. Once it ended, I had to load as many bodies as possible in the back of the lorry. An Oberfeldwebel, possibly Fritz Breitfeld, accompanied me as co-driver, which was just as well, since driver and passengers were far from sober. We crossed the airfield towards Zenelager arriving there safely, even if some of the passengers had nasty bruises to show for it. Chapter 9 The Battle of Paderborn By March 1945 the Allied armies had made such deep incursions into Germany that the Reich had been reduced to the territory between the rivers Oder and Rhine. In the West, the Americans and British were anxious to close the Ruhr pocket and seize Paderborn for its panzer centre at Zenelaga. Second and Third Companies of Panzer Battalion 507, as has been noted, First Company was still involved in an odyssey which would result in it never arriving, were involved in converting to the Tiger II. This required a retraining of crews, new supply vehicles, particularly vehicles and equipment for the repair services, and this was by no means complete when it became necessary to deploy Panzer Battalion 507 against the U.S. Army on the Rhine-Westphalian Defensive Front as a part of a Waffen-SS Panzer Brigade. In 1982 I started compiling a file of experience reports on the Battle of Paderborn, which occurred at Easter 1945, and in 1985, forty years after the event, I brought these files to the attention of the British Training Centre for Staff Officers. 
I received an invitation from them to visit Paderborn for the fortieth anniversary celebrations. The details I supplied in my report regarding movements, times and incidents involving the battalion were checked over during the battlefield tour of the British Army of the Rhine from Zenelaga on the 27th and 28th of March 1985. My report can be considered objective to a considerable extent, while contemporary German academic literature, Dr. Homann and Willy Moos, and also the reports and interviews with former officers of 3rd U.S. Armoured Division, Spearhead, were subjected to the same scrutiny. Editor Calendar and Diary Entries 27th of March, 1945 Obermeyer Heavy bombing raid on Paderborn. Drove in the evening to help in the clear-up. Jan. Major air attack on Paderborn, which I experienced in the public air raid shelter under the post office. Operation to rescue many civilians from the burning buildings. My motorcycle and sidecar buried under the rubble. At night I reported to the commanding officer. The battalion is on the outskirts of town and could not get to the town centre because of the debris in the streets, and neither could the numerous fire brigades arriving from surrounding towns. Wolf Koltemann and Fritz Schreiber Action involving 3rd Company, 30th of March 1945, Paderborn on the 28th of March 1945, Panzer Battalion 507 was still in the process of conversion to the new Panzers, of which 3rd Company received all 15 thoroughbred Tiger IIs delivered. These still had to be run in, and the weapons calibrated. After the crossing of the Rhine at Raymargen, the enemy's turn north at Marburg pointed to Paderborn as the next objective for the U.S. divisions later confirmed by our own reconnaissance. As a result, SS Panzer Brigade Westfalen was formed during the hectic activity of those days and hours. Placed under the command of SS Obersturmbannführer Lieutenant Colonel Hans Stern, its purpose was to defend the military district on the flank south of Paderborn. The brigade was hastily assembled, mainly from Waffen-SS Panzer units under training at Zenelager and Panzer Battalion 507 was the only army panzer element attached. On the 29th of March, an alarm of 24 hours' notice was given to move out battle-ready. Major Schuch remained our commanding officer, having led the battalion since the summer of 1944 with extraordinary success. First Company, with its main force under the command of Hauptmann Beilfuss, was eventually unable to rejoin the remnants of the battalion until April. The commander of 2nd Company, Hauptmann Wiersching, had been transferred out to command a battalion of heavy anti-tank Jagd Tigers. This had led to a number of changes in the platoon leader and panzer commander structures of the companies. At 10.30 hours on the morning of the 30th of March, the battalion left Zenelager and headed for the assigned assembly area, the woods at Daldurinhagen, Egeringhausen. Because the streets of Paderborn remained impassable for traffic, the route followed by the armoured column was the bypass road to the southeast of Paderborn, the modern B-68, a distance of about 10 kilometres. Meanwhile, 10 kilometres south of Paderborn, the towns of Nordbochen and Kirchbochen had become the scene of heavy fighting between SS Regiment Meyer and U.S. Armoured Forces. At 1300 hours, at this time two kilometres from Durenhagen and therefore still short of the assembly area, 3rd Company received an order from Major Schuch to divert to Egeringhausen and, being at readiness to engage the enemy, there turn west and head along the road towards Kirchbochen to relieve SS Regiment Meyer and block the enemy tank advance to Paderborn. Careful reconnaissance was an absolute necessity. At about 14.30 hours, 3rd Company reached the Egeringhausen Kirchbochen Road. It was necessary here to proceed in single file because of the dense woodland on either side. Anti-aircraft machine guns were manned and ready. After a kilometre, the undulating countryside on both sides of the road opened out up to 500 metres, 
and therefore became panzer-capable. Third Company proceeded in stages in a broad wedge formation from hilltop to hilltop, Hauptmann Koltermann and radio operator Kurt Kramer going ahead on foot each time to view the next sector of terrain. After another 2.5 kilometers of cautious approach, the terrain opened out wider from the Hamborn crossroads. Beyond lay the slope rising to the Kuhlenberg, about 800 meters farther west. The foot reconnaissance showed that Kirkborken was held by the Americans, while Nordborken, closer to Paderborn, was now apparently at the heart of the fighting. At its eastern side, a strong security line of tanks, if not an assembly area, could be made out. Our every movement on a hilltop came under immediate aimed fire from tanks or anti-tank guns. At 15.15 hours, Koltermann had his three platoons advanced to positions on the reverse slope of the arid Kuhlenberg elevation, two to the south side of the road, one to the north side. The range to Nordborchen was about a thousand meters, visibility relatively good, and we opened fire on identified, especially armored targets. A number of tanks and a series of tractor-wheeled vehicles were put out of action. Movement in the villages ceased at once, and soon we received heavy artillery fire on our position, which we countered by frequent shifts of location. We suffered no losses. Our appearance at Borken and opening fire on them apparently unsettled the Americans, for after 1600 hours we came under attack from low-flying fighter bombers, strafing us with their cannon and dropping HE and phosphorus bombs. They were so skilled at low-level flight as to instill anxiety and fear in us, and they were not intimidated by the machine guns mounted on our panzers. It is difficult to describe the feeling one had watching their bombs falling, the craters they made being large enough to take three panzers. Often we disappeared in great clods of earth, fumes and fire, many panzers over sixty tons in weight jumping about. However many panzers these yabos might have claimed as destroyed upon returning to their airfields is not known, but only one panzer received a direct hit from a phosphorus bomb. It slid off the sloped front armor and thus did no damage. Meanwhile, an enemy armored unit was attempting to go around us, the intention being obvious, and this was reported at once by radio. From our first experience of battle against American attack formations, we established that their spearheads, held back at once upon encountering serious resistance, sent up their aerial spotters, and used well-directed artillery fire to clear the path of their advance from any obstruction. At this time, of course, our own forces no longer had any aerial nor artillery support. We also had the additional considerable handicap of no repair workshop, so that almost every technical defect or item of damage led to the panzer having to be written off. After 1,700 hours, or in any case, about half an hour after the departure of the last Yabo and the resumption of our shooting at targets in Nordborchen, we received warning from Major Schuch at Staff HQ that an enemy armoured column advancing from the south had come under fire from the security platoon commanded by Oberleutnant Jan at Durenhagen Egeringhausen. It had been forced away, but, undeterred, the enemy column was now approaching our rear along the same eggeringhausen kirchboken road, as we had used to get where we were. Koltermann's orders were to allow the enemy armour to come up, and then wipe it out. We were free to act as the situation dictated, and constant radio readiness was agreed upon. At dusk, towards 1800 hours, the company commander issued his preparatory orders for battle. Immediate radio readiness for the whole company. Extreme radio discipline. Position 301, Command Panzer, continues behind Crest of Road. Then, acting one after the other, first and third platoons were to about turn and remain on the slope to face the approaching armoured column. 
Second platoon, formerly positioned close to the south side of road, will leave it in individual units while maintaining an intensive directed fire from either side of the road, so as to deceive the enemy as to our regrouping. As soon as that is effected, first platoon, formerly on the southern flank of the company, will withdraw in individual units, take up position north of the road and face east. Direction of fire is the edge of the woods. 700 to 800 meters range. Field of fire allotted south of the road to the right where it leaves the woods. As soon as that is effected, 3rd platoon, formerly on north side of the road, right flank of company, will, after 1st platoon has concluded its movement, also fall back, face east, and assume the most favorable firing position facing edge of the woods north, left side of the road where the reported enemy force must come. Careful measurement of range by commanders. Load AP shells, weapons at readiness to fire. Otherwise, everything as per 1st platoon. Both 1st and 3rd platoons must allocate the outer panzer to secure the flank. Open fire, if at all possible, as a sudden surprise concentration of fire, but only on the order of the company commander. The regrouping of the company was completed shortly before 1900 hours, practically in twilight. By then the crews had familiarized themselves with the terrain in front of the woods. A little later the enemy could be heard approaching, almost textbook style. A reconnaissance tank drew up on the road about a hundred meters before the edge of the woods, stopped briefly, and then had fifteen to twenty tanks come forward and form up at once on both sides of the road in a kind of wedge formation. Hauptmann Koltemann then ordered recognized enemy tank targets to be taken under fire, and within a few minutes nearly all the tanks of the first wave served up on a platter were ablaze, and also the tanks and other tracked armored vehicles following behind from out of the woods. The impression we all gained in the brief half-hour of the first battle phase was that the Americans had failed to spot our two platoons on the forward slope, and because of the heavy firing towards Kirchbochen and Nordbochen by second platoon, they had assumed it was safe to make an attack into our rear. Up to that point we had no casualties or serious damage to vehicles. We had not been provided with the details of the American battle group's strength and composition when the warning had been given, and it was impossible to make any useful assessment from the confusion of burning and wildly maneuvering enemy vehicles at the edge of the woods. Since the enemy force had no effective leadership, at 1930 hours, Hauptmann Koltemann sent a situation report to Company HQ and requested permission to attack. On the condition that the security platoon covering Borken remained in position, limited consent was given to proceed as far as the edges of the woodland. The woods were about 250 metres away and allowed the two platoons to spread out. At 1945 hours, the company received radioed orders, Second platoon will remain in the present positions with previous objective. At all costs maintain radio watch. Further orders follow. First and third platoons will proceed immediately and wipe out enemy totally, making short stops to fire during the advance. Be economic with AP shells. Guard your flanks. With the so familiar order Panzer's Roll, a period of night fighting commenced which was to last for two hours. From the outset we moved ahead only slowly because of the need for some clearing up to be done in the forward battle area. The surviving crew members of the wrecked 24 tanks and armoured vehicles, some of them still burning, had made off into the woods on the far side, and now it was left to us to destroy the non-burning vehicles by gunfire at close range. Even the last tank, which had hoped to escape detection behind a barn, was spotted. Kurt Kramer, The Breitfeldt Barn The story of a tank which had hoped to find cover behind a barn was probably repeated a thousand times over during the war. The following anecdote demonstrates how a lonely barn on the Egeringhausen Kirchbochen Road came to lend its name to the incident. 
In 1985, during a battlefield tour with British and US officers, we stood on the same high ground, the so-called Kuhlenberg, from where 40 years previously, two platoons of our third company had delivered a severe defeat to our American opponents. None of the topography had changed since then. Before us, the slightly sloping terrain, devoid of vegetation to the edge of the woods, 800 to 1,000 metres distant, and halfway there, alongside the road running through the terrain, an 18 metres long stone-built barn. Sheltering behind this barn had been an American tank, probably the last one still mobile and capable of resisting. Up to this point the battle had been little more than shooting down from a bare hillside, but in this second phase it had moved towards the woods. The hidden Sherman presented us with a serious danger. Until then I had been busy with my double-function radio equipment and had had no time to watch what was going on outside the Panzer. I received a radio message from Oberfeldwebel Fritz Breitfeld. He requested permission to search out the Sherman. Hauptmann Woltermann approved after some consideration but added a warning to exercise the greatest caution. But what did this word caution mean? The Sherman would fire first if his gun was pointing in the direction from which Breitfeld would appear. It was a game of poker, but actually the risk was much greater, for other enemy tanks might suddenly appear from the woods only 500 metres away. The tension amongst the spectators on the open stage was indescribable. Breitfeldt's King Tiger made a halt thirty metres short of the barn, as if he were not sure whether to go left or right of it. Then everything happened at once. The turret traversed to nine o'clock. The panzer moved forward to the right of the barn, stopped, and a split second later the 88 fired. The explosion behind the barn, the cloud of smoke soon rising above its roof, showed that the Sherman had come off worse in the duel. Between the Caucasus and Paderborn, I cannot ever remember having seen a more courageous individual action. There must have been many such, especially when only the T-34 was really equal to the 88. For a King Tiger versus a Sherman, the chances were distributed rather differently. Breitfeld survived the war, but was unable to attend our reunions until the Berlin Wall came down. Wolf Koltermann and Fritz Schreiber More on the Good Friday Battle The infantry response which flared up occasionally from the edges of the wood was ineffective, but showed us which side required our closest attention. In the long stretches of glades total chaos reigned. The road was almost completely blocked by tanks, command and supply vehicles strewn at all angles or crashed together, and here too most of the crews had fled into the woods or driven off the road at our approach. In this phase of the battle we encountered resistance which flared up repeatedly, enemy soldiers putting up a bitter fight with hand grenades and machine pistols. Wheeled vehicles which had been abandoned were pushed aside by our panzers. This economized on ammunition. Apart from a jeep acquired by the company commander, the important acquisitions were American battle rations and packs of cigarettes. At 2100 hours, second platoon covering Nordbochen had reported itself out of ammunition and requested further orders. The firing here had almost ceased. For first and third platoons, the situation as regards ammunition was similar and Woltermann asked Company HQ for resupply and new orders, since the objective had been more or less achieved, and it was not advisable to remain. Despite artillery fire, fighter-bomber attacks and several contacts with mixed enemy armoured columns coming up from the south, the territory and roads leading to Paderborn and Hamborn were under our control. At 2200 hours, Major Schuch ordered... The platoon masking Nordborken can be withdrawn to rejoin the first and third platoons, and after completing their purpose in securing and cleansing area, will retire to Egeringhausen, Forest Lodge. It was in the hour after 2200 hours that the controversial incident occurred, 
in which Major General Morris Rose was shot dead while attempting to surrender. The ploughing over of the sector, confirming that all enemy vehicles had been permanently disabled and that the shooting from the edges of the wood had been silenced, terminated at 22.45 hours. From the count of heads we had suffered no casualties. In the report of the enemy vehicles destroyed, only the 24 armoured vehicles, tanks and assault guns and armoured personnel carriers from the first phase were counted, while the remainder were classified as the column of wheeled and half-track vehicles belonging to them. After being stood down from battle readiness at 2300 hours, the company formed up in file and headed for the woods around the Egeringhausen Forest Lodge. The company commander led the way in the captured jeep with an American staff officer as prisoner to be handed over to our staff. The officer made great efforts to persuade us to abandon the struggle and made an outstanding impression, but his name cannot be recalled. Just before Egeringhausen, the Command Panzer 301 came under fire at very close range. The thick armour absorbed the hit, the dent being deep enough to accommodate two fists. The round was fired by a panzer of the 2nd Company's security platoon under Oberleutnant Jan, who had not been advised of events and had assumed that a column of tanks led by a crowded jeep must be American. We reported back to the commanding officer at midnight, bringing the eventful day to an end. Court Kramer, Paderborn, 1945, A Reflection Paderborn was for many wartime participants a kind of hometown for many branches of service, but especially for panzer troops. At the outbreak of war it had been the depot for Panzer Regiment 11 with its reserve and training battalions. Later it became the cradle of the Tiger Battalions. The men of 507 received their training here, and after almost exactly twelve months in which they came through numerous battles on the Eastern Front, they returned here for reorganization, followed by battle in the new King Tigers against the U.S. Army. This extremely successful action was also the last in which 507 was active on any large scale. We learn this from diary entries and essays recounting experiences by Feldwebel Fritz Schreiber, Tiger II Commander with 3rd Company, and Hauptmann Wolf Koltemann, Commander 3rd Company, as well as another participant of the Times, Oberleutnant Dieter Jahn, Platoon Leader 2nd Company. Today one can debate what were the most important reasons for our success on the 30th of March 1945, was it the tactically correct decisions made by our commanders, the battle experience of the panzer crews, or the superior armour and armament? Certainly these were important factors, but as we may view it today, an important role was played by good luck and the gross tactical lapses of our opponents then, 3rd U.S. Armoured Division Spearhead. Officers of this U.S. division stated at a meeting in Paderborn in 1985, rather reproachfully to participants of our unit, that our success was only achieved by luring battle group Wellborn into an ambush. Even if being positioned on the slope of a hill devoid of vegetation can be described as an ambush, in wartime an ambush is not illegal, but a skillful tactic. On the evidence presented, it is more correct to say that we had prepared for a situation caused by a lack of reconnaissance and communication by the enemy units, especially since we had been the target for fighter-bomber attacks and artillery fire on our positions on the Kuhlenberg. It remains a mystery why Battle Group Wellborn chose this fatal road westwards and thus fell into a trap of its own making after coming under fire from the rearward security platoon commanded by Oberleutnant Jan of 2nd Company. The Battle of Paderborn had no real influence on the war. The closure of the Ruhr industrialised area to the west left open to us only retreat eastwards. From this time onward, there were no more coordinated, tactically planned and executed operations, but rather only fragmentary actions, one tiger after another becoming disabled through technical defects. 
Calendar, Extracts from Oberleutnant Jan's Diary. 31st of March, 1945. The attempt to recover two damaged tigers cost us the loss of two towing vehicles to enemy fire. This afternoon, about 25 Shermans advanced along the Paderborn Castle Road near Egeringhausen. Unaware of U.S. tactics and morale, we opened fire too soon. We destroyed five enemy tanks, Gunnar Unteroffizier Federker. The other twenty withdrew. After that, we received heavy artillery fire. We were forced to change position, lightly damaged in transit, but sustained no personnel casualties. 1st of April, 1945. Very heavy artillery fire without pause. We fetched fuel from Hoyenherzer. 2nd of April, 1945. In the early hours, still dark, advanced to Villa Battesen, where the Americans were sitting in their tanks. Up to village entrance, no contact with enemy. Before the SS infantry support arrived, we came under fire from well-camouflaged tanks and anti-tank guns. My tiger was put out of action. The operation cost us five tigers, while we destroyed five of their tanks and additionally others with panzerfausts. We consider it a failure, however. I received splinters in the forehead and lower right arm and was taken to Bat Dryberg Military Hospital. Obermeyer. O two hundred hours. Advance with Waffen SS to Villa Bathessen. In the village we had five tigers destroyed. All SS officers were wounded. Also Novotny dead. Lieutenant Eckhart wounded. 4th of April 1945. I'm informed that First Company unloaded at Hamlin after a true odyssey. 8th of April 1945. I reported back to Commanding Officer Major Fritz Schuch at Moringen. 10th of April 1945. Went to C&C Panzer Troops West. In the afternoon, with repair unit, destroyed four enemy tanks with Panzerfausts. 11th of April 1945. East of Northeim, tank battle near Forest, moved over to Osterroda, heavy artillery fire. Our panzers have been released to an SS unit. Rudy Biofus, 1st Company After returning to Germany on the 4th of April, at the end of our odyssey, we were required to pass our panzers to an SS unit and continue by wheeled vehicles to Magdeburg where new panzers would be waiting for us at Army Venk for the defence of Berlin. At Magdeburg we discovered that the panzers had been passed to another unit, and OKH at Sossen was at a loss as to what we should do next. Kurt Kramer, our last tiger. About the 11th of April 1945, our last tiger came to a stop with an irreparably damaged engine, after crossing a bridge into the small village of Freiheit near Osterode, Harz. Its commander, Unteroffizier Klaus Peter Müller, was given orders to defend the panzer to the last by keeping its turret aimed at six o'clock. I volunteered to deliver rations to the crew, and when I arrived I found that he had concluded a separate peace with the Americans and was living with his crew in comfortable lodgings nearby with a Darman quartetta. Everybody knew at this point that the war was lost. This concludes Tiger Battalion 507, edited by Helmut Schneider, translated by Geoffrey Brooks, narrated by Chris MacDonald. Copyright 2020 by Helmut Schneider. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Greenhill Books and was produced in the year 2020 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright there too. Please visit tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks. Yo books. Yo books. Yo books. Yo books, 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 yo books.
Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books. Go books.